Good evening. Hello, hello, hello. Tonight, it is Saturday Night Live, and we are here live, streaming live, evil live, streaming evil live, because that is what we do. So hello. I hope you're ready, because, boy, we're ready to roll up our sleeves and just dive deep, just balls deep, as deep as we could possibly go to the to the itty bitty core of it all um we prepared we prepared for the show you know how we prepared we went back and we re-listened to the last show uh and made sure that we were brushed up and and good to go so that we could sit and pick up where the last installment of grim tales ended can you believe that the last time we did the show was over a year ago. We took last show was so epic, so long, so intense that we actually took a year long break, not on purpose. That's just how it happened. And uh, I'm so glad. I'm so pleased to have tank back here in the hot seat. Um, he he's lived a, a very, very interesting, fascinating life. And um, the stories he has and just pouring over the history with him is so much fun. Uh, a couple of quick housekeeping things before we bring Tank out of the digital green room. Housekeeping item number one, uh, the Manny show that I've been working on. I'm working on it. If you haven't seen it already, I posted a tasty little clip of what is to come. It's just a little, a little itty bitty taste with Mr. Jim talking about the differences between his drumming on she and manny's drumming on she it's really cool um check it out and i have to give a shout out to this this guy Raphael, who's in our group if you're not in the lodi group online the the the, the facebook group we have you got to go in there lots of cool interesting stuff but uh this guy he posted he decided to isolate manny's drums on she and cough cool and that got me thinking about this clip with mr jim and i thought hmm i wonder if i can isolate these drums and so i gave it a, a good hard college try and was so pleased with the results that i was like okay this not only is this going in but then i said what else can i isolate and i realized that we had been recently talking about earth ad and you know we want to remaster I mean, there's lots of stuff that gets like fan remasters. And I always kind of think it's I mean, for the most part, that stuff is kind of garbage, but <laughs> unless, uh, except for when I'm doing it. So I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, you know, I, I was able to isolate really nicely, like all the different uh, stems. I have the bass and the drums and the vocals. Everything's pretty well separated. So what I think I'm going to do next is I'm going to try and do my own mix of Earth AD. Now, is it going to be perfect? No, of course not. I my my experience with mixing, and I am a mixer. I do post production sound, but my experience with mixing is feature films. I mix movies. I mix videos. I don't mix music for music listening. So I'm going to try my best. I know that the philosophy is slightly different, and. Uh, We'll see. We'll see how it comes out. But whatever it is, I'll make sure to post the results. And I invite any and all to uh, join me in this experiment. If you have the uh, the ability and the know how, let's see you do your remix. I just want to hear a remixed version of Earth AD. I feel like it deserves it deserves that. There's there's a there's stuff in there that needs to be pushed up. Uh, additionally, I want to let everybody know that tank has his own youtube channel now he's had it for some time he's going to tell you all about it the link is down in the description everybody should go and subscribe um tank is 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 a really good storyteller and he's always on there talking about interesting stuff go give him a, a subscribe help him help him get uh get get the ball rolling okay so the link is down in the description make sure you subscribe and without further ado Let's, uh, oh, and one last thing, the, the uh, very important thing, uh, our, it's our uh, Riot Stickers, CEO of Riot Stickers, Sharpie Riot. It is his birthday today. Uh, let's all wish Sharpie Riot a very happy birthday uh, from here at the Frumis channel. Um, thank you, Sharpie, for all that you do. We salute you on your birthday. Hope you enjoy it, sir. 
Okay, now with all that out of the way, unless I'm thinking, unless I'm missing something right now, I think it's time to bring the tank out of the digital green room. So let's do that. Tank. What the humongous rules the vermin? What does that mean? What's going on? Well, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So the humongous rules the vermin. <laughs> the I can vermin see that. Have inherited the, earth. the vermin have inherited the earth. Oh, yeah. I like like your sunglasses. Yeah, you... actually, these are like. I don't know. They're, they're they're filthy. They're my daughters or something. I don't know. But I, they're I your daughters or they're Willy Wonkas, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Sharpie! Thanks for all your support, brother. Sharpie, I, too, too dirty. I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. All right, that's better. Sharpie, this show is dedicated to you tonight. This is Sharpie show, and I think that we uh, we Here's need to start. Sharpie. To yes, exactly. Oh, look, the green screen, like cutting out oh, that. Tree. Yeah, look at that. What kind? Of, what all flavor right. of rain is that? Uh, this is rainbow sherbet. Oh, that's um, good. Not one of my my. It's okay. It's I like one that one. I know we we talked about that before. But at my local Dollar General, you can get three rains for seven dollars. So that's two dollars and thirty three cents and damn three, 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 three each. Uh, they're not my favorite flavors, but what the hell? At that price, I'll I'll, I'll hey drink freaking piss water. Hey, there you go. There you go. Um, we got to start the show off the right kind of way because this is technically this is a streaming evil live show, which we do not do Ooh. often. So let's start off the show the right way with the theme song. This is for you, Rue Morg, yeah. wherever you are. Jeff is going to talk about the misfits right now. He's a nerd about this stuff, obsessed anyhow. Jeff never shuts his face, always needs to talk. My eyes show some weight if he went out for a walk. Do you think that's a kiss? He doesn't care. He's out in the ranch. Oh, oh, we're, oh, <clears throat> right. <clears throat> yes, but seriously. But seriously, <laughs> folks. Um, and and lastly, let's do for Sharpie's birthday. Let's do an extreme Danzig close up because it's been a long time since we've done that. Okay. Yeah, I know, right? I know. I know. Okay. Now, now, now like your tonsils in that last one. Oh my god. That's right. <laughs> That's how we roll. Um okay, <laughs> now the show can really start. Really, okay. really start. Okay. So, my, my my I keep changing. I'm like mystique over here, but the, the green screen got me changing colors. It's great. That's okay. Yeah. It, it's I think it's interesting. Where, where did we where we last left off we had discussed we were I, I was apprehensive about starting the wrestling stuff because I knew that mm. was going to be like a whole story and it was it was a whole long story and yeah. then we briefly touched on um you know Chud had put on his website that effective immediately him Doyle Graves they all left the band in February of 2000. Yeah. Which was, you know, I guess very short lived because they came right back, but it was obviously yeah. an inkling of of what was to come. It, it um, was so that, that was so quick that I never even really heard about it, like being right. back, like just completely off my radar. Right. You know, so the that, only one that the first one I actually heard about was like ninety five. Jerry called me when we were working on getting the band back together. I'd already auditioned in ninety four. Um, but I was coming up and working with these guys, conventions and whatnot. And Jerry called me and said, hey, we need to put a postcard out looking for a guitarist because Doyle's back is out. And I was like, uh, really? Okay. So I started putting a postcard together. And I think that was when Michael's girlfriend... So Michael was already on the scene. Michael's girlfriend, Rachel, was in charge of the, what was going to become the Fiend Club. Um, had Wasn't really uh, fully put together yet. And I, I, she was talking about doing some kind of mailer or, or getting a list together, mailing list together. So I sent her the proof of the postcard that Jerry had said, you know, I need you to make this for me. And it had like a little tombstone on it. I, I, I have no idea where the graphics are. 
the tombstone misfits looking for guitarist um and i said that to rachel and she's like what the fuck is this who told you to make this this is not what i'm looking for this is not what i needed um so then it then i was like well, I, I don't know that's the last thing jerry said to me was hey doyle's back is out and we need a new guitarist um so i again short-lived just like right i'm out i'm out i'm in like who, who knows uh but i think that was when that was kind of the birth of the um oh the, the postcards that did the black and white postcards that had the tour dates on the back and the the artwork the shocking return artwork on the front we did a couple of those and that's i think that's where that project started but i remember jerry saying to me i think on the phone when he was telling me to put this this uh postcard together doyle's back was out he's like he's like man i i, I said to him it's too bad i learned how to play bass instead of guitar because I'd be first in line. He 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 actually said something along the lines of, "Man, we we'd make a hell of a team." And I yeah, was like, wow. Oh, so that's interesting. That I mean, I mean, that would have, I mean, that would have been crazy if Doyle if Doyle hadn't been there at as early as ninety five, and Jerry just went back out with three new guys as the Misfits. That would have been a yeah. whole other yeah. can of worms. Um, so now fast forward. All those all those years later, they you know they did those shows as the Lost Boys. They come back. Um, before we talk about the stage show and George Romero and all that, um, we didn't think we really touched on Famous Monsters. Did we touch not, on Famous not Monsters? Much. So not, not much at all, really. So we, going all the way back to when Mike Hedius was ever so briefly uh, singing during that summer. And Jerry had said to him, hey, start writing songs. Mm -hmm. We're going to do another record. Had there been discussion? When did that, when did the first inklings of a follow-up record, uh, did you did, did you hear any rumblings about, hey, we got to get back into the studio or anything? Again, I was still down in Virginia. M my job did not entail any of the music side of stuff. It was the merchandising side. So I was not involved in any way. I, I was just when Famous Monsters came out. I was just honored that I had that I, I got a plug on the in the liner notes, you know, merch John Grimm. Um, but I do remember working out with Jerry in his basement and him playing like a, a cassette copy of like all the rough cuts that they just you know, it, it, not not in the studio studio, but like the rehearsal space and hearing hearing songs like uh, that didn't make the cut, like Monkey's Paw, right, uh, right, Spider Baby, you know, shit like I'm like. Okay, like this is gonna be a wild another another wild uh, album is is obviously brewing, um, but no, I, I didn't have any. Uh, besides that, that was pretty much all I got. Um, so they went back into they went back into the studio. Do you remember when that was though? Even though if you weren't around, they they went into the studio before the fall of ninety nine, right? Because, <sighs> um, the famous monsters. I, it started as, as early as, I mean, they were doing famous monsters support shows as early as. Yeah. I want to say summer ninety nine was yeah, summer ninety nine from monsters. We yeah, started playing famous monster stuff, and I I, re, I remember in Europe, I mean, in Europe, yeah, that was that was like the first time like Kong of the Gates was the new intro, um, you know, Chud being let out of the Crimson Ghost coming out. And so the so the drum riser was a cage, and the Crimson Ghost would come out with a big key, and Chud was inside the cage under the riser, and he'd unlock the gate and let Chud out, and he'd go behind the drum kit and boom, 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 like start the whole thing, and the crowd would go nuts, um, and then Jerry and Dole be in the back, you know, start the start the just, just like vibed. Um, so was that the start of the was that the start of the stage show? Kong of the Gates, yeah. No, no, no I and, mean, no, no, no. What I mean is like when the stage. When you started to develop like a stage show with the Crimson Ghost and Tankenstein mm -hmm. and all that stuff, mm -hmm. that started the summer of '99, really, or was that um, before that? Well, prior to that, the Crimson Ghost would the Crimson Ghost would come out. I think okay, I don't think we ever talked about this. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, tell, yeah, tell me about that. So prior, I think even to American Psycho, the intro was the Crimson Ghost would come out and wheel out this large television set. And there was this montage of like classic horror movie scenes that were being uh, sh uh, thrown up there. I think as as Halloween two played, and then 
when that would finish, fives would start and, and Crimson Ghost would come out and wheel the TV off. And that usually worked. I know we had uh, sometimes we we had some pillars on the side, the styrofoam pillars on the sides with projectors on top and then gargoyles on top of that. And we would project more horror film images and things up onto screens that hung up uh, behind the band, one on stage left, one on stage right on either side of the backdrop. And uh, God, wow, I totally forgotten about that. Um, <laughs> I remember one of the gargoyles fucking Bobby Benetti. He was he was lifting. They were like those those uh, um, Spencer gift gargoyles. They're like rubber, like packed with right. foam. And over the years, they start like falling apart inside. And Bobby's like picking the thing up to put it on there. Like all the foam's coming out and getting in his eye. The ah, the fucking gargoyles fucking me grim. Um, but so that yeah, that was. I think that was really our first stage show. And then at some point with American Psycho was when the Crimson Ghost would drag Michael out on the chain. He was in a straight jacket. Right, I've seen video of that. Yep. Drag him out and throw him down and then unbuckling, you know, Michael be rolling around the floor like Michael was the, you know, American Psycho. Um, it was supposed to be a secret. I mean, we had eight by tens that you could buy at the shows and the conventions of the Crimson Ghost holding a candelabra, a photo, but it was supposed to be totally on the download that that was Rocky uh, in behind the mask. Um, I actually have an eight by ten autographed uh, to me to tank from Rocky, which uh, there might only be like two in existence that he actually signed, uh, not the Crimson Ghost, but signed actually Rocky. Uh, oh, so cool! Was, cool, yeah. Um, and God, there was a show I think in was it Canada? Wow! Uh, so uh, Ken would do the uh, Rocky would do the intro as the Crimson Ghost. And then there was nothing else for him to do because we weren't doing the Mad Scientist Laboratory thing yet. That, that that came on the Famous Monsters tour, the U.S. tour. He would go and take everything off, do, do get the black out of his eyes, put the put everything back in this little little. Uh, he had like a carry on case that everything went into. He went went outside and put it in one of the uh, the bins under the RV, and went back inside. And I don't know if he forgot something, or for some reason he had to go back out to the RV, and he saw two kids trying to trying to break open the 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 bin on the bottom to get the costume oh and shit! i i didn't hear it but and, and and rocky's not normally a violent guy but that's the one thing of his you do not fuck with and from what i know the the kids got their bells rung pretty pretty freaking good um yeah you, you don't fuck with cg man that's part of the show that's got to go down don't fuck with cg <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, um, so the show kind of, so the show would like, you know, the show kind of evolved and got bigger and bigger on the stage as the oh, as yeah. time passed. In, in the beginning, it was just Crimson Ghost coming out. Like I said, we had the TV, which actually, it was a rear projected television. So it was just a, a, a screen and the TV actually like folded up. It was just this big hollow wooden thing that, that hinged together and folded flat. And we put it on top of the, uh, the equipment inside the, the box truck. And it was a great intro. I loved watching it every night. It was a nice, nice build up Halloween two playing and like you're really getting into the mood. Sure. Um, but there was one night that somebody somebody effed up and fingers were put blame was placed here and there, but nobody ever knows like what actually happened. But it was a VCR tape and it had it had fast forwarded all the way to the end and then like ejected. Oh no. And we went to start the 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 intro and I'm watching it like oh this is gonna be great this is gonna be great and they wheel the thing out it's just blue screen blue screen blue screen what the hell's going on guys and then the crimson ghost comes back out and just wheels it off and it was like totally Ow! and then five starts playing and I mean Ken was Ken was pissed man because if you blow the intro and that that's not a good foot to be starting on there was one other time I remember the intro getting blown and it 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 kind of led to the band breaking up actually which we'll get into I probably at the end of the show. Wait, so this this leads me to question, you know, in terms of Ken's role. We know what Ken's role was, obviously. And, I mean, he was yeah. he was very – he was a uh, master cog in that machine and in, integral in, in all the operations and whatnot. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But in terms of, like, the dynamic and the hi hierarchy and stuff, is it like Jerry – Jerry's calling the shots – Ken Ken's like mm -hmm. his right hand guy kind of sort of situation. Yeah. Where's Doyle in in relation? Is Doyle just kind of go with the flow of whatever? Like what what is from yeah. your perspective? What is that from, like from my 
for again, we always clarify from my perspective, from your perspective, yes. Gather, um, that yeah, Jerry was definitely the guy in charge, calling the shots, making the plays. Um, Ken was, you know, like for lack of a better term, you know, second in command. So Jerry would hand Ken the plays, and Ken would quarterback them to to the crew. Um, so yeah, Ken was obviously on tour, was the tour manager. So he he you know for advanced all the shows and and got the crew together and, and was in charge of like the physical touring uh, uh, aspect of everything. When we weren't on tour, he was in charge of the Fiend Club. He was in charge of building, designing, and building props and stage stuff. Uh, working on the 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 uh, the road vehicles, the box truck, the RV, eventually the crew bus, which he and I built later. Uh, I think around this time frame was when yeah when when we got in the crew bus. Uh, so he maintained all that stuff. Um, and then Doyle was just like, "Hey Doyle, uh, be here at this time." Okay. And and may, you know maybe he'll maybe he'll get there. Who who knows? Um, yeah, you blew it, Lucas. You blew it. <laughs> oh, face. Sorry. Yeah, the, the, the tur I, didn't I, you say the turtle? The turtle crew. The, tur the team turtle, team, team turtle, turtle. <laughs> yeah, turtle crew. <laughs> it's a good name, um, but yeah. So Ken was I, I. Ken and I worked closely from from day one, um, and I think I've talked about how out of the three brothers, he and I, he, I he was just the easiest one to work with. Um, as far as being not up here and not down here, he was in the man. I, I, my my cut my face color keeps. Is that better? I don't know. No, um, you're fine. You're it's, fine. It's lighting. Um, so he and I like. On tour and off tour, we we worked together. But on tour, I was I was essentially maybe not in the very beginning, but worked my way up to being like assistant tour manager, to where I would help him with the accounting. Um, you know, we got QuickBooks and or a spreadsheet, and we had to learn how to do that. So I kind of so you're it out. learning you're learning the business on the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it was that way. And we'll you know, unfortunately, until two thousand three, when he and Jerry had his, their falling out. But, so now. So now going back to the stage show is Ken, mm -hmm. Ken is lobbying or Jerry's like, Hey, we need a stage show. Ken is like, okay, this is what, here's some ideas. Here's what we could do. Like what, how is that? Is, is there some sort of uh, uh dialogue there? Uh, like conscientious dialogue to, to keep um, making it go bigger and bigger. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, I, I don't know what the dialogue was, but I would imagine right, Jerry right, would say, right, Hey, right. you know, did, did, because when I when I took over the the uh, production, um, you know, years later, Jerry just said to me, "I need you to sign me a stage show." He didn't say, "I want this, I want that, I want this." I, he just wanted an over the top sh stage show, and I I knew what the Misfits needed, so I, I delivered. Ken, same story. I mean, it's like we we knew the look, we knew the sound, we knew we knew the the, the production. Um, so he just he just uh, took the ball and, and ran with that. Um, I do remember again working out with Jerry. Um, I guess we worked out a lot. This would have been like 94, 95. We were at uh, Great Gorge here in town, which used to be the Playboy Club back in the 70s. Now it's just completely abandoned. It's it's creepy. Huge, huge uh, resort that's just dead. Uh, but he, were at, he and I were at the gym there, and he was telling me that the Crimson Ghost was going to be Ken, I guess, but the original idea was to make him more like Eddie from uh, Iron Maiden. So he was going to be like, huge or or bigger than life where like ken was gonna have a motorcycle helmet on with the crimson ghost head on top so when he when he looked around like and the eyes would be lit up and stuff and i i, I was like i don't i don't uh, i don't i don't know how i feel about that because the crimson ghost was never big like that if you know the you know the history of the crimson ghost uh cyclotrodex and all that good stuff but ken had a cool idea about doing a, a an intro where there was a podium and the Crimson Ghost came out and, and gave a speech and was like, that's it. Lock the doors. Like, nobody's leaving. And, and you know, <laughs> not, all right, now, now you can't leave. And um, it's over, Anna. Can I have the high ground? That's right. Uh, you know it. Um, that that never happened, but I thought that would have been kind of kind of cool. Kind of the, like the Peter Steele, like, you know, you'd have, you have to you'd divide my way. You'd, you'd have to pay to get out of here, you know, kind of thing. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't know who said to do what, but it just happened, and Ken was the one who made it happen. But so, but the show got the the production side of things, the theatrical production side of things, got bigger and bigger, and therefore there was more of a demand. Like, hey, we should do more and more with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so by the time we hit Famous Monsters, 
we started out with the cage and Chubby right. get let out, and then you start calling it the gates. And then once we came to the U.S. tour, um, we had already been working on uh, ideas for a new stage show, which Ken was building all the all the props for. And the idea was it was going to be a mad scientist laboratory with like uh, electrodes and Jacob's ladders and things going. And we actually incorporated um, pyrotechnics for the first time, like real pyrotechnics, like flash pops and, and sparks and things uh, that were actually, you know, triggered and, and fired at, at certain times uh, all through, you know, a cable network and stuff where previously the, the most pyrotechnics we had was uh, the Crimson Ghost torch. Um, it was actually like a, a thin propane canister with a like a fitting on top that looked like a torch and he would just light it up you know come out and do the thing the only time we weren't allowed to do that was in chicago uh ever since the chicago fire and to this day you cannot have open flame on a on a stage uh, i used to live in chicago and that chicago fire was that's a big bit that's a that's a big deal i was just a big business big deal <laughs> it's big yeah. business. It, it, it got it got new doors on on all the facilities so they open out instead of opening in now so that's that's it anytime i go into a building to this day if the door opens in, I I, I swear I, I get nervous. I think of the Chicago fire. I'm like, God, God forbid a fire breaks out here. We're all dying. I'll tell you, I saw Jerry's Misfits, and you must have been the tour manager at the time. I saw at the House of Blues in Chicago because I used to live in Chicago, and I'll never forget. Um, and it was debt with Des and Robo. And I'll never forget that Jerry wanted he had prototypes for the a gold version of like the box set. It was like on a plaque. And it was, he was, ho I guess he wanted to re he wanted to manufacture like these plaques with, with the box set. So like mm -hmm. it was the gold disc or something to commemorate that, that the box set had gone gold. This was, this was 2007 oh, and okay. he held up, he held one up. I mean, I saw it with my own eyes. He held one up mm -hmm. at, at the end of the show. I think it was at the end of the show to show everybody and nothing ever came of it. I must've never, I don't know. It never materialized, but I don't even remember. You don't it even must remember. Have been such a, a come and gone thing. I, it's not completely off my radar, but well, Chicago I mean, house of blues was a tricky load in. Cause you'd load in down in the parking garage and then have to go up five stories in the elevator up to the venue. And you go through catering and the kitchens and all that stuff. And every house of blues in the country, let me scoot in. I'm just, I'm just trying to get my face from changing colors here. Um, Every house of blues in the country, if you were playing on Sunday, you had to wait for church service to end before you could load in. Um, there's wow. pictures uh, at the, the New Orleans house of blues where I'm actually stringing guitars in, in the street because sound checks got to happen. At, you know, come like one o'clock, guys. I, I can't push that back. But sure. church was still going. So, um, but the Chicago house of blues, uh, what was his name? Bro Brody? There was a stage manager there. I, I want to say Brody, but that could be wrong. I, I feel bad. Uh, he was a really, really great guy. Always took good care of us there. He was in a band called the Bottle Tones. I don't know if you'll find them on Spotify, but they were like a rockabilly band that really, really brought it home. Um, impressive. Very impressive. Um, um, yeah. Just to dial back, to dial back to that summer, because I'm looking at the thing, I'm, I'm tracking this. Right. You get back. There's the U.S. dates over the summer. That's when that stage show is being built, right? Mm -hmm. And then... Yeah, all that stuff you were saying, and there's just a bunch of dates. Um, it was a tour with Earth Crisis opening. Do you remember anything about remember Earth, Earth Crisis, Crisis at that yep. time? Yeah, I remember they did a cover of Earth AD. I think I well, they did for the for the tribute that Caroline put out. Okay, I, I believe they might they might have played that live. They may, I think that's how I knew that they did that. I, mm, wow, makes sense. But nice guys, really nice guys. And then there, then you do these. So you go to Japan, and I think we yep. briefly touched on Japan. But what was? I mean, that's your first. Was that your first time in Japan, right? In in uh, summer of ninety nine, or did you guys have been there earlier? They, we, no, we we'd, we'd been there before. Uh, but this oh, you like, had been there first, like kind of big tour. Um, for, was that Japan tour? I just, yeah, I, yeah I, opening I, for Marilyn Manson. Yeah, well, that that was a one off at Mount Fuji. Yeah. 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 Then there was a, like a real tour that that followed. Um, but I think the first U.S. show of the famous Monsters tour, or at least the new laboratory set, was at Dragon Con that year. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why I remember. So, um, so, so the new stage show 
starting in I'm gonna I'm gonna say 2000 was a mad scientist laboratory. The Crimson Ghost comes out. And he, he he and uh, I got some special treats here for the for the viewers. Um, Ken made all this this really cool stuff. Unfortunately, it's it's all gone now. But I was able to save a couple of pieces. Oh, I, I got to back up here. Uh, a couple of pieces. Oh, it's funny. Okay, on is green, so it's going right yeah. to my green screen. Uh, let me see if I can. I can't. Okay. No, so I, see, this, I see it. It says no. <laughs> it says, okay. I, I can't. My camera is actually upside down, so to bring it closer and, and down into my my periphery here. Um, so but it's funny that it actually I'm, says no, and it's it like no. transparent. <laughs> this 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 is faux and no. Um, yeah. So this was one of the panels, and there's there's another one, but we had handles that went on here. Oh my God. So Very again, cool. Yeah. These are like uh day glow green and day glow orange. So when we, we would put the black lights on them, everything would like poof, sure. would light up. Uh, so that's, that's one of them. And then I have, it, it's more of the same really, but it's just a, it's just a, a bigger, uh, no and faux. And then another, uh, another green. <laughs> uh, this, I knew who knew the green screen was going to cause so many problems. Uh, but I found these not at the shop, but in the barn where um, a lot of junk just got stored. It was like wow. a hundred year old barn that uh, ended up going to, to JR, to, to Ken's, uh, the Rocky's son. Uh, but all of our all American pool service stuff was stored there. And when we were cleaning that barn out to sell it to JR, sold it to some company that was going to start growing pot there um, legally. Uh, hasn't started yet, but uh, I, I found those. And I'm like, well, that's, that's great. I'll save that. So yeah. Mad Scientist Laboratory. Um, Crimson Ghost would come out and fire all the stuff up, and the and the 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 flash pots would go off, and the sparks would go up, and and like all the all the electricity would start going. It was all just done with tricks with like Christmas lights and strobe lights and things, but it was done. It was it was pretty cool. I'm sure there's videos out there. Hopefully there's videos out there. Um, and then about halfway through the show, when the band would uh, kick into "Hate the Living, Love the Dead," the Crimson Ghost, and at the time, I think the only guy who did it was uh, Frankie Cheese. Who was the guitar tech at the time? Was Why in like a little know? school, all black ghoul sort of just outfit. His face was blacked out and everything. And he just kind of creeped around and did his thing. He was like the little help. Um, Crimson Ghost would come back out and push uh, this large slab out on stage that was covered by a sheet, and then he'd hook up some electrodes and flip some more of those 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 no and fo <laughs> switches, and uh, things would start you know going. The lights would start going again. And then um, some sparks would go off, and then bang! There'd be this big uh, flash pot that would go off, and a hand would rise up from under the uh, the sheet and come out from under the sheet. And it was it was like a a, a gnarly looking um, dead hand. And then the crimson go. I, mean, I might have a hand. Oh, uh, I think I have a hand here. Okay, this was stuff that's been up in my attic. Hopefully, it's still in good shape. The nails have not been clipped on this one yet. Do I have a clipped version? Eh, it's all the same. All right, a hand would come up from under the. Uh... Oh, it's it's green. <laughs> so oh my god, I'm... that's so funny. <laughs> so I would I would cut the nails to just like regular size, and so they wouldn't be like demon nails. And these these were the these were the the the, the Tankenstein hands. Dude, that's uh, hilarious. Um, so that would come up from under the under the sheet. Then Ken would pull the sheet off, and there was Tankenstein strapped to this this slab and i'm i'm not happy man there's <laughs> loud music going on there's there's this fire happening i am all and, of, and it's so funny because nobody fire can hear bad me. fire bad nobody can hear me but to get into character i'm full on you know I'm, I'm doing doing the thing and method acting Come i mean on. you have to you got to do it so i've got these straps on me around my chest and around my my thighs uh, they were actually old fire hose that we had cut, and then we made just some some buckles out of like foam core and Velcro. And and Ken would come over, you know, Ken Rocky, the Crimson Ghost would come over and like you know kind of sit on my chest, like ah, you know, I did it. He'd throw the hand up and you know, victory and victory. And the, the little ghoul guys are like, ooh, you know, the, like Frankie like taunting me, like ooh. And and I'm just getting madder and madder by the second. You know, but they're they're turning me, wheeling me towards the crowd now. I'm like kind of swatting from under my restraints at the crowd because I'm I'm not happy that there's these, all these people screaming at me and stuff. At least they're not in South America and not spitting on me. And then I I'm, I've reached my limit, and boom, I, I burst out of these 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 just velcroed on uh, big thick straps. Right. And I uh, 
I think I immediately grab the Crimson Ghost, give him like in a choke, and I, I throw him down, and then I, I just swat at Frankie, and, and he, you know, he would sell it. He would just go flying across the stage, um, and then I'd go down towards the crowd, and rawr, rawr, you know, like kind of swatting at them, and then the, the Crimson Ghost would come back at me again, like, no, 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 stop, and I, I'd grab him by the throat, and I'd shake him a good bit, and I'd, I would toss him the other way. Um, I, I think we had three, pretty sure we had three tosses. One was one way. One was the other way, and then the last one would be the the first way again, and then he he'd come chase me off. But uh, so I who's figuring all this out? Who's who's? How are you guys like fleshing this out? Is this where I mean, at this point, it's got to be you, Jerry only, you know, uh, Rocky, it's, it's me and Rocky, just you and Rocky. Interesting. It's, it's me and Rocky. We come up to go, hey guys, this this is what we're gonna do. Like, oh, okay, cool, that sounds good. All right, and easy go. as that, easy as that. Um. So, uh, yeah, I, I throw Crimson Ghost down again. In the beginning, I, I didn't get involved with the band so much. I remember the first time we did this at Dragon Con, we had we had the fake drum, the, the fake bass drum sign that went in front of the bass drum that, that had the Misfits logo that would light up and it was covered in spikes. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, like, I'm like shaking it. And it's only like held down with two lag bolts and a, like a thin piece of shoe leather and I, I go and shake this thing and the, and the leather strap just like snaps and i'm like oh fuck and if i let go of this thing it's oh and it's that is crazy, crazy. And I'm, like, I'm like i gotta i gotta keep holding this i'm, I'm like waving at morgan like dude uh, was it was it morgan at that point or pat uh, i don't remember well, what you was were it. talking about morgan was morgan uh, morgan it was somebody's last show and then morgan was taken over when we last spoke. marv the roadie um had a falling out with chud i think just a, marv marv was like very you know wanted to be just like professional although i found out later he, he had some of his own uh issues uh and i, I think he and chud just Chud was was kind of going this way, and Marv was kind of going that way. <laughs> it, it it didn't work. He, he took off, and that might have been that Virginia Beach show that Michael didn't show up to. That might have been Marv's last show, and that might have been right. Me. And that's where Jerry sang for the first time. We went on that whole tirade about Jerry. Yeah, they, everybody came up and sang a different song. Right. We had met Morgan at the first the first show of the East Coast tour. Ninety six was in Richmond, Virginia, at a little little tiny place. And Big Dave came down to that. I hadn't seen him in like forever. So we reconnected. Morgan came there, offered us a place to shower after that because we were we were on a tour bus that tour for some stupid reason, and we're getting hotels every night to shower. And he's like, "Oh man, you guys come back to my apartment, you shower." So that's how we that's how we met Morgan. He just I guess kept in touch with Chud or with somebody, right? That, that came to fruition. Um, so I so I forget who whoever the drum tech was. If it was Morgan, maybe I don't know. Um, <laughs> I was like, dude, you, we, we had to like undo the sign and take it and set it down. Like very, oops, uh, I'll never do that again. I'll never touch that, that freaking thing. I had no idea. It was like so galaxy. Lesson learned. Lesson yeah. learned. Um, so, so uh, okay. So this is Dragon Con 2000, I think. The second time we played that's there. We played a, it before, the year before. That's a popular uh, bootleg, as far as I know, that show. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I um, always see that name come up a lot from time okay. to time. Um, it's so funny because I think the year before, I don't know if it was that year or the year before, uh, Glenn Hetrick and his, his girlfriend Michelle had come down to the show with Paul Brown, may he rest in peace, uh, who Paul Brown had been a, a, on our crew for a while. Um, uh, and we're, so we're set up in, in the main hall at Dragon Con. This is before Dragon Con was like all all cosplay it was actually like a convention where you went and bought stuff and meet and greets and it wasn't like 50 dollars for an autograph you could like hang out with with your uh, with the celebrities that you're into um so on the way on the way to the convention from the hotel glenn michelle and paul were going to like uh, to get a car their car out of the parking lot parking garage to come over to the convention and meet up with us and there was some kind of altercation between glenn and the parking attendant, I, I don't remember the details of what happened, but there were some words exchanged. And <laughs> when Glenn went to walk away, uh, he kind of stepped in a pothole and Ooh. rolled his ankle and like and fell down. And the way he put it, he said, and, and of course, I, 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 uh, I cried out like a little bitch. <laughs> he was like, ah, <laughs> 
<laughs> my God. That, you know, yeah, you, you take that, you motherfucker. Oh, fuck you. Ah! And then, <laughs> Do you know what that reminds me of when you just did that? Will you, ever see, you ever see uh Blank Man with Damon Wayne's? Remember Blank Man? Mm -mm. He plays uh like a like kind of like a makeshift superhero, but every, <laughs> he's like a nerdy guy, but he like you know, he dresses. I don't know, you, I can't, it's hard to explain if you haven't seen Blank Man, but every okay. time Damon Wayne's gets slapped in the face, he always screams like a girl. He goes, Ah <laughs> it's just really that, funny. That that part vaguely rings a bell actually i might have seen like a meme you've definitely but... he's wearing like like red long johns and he's got a robot and okay. uh, david allen greer is his sidekick yeah. who's his brother okay. and the movie opens he's inspired by batman 66 but every time he gets into a fight he gets slapped silly and he's got gadgets but he gets slapped yeah. silly he just goes oh, oh, yeah, oh! Was... it's really funny so that that's what happened after after exchanging some harsh words. It was like, ah, and yeah. the, and the and go, so so Glenn then tells us this story. And I'm like, oh dude, you just opened up a bad can of worms, man. So sure enough, at some point, uh, Hetrick's walking around the the Dragon Con convention with a sign taped to his back, "Little bitch." And I, there's a photo of me somewhere, like he's looking through some comic books. And I'm standing behind him, like pointing at the sign, and I, it was on there for a good good chunk of the day. So that that became his nickname for a while, but. The reason I'm telling you this story is uh, a very important segue. As I'm walking off the stage uh, after our first ever appearance of, of, uh, of Frankenstein, um, I'm wearing these very thick heeled shoes that I got in, in Germany. I remember Corey Fair and I went shopping one day when we were playing at the Alte Stadtbahnhof, the uh, old train station. Um, and we found these shoes uh, that I still use to this day for uh, cosplaying Road Pig. From uh, GI Joe, one of the dreadnoughts. Oh. Um, yeah, <laughs> but we, we, Corey and I both bought these shoes. We came back to the venue. I don't know where Corey was, but I was upstairs in the in the in the dressing room, sitting down. I don't know, eating something maybe. And Ro Walkie rocks walks in. He's standing next to me. He's like, "Oh, hey, Tank." Blah blah blah. And I, and I go and I, I I stand up, and he does one of these like, like, like what did you get taller? And then he looks down at my shoes. He's like, "What the fuck are you wearing?" Um, so I'm wearing these big stack heel boots with uh, uh, elevators inside them. So I'm just to make me, you know, um, tank inside. Right, you have to be tank right inside, of course. Yeah. So as I'm walking off the stage, arr, arr, I'm all in character. I freaking, I roll my ankle. Oof. I, I didn't go down, but sure enough, I'm all. Arr, arr. <laughs> So I did, oh! I, did the same, I did the same little bitch scream as I'm walking towards Hetrick uh, in the wings. Please, uh, please, please, like, please YouTube Damon Waynes and Blank Man I, I, when I, we I, get I, off I, this. You have to, because it's going to make you laugh. Because it seems to make you really laugh. This is going to make you laugh. So I, I promise you're going to laugh. Well, it's all the stuff like what the fans don't see. I mean, obviously the band's playing, so you can't hear me doing anything. But Right. <laughs> you know, oh boy okay good job Frankenstein. but so i went backstage i'm in the, the frankenstein gear which was the jacket and all the, the makeup glenn did the initial makeup on me uh, at the shop uh, here in town and he's like all right so yeah you'll do it like this and it was theatrical makeup so it was high contrast like black here and dark green here and then like right it wasn't blended it wasn't like doyle's makeup where it's all smooth and blended and, and uh, chic um so once he did it once, I got a, you know, I had a picture that I'd put up on the mirror or whatever, and I'd sit there and do the do the the, the grease paint. Um, and we just had a generic Frankenstein head because we didn't know where we were going with this yet. So I went out in the crowd just because I'm dressed up. Let's go have some fun. So the band's still playing. Right. I go out there, hit, right? I start like throwing throwing kids around and they're they're jumping on me and I'm dragging them through the pit and we're having a good time. Like this is okay, this might be what we need to do. Yeah, but is, if you fall in those shoes, you're fucked. <laughs> yeah. Oh, in, in, in the crowd maybe they'll support me i don't know um and then i go back by by merch and tim bunch was was running merch and we're we're both big wrestling fans so just like completely unplanned completely unannounced a big wrestling match breaks out between me and tim bunch in the back of the room that we're playing in oh, and geez. like we're body slamming each other like through tables like the merch booth was destroyed uh, all the tables were smashed Merch was ever there was a lamp that we had because they didn't have any lighting specific to us. Uh, the the lamp got smashed, the bulb got smashed. There's like sparks shooting out of it because it's still live. The guy running the spotlight at the back of the crowd for the stage, 
has actually turned it around and has it on <laughs> us as we're as we're full on like body slamming each other in completely like just ad lib, you know, just for the just for the fuck of it. And then, <laughs> and then at some point that that wraps up, and I, I go back. I'm, I'm the band still playing. I think the band might actually be. Yeah, the band was done at that point. So I'm walking back towards uh, the side of the stage to go backstage and through the curtain. And some, you know, hired nerd at Dragon Con's like, oh, no, excuse me, sorry, this is for the band. You can't come back here. I'm like, dude, back the fuck up. And he's like, no, 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 yeah. you, you can't. I, I'm, I'm like, okay, I get that you're doing your job and I don't have my pass on because I'm in character, but get the fuck out of my way. Yeah, like, right. Chud, Chud get a, tell this guy who the fuck I am. And at first Chud was like, well, he's just some fan. I was like, I, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, actually, was, that's I, actually pretty funny <laughs> it, looking back it was but I, I shot him the look like you're next right now. at the time and, it's not yeah. at the time it's not funny but yeah and and then Chubb's like no no he's cool he can come in and then finally the guy like you know stopped his bulldog uh routine and i was like man what the hell so that was the first time uh tankenstein as it became known as uh was ever live um i might I might actually be mixing two shows. The stage that I did the that th you know shaking the the drum sign and it coming off. I want to say that was the Jason Trioxin Dragon Con. That might have been later that, that year. Because the stage that I know that I rolled my my ankle on was a smaller stage. And is there anything girlfriend noteworthy? The What's that? Is there anything noteworthy of the Jason Trioxin Dragon Con? Because you make it sound like it's like an event. The Jason Trioxin Dragon Con. I just I think that was like the first show of that tour, and that might have been his first show as well. Which when I'm in the last episode, I was like, yeah, he came out with his stage makeup and all his gear, and we were like, right. Uh, you know, you're in the crew, right? Not Michael um, Graves. Not Michael Graves. Yeah, no, not sure. Michael Graves. Yeah. Um, yeah, I might I might be crossing the streams on two shows. I don't I don't think the sign broke on the the show that I rolled my ankle because the stage was much smaller the first time I came out and did, did Frankenstein. Um, gotcha. But backing, so what got us to that point was I'd been up in Vernon. We were working. Ken and I were working on stuff. Hetrick was living in Sparta at the time instead of Hollywood now. Uh, and for those who don't know, Glenn Hetrick, go watch uh, Face Off on Sci Fi. He's like the lead judge. That's that's who that is. He also did all the. Um, he he made the scream video happen with George Romero, like single handedly. It was that was him. I um, cannot wait to hear that but, story. Yeah. Uh so we, I was up in Vernon. We're working on stuff, and like, okay, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. We the Tankenstein show was already established, and we were talking about upping it. Okay, so let's let's put a pin in that. We're gonna come back to what almost burned me alive. Okay. Not, right. You almost got fire. Right. Yes. I almost got badly burned. Yeah. Um, so the original Tankenstein show, we just had a generic headpiece that went on, bought it like a, a costume shop. So going out in the crowd was cool because there was one show where somebody reached, like grabbed, you know, grabbed the headpiece and like it just, and pulled it right off. And I immediately turned around like, who the, fuck? I'm like, I'm ready to knock somebody out. And right. some kids just like, like he didn't know it was going to just come off. He's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And so I was like, all right. You know, I, I kind of leaned. I was like, you didn't see that. And then went back on. Um, but once once Hetrick had me over at his place, and there are photos. Sorry, I'm leaning on the, the screen here. There are uh, a bit of a workout here. There are photos of this thing actually coming to fruition. Once he made. So what was it? Last, last episode, we had uh, a little head. The, the, uh, right, the little head. The, every guy wants a little head. Every guy, every guy wants a little, little head. Well, now you're getting a whole lot of head. Oh, God. Oh, shit. That's a big head. Yeah, that's definitely a big head. That's what they say oh, about me. God. I think you got a big head. Um, yeah, this this was me in my powerlifting days. So you can see how, how thick my neck was. Holy crap. Um, so this, this is a life cast of the tank. The ears are broken off, but I had a bald cap on. I had the beard at the time. Uh, so Hetrick did a life cast of me. And I got to tell you, it's, oh, I'm putting this down because it's freaking solid. Yeah. Um, it's very relaxing to have your head completely covered in this gel. It's like straws up your nose. Actually, I didn't do the straw. He just kept the nostrils open. And it's kind of heavy. And it's kind of like weighing you down. And every, all the sound is kind of muffled. And, and you're just there like, 
yeah, man, I can totally fall asleep inside. Some people get claustrophobic, and I, I get that. It kind of freaks them out, but I was just like. You know what that is? It's called the swaddling effect, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like being in one of those um, uh, decompr- uh what, what's that movie, Altered States, where he goes in the. Sure, uh, sure, the isolation chamber. The isolation tank. That's kind of what it was like. Um, so once he made that, and then he sculpted by hand, because that's, that's what Patrick was, is a, uh, an effects artist. He made then 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 with then we started calling it Tangenstein because now it was a headpiece that would fit me. Right. And only me. Oh, it's green. God, you know <laughs> you can't win. You Tank, can't Tank, win, man. We're gonna fix this, guys. Give me one second. He can't uh, win, you guys. He was like, he's like, he's texting me before we start the show. He's like, hey, I'm gonna do a green, <laughs> I'm gonna do green screen. It's gonna be great. I'm like, all right. I'm, I'm like, turning the full oh. off. Dude, this is the third thing he's tried to demonstrate for us, like just to show us some cool stuff. And he's been thwarted by his own green screen. Right? I don't. Can I just turn it off? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to delete it because I've got the settings dialed in. Um, dang, 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 dang. Well, I'll, I'll figure this out. I swear. Um, oh, you know what you maybe have to do? I'll tell you what you have to do. I can change the color of the chroma key. Yeah, That's change the color do. of the chroma yeah. key. That's what you could do. Try that. We're not going to go green. We're going to go blue. Uh, you just disappeared oh, completely. Okay. That's crazy. Go, okay. okay. Now now we... <laughs> All right. Okay. But we could see it. We got we could actually see it. Oh, so cool that you kept that, man. He pu- Of course I kept this. He punched all that hair by hand. Yeah, but why don't you have it? Like, Do you have it displayed in your house or do you just... Um, uh, at the moment, uh, yeah, why don't it, you display that? You should have that on display. You should have, just have it, you know, draped and display. I literally just pulled it down out of the attic. My house is not that big. You've been here. Yes, I have, but I don't know. I feel like in your, in your TV room, you could, you could definitely put it in there. Um, yeah, that's mostly games now. That, that is the game room. Oh, really? Uh, oh, the game room, right. Now the game room. It's a, it's a slightly different. So that, this is Tankenstein. We went from Frankenstein. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, and this, and th- this fits me like a glove because it was sculpted on my uh, my life cast. All right, let wow, we got to fix that. Let's go back to green. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so once we started doing this one of a kind, rather expensive to produce a uh, headpiece, you blew right. it. Yeah. Oh, face. Um, I wasn't going out in the crowd anymore. God forbid that got pulled off and, and disappeared. Like Tankenstein just wouldn't happen anymore at that point. So the the in the crowd stuff ended once that came on board but we upped our game to the stage show and because again we talked about some of the wcw stuff in the last show this was all kind of happening at the same time so i was like wow look at you with your green screen what are you princess Uh, i just figured i'd give it a shot do you you recognize the background of course i do look at that isn't that cool oh neat um yeah sorry go ahead (laughs) <laughs> we're having too much fun here playing with our toys um so we decided to incorporate that was kind of like my idea i thought I was like hey michael can we do this and he's like yeah yeah that sounds great so i, I taught him how to do this stuff so going back to like the the the, the tankenstein scene happening i come out i rip out of the bonds i i throw the crimson ghost one way i, I swat frankie out of the way crimson ghost comes back or i from swat at the crown for a little bit i throw the crimson ghost the other way um i now na- like now it's me and Michael go at it. And I taught him how to take these bumps. Uh, I taught him. So he would, he would like kind of charge at me. And <clears throat> I, I would pull him a clothesline and he, he, he hooked it and, and, you know, it hold on. So I could, I could kind of arc him down and he'd, he'd swing his feet up and he'd roll onto his back. And then it's like, you know, hit the ground. Like, Oh, you know, like he just got the, the shit knocked out of him. And there were nights. So that, that was his first bump that he would take. And then I think the, that's when the Crimson Ghost would come and I'd choke him and throw him the other way. That was that was throw number two. Then Michael would would get back up while I was fighting with the Crimson Ghost. And we had, of course, we had a steel folding chair. In, uh, of course, right you got it. You, you, in, in that kind of scenario, you'd be crazy not to. So he would come and full on whack me like right across the you know across the shoulder blades on across the back, just like I taught him to. Mm-hmm. There was only one night he went a little high and the the upper pole of the the uh, the chair. Caught me right on the occipital bone, which is the bump at the, the base of your skull there. Ouch. And it, it didn't ring my bell, but I was just like, <laughs> like son of a, you went a little high there, buddy. 
Um, so he would smack me with that, and I, you know, as I'm all at the at the crowd, and I, I would I would turn around and I, I would swat the chair out of his hand, and of course, again, he would sell it. So he would full on like toss it to make it look like I swatted it a- across the building. There was one night, and I think it was in Chicago w- when we couldn't do the uh, the theatrics. The chair opened up mid air. Oh and shit! Landed on its feet and slid across the stage, and Michael and I both were like looking at it, and then looked at each <laughs> other. And then we're like, oh, the show. Yeah, right. Oh, my God. Like, we got to get back to work here. But it was just like, what are the chances of that? Um, so then after he'd hit me with the chair and I'd swat it out of his hand, I would go for the choke hold. And, you know, he, he would he would grab my my uh, my forearm. I'd get my hand in his lower back. We'd both squat down. We, you know, I would hop up and he would he would leap up. And as we went up, his hips would grab my uh, his knees would grab my my hips. He would post out with his other hand on my shoulder, and he, you know, he didn't weigh a whole lot. So between me just offering the stability and him basically holding himself up, but looking like right. I've got him, I could hold him up there forever. And so I would hold him and bring him down to the front of the stage and like show him to everybody. And of course, there's there's the the young girls in the front row that are there to see cute Michael Graves, and they're all fuck. Like they're so mad at me for what I'm doing to their their you know their this cute guy, and I'm just like rrr, rrr, rrr. you know I'm, I'm really I'm really winding it up, man. I'm having so much fun with this. And my so coach, and and at this time as well, I mean, we already talked about all the wrestling stuff, but the wrestling stuff has either coincided or happened or it's it, I'm not, the timeline's a little gray in my head, but it's it's they're they're, they're crossing over in one way. That's what another. I mean, though. The, the idea yeah. that Michael is like, okay, we could, I'm I'm down with this thing because we, you know, yeah. you've been doing a little bit of the wrestling stuff. I would yeah. imagine that that it translated easily when you know, yeah, it, it it everything, all the pieces were coming together. Like we we were we we were building up ahead of steam to something we felt was going to be big and right, unfortunately it didn't. Um, and, so then I, I would finally like slam him right there, front front stage, front and center, right in front of everybody. And again, you know, I didn't really slam him, but we, we you know, we everything was worked out to where nobody got hurt, but he would sell the shit out of it. And there were nights I would, I would choke slam him and I, you know, bang on the, on the stage. And as I'm, I'm walking away from him, I'm kind of looking back like, oh, fuck, I think I really hurt him. Like, son of a bitch. And then I'd talk to him after the, after the show. I'd be like, dude, were you okay? Like, you looked like, he's like, no, man, that was great. That was great. I'm like, oh. All right, I thought I really hurt you. Um, so after that, what happened? Um, I tell me then... about. Can, can I just interject real quick? No, tell me about no, the Madison. So Take it over. Sorry. No, the Madison Square Garden shows because long before the original Misfits sold out, mm-hmm. Madison Square Garden, there was Madison Scare Garden, right? I've wasn't that? You. Wasn't yeah. that what that was? Yeah. Um, so what exactly? What do you remember about those dates, if anything? I just remember one date and it was a small stage. Alice Cooper introduced us. Uh, that was just oh, after the early building. show and late show, early show and late show. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I know we had a hotel room across the street. We had filmed screen, but I don't think the screen video was out yet because I remember the, it was either the DP or the editor came to that show and he brought, he, he was a, uh, a pro wrestler like a, like not, not a wwf wcw guy he was like a local regional uh guy like middle cruiser weight or whatever but he, he had the belt from whatever his his league was and he brought him we're like oh my god that's so cool and i remember doing like bundy splashes on the bed at the hotel room until it broke i don't, I don't know what was, i was just so fired i'm like oh my god i got this belt and bang and i'm just until the bed just finally went kapwumpf. and i'm like all right i guess we should leave now maybe um I remember Michael painting himself with like black latex for that show and like kind of like ripping it off, like kind of like Venom uh, during the show, which was kind of cool. Um, so yeah, Alice Cooper was there. He introduced us, which was cool. It was cool to meet him. There was a, a, a haunted house thing going on that was, uh, you know, it was it was all right. It was nothing like, you know, Tim Bunch would put on. But the, the creepiest thing was going into a room that was like a meat locker. And it had like the Hellraiser sort of chains and like right. body parts hanging from the meat hooks and stuff, as in kind of swinging as you walk through. And there was this one like big guy, like kind of just big and heavy, um, like you know six five, like three hundred plus pounder, just big guy, as a as a zombie with like a, a bloody uh, butcher's apron on and like a bloody uh, a meat cleaver, 
and and he's he's all like uh, you know doing doing the, the zombie shuffle thing and he 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 would like target you and just like start shambling towards you and like wh whichever way you went he would just turn and just kind of shit and he's not like chasing after you but he's not backing up either and i'm just like <laughs> all right that, that's that's creepy enough man get the fuck away um but that that's really i mean we just did some shows and there was a guy outside the venue when we first pulled up that i almost tackled for fun but he's oh. a stranger <laughs> i didn't so michael had a jersey a hockey jersey from the new jersey devils that said graves across the back i thought it was knowing he was a hockey fan and knowing that was his name that i that i gave him michael graves i thought it was a custom jersey apparently there's a guy at least at the time on the new jersey devils whose last name was graves and so outside the venue when we're looking to load in i see some fan wearing a graves like with his back to me looking like michael graves wearing the graves jersey so i almost hop out of the i almost go to tackle this freaking guy and i guess he like turns around at the last second or something and i'm like whoa not michael graves jason trioxin right no um <laughs> I, I didn't know i didn't know that's that's who that was but that's all i really remember of of uh that would have been 99 yeah, yeah um uh october 8th 1999 yeah yeah that seems that seems right was doyle doyle's a big uh doyle and jerry are big alice cooper fans so they must have been thrilled that was, yeah that was cool that was cool and, and he he liked us and we liked him and it, everybody got along uh we, we didn't we didn't get to hang out with him too much but it was just cool that he was there and we played with alice cooper at the greek theater in la one year Oh really? You know, I would yeah. imagine that it is such a no-brainer to take yeah. misfits on Alice Cooper, like just mm -hmm. have them support Alice Cooper. That would be what a great opener for Alice Cooper. Yeah. It's just kind of crazy that there's nothing. Yeah. I remember, I think it was the guitarist had his newborn baby with him on tour. He's backstage, like warming up, whatever, with his this baby, like strapped to his chest. Yeah. And I, I think James had just been born, not that much longer before that i was like you took the baby on the road holy crap oh my god okay but it worked for them i remember that there was a it was kind of a who's who uh after party at the greek uh ron jeremy was there like okay what's up ron like good to see you pal keep your pants on thanks um but a few other big names i don't remember uh some of the specifics but uh it was it was a cool show but it wasn't our show like it was Alice's show, so right. we didn't get to go over the top of the. We did, we were just the opening act, um, but we 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 jumped out of the, the so the Tankenstein the, the Tankenstein show. I have now choke slammed Michael. I'm now like I've I've done my thing with the crowd. I'm now kind of like swatting over at Doyle and he's ducking and he's weaving and stuff. And I'm swatting over at Jerry and he's he's trying to get out of the way and he's like stabbing at me with the with the uh, the bass. And I, I I swatted the bass one night. And I I could hear I hit one of his keys and knocked him out of tune. I was like, oh shit, whoops. Um, and then that's when the Crimson Ghost comes back. He's like, had enough. He knows I'm out of control. He's got to get me off the stage. And we're into the next song, Day of the Dead, maybe. Um, and he comes out with the torch. And he's like, you know, at, going at me with, with, the, with the torch. And that's the one thing that I'm like, rrr, rrr, you know, I'm, I'm backing away. I'm like swatting. And I'm, I'm like actually like swatting through the flames, of, you know, quick enough that nothing happens. And that's how he gets me to, to back away off off the stage. Right, fire bad. Yeah, fire bad. So that was that was the first version of the show, and they're like, okay, we can we can go we can do more than that because I was so I was doing merch at the time. I wasn't guitar tech yet. Um, Chris Soto, I think it's sometimes it started out. Tim Bunch was my merch partner, and then I think it switched over to Chris Soto at one point. He would man the booth while I would run off, put all this makeup on, put the costume on, put everything on, and go out, do two songs, and then come back and take it all off again. And there was one point, at, I think the Agora Theater in Cleveland, Ken's backstage as I'm getting all the makeup on, and and he said, um, he said something like, so, you know, knowing how much time it takes me to put everything on and take it all off, and just for two songs, he's like, so is this getting old yet? And I, I kind of glanced over and went, because it was it was a lot i'm like we need to do more if i'm gonna do all this effort to, to you know my i i would glue the uh, the frankenstein electrodes to the side of my neck uh which were really just like starters for um do i have oh god look at this old makeup 
No, I don't think I have them. They were they were uh, igniters for uh, fluorescent light bulbs. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Ugh. I would have to prose it. Uh, bleh, boy. Wow, those actually, that's, what an effective looking. The color again. That's great. Yeah, oh, where's my, I mean, where's my see, I could see it pretty well. I mean, that, it, it, it's a, it's much, it looks a lot cooler than just like your regular old, whatever, you know, neck bolt. Oh, that's even worse. Custom color. I don't know. There we go. Yeah, look Kind-bolt. at that. Oh, man, it's hard. It's hard to hold on to this thing. So it's on it's on some latex, which is no matter what I do is, is kind of going away. But this would go on the side of my neck. It's great. A neck bolt. Um, so I'd have to prosade these onto my neck um, every day. Um, and then instead of using the prosade remover, I would just like, oh like pull my them off. So I had like permanent green circles on my neck for like the entire <laughs> like I was gangrene or something. Um, so it was it was a lot. To do it, so like, all right, so let's let's come up with some more skits to bring Frankenstein back out, and then you know do him away again. So we talked about doing a Bride of Frankenstein shtick, where my my wife at the time Sasha was going to come out as as she's going to go on tour with us and come out as as the bride, and there was going to be something we were going to work into there, but things uh, again went to shit, and I I freak out and basically I I wreak havoc on the stage, and the only way to 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 prevent this from happening is to destroy me. So that's when the Crimson Ghost produces the Cyclotrode X, which was going to be like this this laser cannon. And we were going to do pyrotechnics where there's going to be a flash pot on my chest and a flash pot on my back, like under my my shirt uh, with the jacket. So they were both going to fire at the same time. So you had like a blast of flame come out the front and a blast go out the back. Just and it shoots me. And then that's when I, uh, I you know, I, I go down. So like, okay, well, let's let's test it out here at the shop. We'll, we'll, and I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm just like so into it. I, I'm like willing to sacrifice myself for it. I was like, well, well, why, why don't we put put them on? Let's test it out. Let's see what happens. Oh, Thinking, I've seen these flash pots go off, and they they shoot like straight out or straight up, typically the way they're set up. Not thinking about how heat and flame will rise instead of going out. They're not going to follow that path. So I don't know who was it. I don't know if it was Ken or Glenn. Or somebody who was there was like. Why don't we take one of these big pieces of insulation styrofoam, put the flash pot in the middle, and surround it by all the for some reason we had all this tissue paper, like you'd stick in a gift bag. Right. Um, and surround it with that. And then you you can like hold it on your chest to, to, to kind of feel like what the blast would feel like to see if that's I, I didn't think the, the blast was gonna be a problem. And uh and then we'll we'll just see what happens. We'll go from there. That, that was that's 13-year-old yeah. boy judgment. <laughs> uh-huh. We got this. Let's go. Fire it up. So we, boom, I'm holding it on there and poof. And all uh, everything, all the tissue above the, the flash pot, just like on fire. And we're like, okay, I don't think we can do this. So we were trying to come up with some other thing that we could do, but we, we didn't, we didn't get something actually together before things sadly fell apart. And, uh, what killed Tankenstein was not the band breaking up, uh, was Tank becoming the guitar tech. When I was oh. the merch guy, I could get a, did, what, one of the merch guy, the doors open, I'm busy. The opening bands are playing, I'm kind of busy. I can go take a piss break or whatever. While the band's playing, I, I, I could leave. Like no, Nobody's coming to buy a shirt while the band is playing. When the show's over, I get slammed again as everybody's on their on their way. And that's that's the big rush because people don't want to be holding a shirt all freaking night. Um so as the merch guy, I could do double duty. I could do merch and I could go off during the show and pull off Frankenstein. Once uh, that guy, Jeff, the, the the drug addict guy that I almost wanted to freaking murder, got uh, let go and I became the official guitar tech, uh, I guess Chris Soto at that point took over as the, like the full-time merch guy. And now I, I would help him set up. I would do the count. I would do the count in and the count out, but he would actually run the merch for the, for the majority uh, of the show, and then I was I was up on the stage uh, doing the tech stuff, and no more no more Tankenstein at that point. Sad. R.I.P. to the Tankenstein. Yeah. Now it was fun. it was a lot of fun to doing doing the the, the gig with the, the wrestling stuff with Michael. Like that was really putting it over the top, and it was just the the crowd was so into it. The girls up front just so mad at me. Oh, I freaking loved it. It was great. 
it sounds like a, a real highlight during your tenure with sure. everything that was I, I was I was a part of the stage. I mean, as the crew, you're yeah, you get back and forth on that. You're running across the stage, but you're not you're not part of the show. Um, no, I all was, eyes are on you for that one part of the show, and you get to do that yeah, night out, that was, night after night. Cool. Yeah, that, was that cool. is really cool. And you know, it it also it can get a little sticky. And you know what else is sticky? Oh, here we go. Uh, I can't imagine what could possibly get sticky to stickers. Let oh. me tell you about stickers. In fact, instead of telling you, I'm gonna we're gonna do a special a special one tonight. Uh, I'm actually gonna play. I'm I'm gonna play uh, the, the the very very special video that I have pre recorded. <laughs> We've got a new sticker deal at Riot Stickers. That's right, folks. We are starting a brand new promotion here at RiotStickers.com, and it is for die cut stickers. <gasps> what exactly is die cut? What does it mean? It's time for Sticker Science 101. Basically, you got your regular stickers, right? But we introduce a new element with the die cut sticker. Basically, what you do with a computer guided scalpel. That's right, Computer Guided Scalpels. Isn't that a great band name, Computer Guided Scalpel? I love it. You can cut the exact shape of whatever your design is. So whatever you got going on, whatever its borders are, there's no borders, there's no limitations. You take your Computer Guided Scalpel and you just cut around the edge and you get, voila, a die cut sticker. So in addition to the UV coating that protects from the sun. In addition to being printed on vinyl, which makes them weatherproof and waterproof, you can now have the exact shape that you want. Well, you always could, but you couldn't for a price like this. For $69, you can get 200 die cut stickers. There are some people out there who are die cut fanatics. They need die cut stickers in their lives. You are not gonna find a better deal than this. Now there's only one place you're gonna find this incredible die cut sticker deal for $69, 200 stickers for $69. And that's if you go to the link down in the description, you go to riotstickers.com backslash from us. That's riotstickers.com backslash from us. What Sharpie Riot, have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind? These prices are insane. These prices are crazy Eddie level prices. If you know crazy Eddie, then you might be old. You might be older than me. You're probably way older than me. You click on the link, you do the thing, and you get your die cut stickers. Do not hesitate to get this deal, okay? And without further ado, future Jeff, roll the 60-second Riot Sticker commercial. Go, do it. And that's a promise. Okay. We're now back with Tankenstein here. Yep. Talking about his time in the Misfits, time working with the Misfits. All right. So Tankenstein ends. You almost you almost blew yourself up. You, yeah. you, there was the guitar. You became the you got promoted to guitar tech. And then um, so the 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 is famous monsters, is it out yet when I believe so. Yeah. When you get this opportunity to work with George, tell me, let's talk about George okay. Merrill. Okay. So start from the Hedrick, beginning. Tell me. Yeah. So Hetrick, um, obviously, you know, being working in Hollywood, uh, special effects and whatnot, he's the owner of uh, optic nerve studios out in, in uh, LA. Um, he, uh, would like, th this was a dream come true to do anything with, with George Romero. And, Hetrick's originally from Pennsylvania. Romero's from Pennsylvania. I don't. I don't know how the. I don't know how he made the connection. 
but he made it and he got in touch. He, he had um, the, the, um, uh, the, the band gave him the green light. Okay. You can represent us in this matter. We were on tour while Hedrick was making all these arrangements to get George Romero to come in and direct the misfits scream video with us as zombies. Um, well, I mean, what an honor. How cool would that oh, be? Wait a minute. Question. Um, so, and I will interject every once in a while because I'm a huge George Romero fan and I have lots mm -hmm. of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so who's, where is the zombie? I mean, is the zombie idea is a no brainer because it's George Romero. We're doing zombies or is that pitched? Like how does zombies come about? I, I think that was Hetrick's brainchild and said, you know, I, I'll do the zombie makeup. We'll get George Romero to direct it. It'll be a big hit. And yeah, that's pretty much how that played out. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's pretty much just, this was kind of like Glenn's baby and sort of, you know, his gift uh, to the band. Um, so all the arrangements were made. There was a lot of, you know, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And at, at one point we, we were just told, okay, everybody, we're taking the RV to like Montreal this weekend to film the Scream video. Um, and okay great uh, here we go um i pause 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 one second is i've heard can you clarify um what was there a swapping of services with george yes. was that part that was part of the deal that was part okay yeah that was part of the deal so the misfits wrote fiend without a face for bruiser george bruiser movie and I remember being with Michael in the back of the RV on, on the on the big bed in the back as he was writing the lyrics. And he came up with the line, see the features of my rage. And I was like, dang, dude, that's that's I like that. That's that's good. Um, I was with him when he was writing Saturday night, too. And I was like, I, I was I was feeling it. I was, you know, this is this is cool. Um, Scream. We had started playing live as as they were tweaking it because they learned oh god what song i think there was a song from american psycho that once they started like really playing it live they added like a whoa 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 kind of chorusy thing to it and they were like man i wish we thought of that be before we recorded it um so when they did screen they're like we're gonna play it live and and like really dial it in before we go okay now we're gonna record it so there was a, a whole uh, tour pretty much of Scream being played and it wasn't even, uh, nobody had heard it yet. Um, and that's how it, it kind of came together that way. Um, did, but Scream got played in one of the Scream movies, I believe. That was that was, that was was the idea of Scream originally. So um, if I may interject here briefly, um, one, I think that's awesome when bands do that. When bands mm -hmm. write a song and they workshop it live, yeah, just work it over until the song has really taken a shape, and then you go in and record the song. I think that's a really cool kind of thing to do. Um, number two, and again, I I must pre preemptively qualify what I'm about to say with um, my. This is an observation. This is not. This is not, I, I didn't, I don't think I ever heard Jerry only say this or anything, but, or anybody for that matter, but it always, I, and that's not true. I think, I think he did. He has talked about it in an interview. He's definitely talked about it. In an interview. Jerry seemed to have a hard on for wanting to get on movie soundtracks. Mars Attacks. Yes. Scream. Forbidden Planet. No, Forbidden Zone, I mean. Uh, Lost in Space. It's like, uh, he did it with my shadow, not my shadows, uh, dark shadows. He's always trying. Yeah. He's always aiming like, Hey, let's get a song for a movie. And it really only ever amounted one time with George Merrow and the song bruiser because he scream didn't end up in scream two, or maybe right. it would have it was like on a radio in a car for like a second or something like that. It was like the same sort of uh, less than zero. No, uh, no, no. Wait, you're telling me that the actual song Scream is in I, a Scream I movie? Think, I think 
there's like like a, a a convertible that drives up and and parks in a parking lot and the music that's on the the stereo i think that's scream um or at least maybe an early version that we saw but i don't know uh but we, like two seconds of it and then it shuts off same I thing have, as less than zero like you open the door to the dressing room you hear less than zero like faintly in the background and then the door shuts you're like that really that's it come on well listen i can't uh, you if if anybody is gonna know it's going to be you over me. Like I can't, I have no, uh, but I've never ever heard that that actually did successfully. Yeah. Yeah, Now I'm going to go. Now we will check. And anybody who watches this, please, if you find it, please send it my way. Cause I very much want to hear it. I always thought I, I was with Jerry when he put together the package that he sent to Tim Burton to, uh, rally for the misfits doing, um Mars attacks the, the theme song to the movie and he put together like all, all this merch maybe like a box set um just just a bunch of stuff stickers you know shirts whatever and then like a handwritten letter that says hey you know I'm I'm the band that was like destined to do this theme song and uh you know I collected the cards as a kid and and blah 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 and I, I guess there was maybe a cassette copy of it because I don't think it'd been really I, don't remember I just remember him putting it together and then sending it off to, to Tim Burton somehow. Um, and I don't think anything that was, that was the last we ever heard of it as far as I know. So I, he just always seemed, it was same thing with twilight of the dead land of the dead. Just, it's like always trying to almost overshoot, not overshoot. What's the word? Uh, he's trying to, he's trying to, instead of chase the puck, he's trying to go where the puck is going to be. I'm going to write this mm-hmm. song and hopefully it'll get on a soundtrack. And yeah. you just see that that seems to be a repeating pattern in Jerry only's quest. Right. Um, post, you know, post nineties misfits, but that it actually, I guess maybe, I guess apparently it came to fruition twice. I always thought it was just the bruiser movie where that, that actually we'll, ended we'll up. Du- working out. We'll double check the, we'll double check the screen thing. Maybe that was just like a, an early version that we were shown as like, Hey, this is what we're thinking we'll do. And then maybe it didn't actually make the final cut. I, I don't know, but I do remember seeing a convertible pull up and park and scream playing on the stereo. I I mean, that's amazing. I like you're blowing my mind right now because I always, I don't know. I just always thought that, the, that none of that, like for Yeah. The Mars attacks. And he's like, he got a bunch of the trading cards. He wrote up, wrote the song, the lyrics based on what was on the trading cards. I'm, Tim Burton's going to handle this or, you know, Tim Burton will, will eat this up or whatever. Um, it sounds like Jerry only logic, right? Yeah. Like, like yeah. Yeah. this is great cross promotion. We like, we write movies about, we write songs about horror movies. Horror movies should showcase our songs. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it makes sense. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's a good idea, yeah. but yeah. in any case, to get back to your story. So ultimately yeah. this does come to fruition with, a yes, great yeah. motherfucker to it, do it, it with it did, yeah. George Romero. Yeah. I mean, yep. So we, we drive up the, the band and the crew, we drive up to Montreal. I believe it was, there was a hospital wing that was closed on the weekend, like a rehab uh, facility. So we had the run of the place for Saturday and Sunday. And, uh, Hedrick obviously came up with his girlfriend, Michelle. He did all the makeup both days. Um, he's in the video. You'll see him. He's like holding his arm. He's been bitten on the arm and he's like watching all the, watching the gurneys come in. He's like, oh, oh my God, what the hell? Um, I was an EMT. Fargo, who was one of our drivers, was an EMT. And Shigeo Kikuchi, who was a Japanese photographer, came over to the US uh, and followed us around for a bit. And we all, he was always at our Jap- Japan shows. And he's, he's a pretty well known uh, photographer in Japan, uh, uh, like a rock and roll p- photographer. And all around great guy. His his uh, his nickname, his full nickname, I think was Die Die Smoking Jones. Um, the Indiana Jones fan, so hence the Jones and smoking. He right. always had a cigarette in his mouth. Um, uh, he helped me collect all the Darth Maul stuff from Japan when I was collecting Darth Maul stuff. You know, back when that was cool, if that was ever cool. Um, but so the, we were the three EMTs, and the band was zombies and we just had a bunch of like local kids come out as extras to get like bite marks on them and, and this, that, and the other thing. And we, we just filmed all, all weekend with George Romero, 
who uh, tall guy, kind of, you know, tall, big frame, like large fellow, gentle giant, really, really nice guy. Um, he he had a nickname for me, and it was One Take Tank. Um, just just with my theatrics and, and my my flair for uh, for the for the dramatic, um, when we would do a take, like there's a scene where Chud bites the doctor on the the forehead, I think, and the doctor like collapses, and I, I catch him, and I look at the doctor like, holy shit, he just got bit in the face, and I look up at Chud like, holy shit, it's a zombie. Before we did the take. I'm just like standing there, like getting into my head, like convincing myself that this is real. Chud is really a zombie. This guy is really bitten. He's really bleeding. He's dying in my arms. I'm like getting the emotion driving in me um, for the, the physiological reaction. So when I when I look down at Chud and I look up in horror, I'm really feeling that horror. And George was like, cut, take, print, next, next scene. Like he, we didn't have to shoot it again. And so the, the scene that I'm in, um, the, they shot a lot more footage that in the early versions of Scream, I had a few more seconds of screen time, but in the final cut, which I think might've been like the third, fourth, or even fifth cut, any scene that I was in was like, clip, blip, like, oh, there I was, oh, there I was, like, you know, I was like, oh man, I was, I kind of had my, almost had my 15 seconds, but I got like 1.5 seconds of fame instead. Um, obviously as the EMTs were carting the, 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 the bodies in, in the beginning, but the other main scene that I was in, uh, besides catching the doctor, was Doyle stabs me in the throat with a needle. And there's a tank on the wall that th there's like a hose that goes to this tank and it starts, it's a vacuum tank and sucking the blood out of me as he's like stabbing me in the throat. And so as we're, as we're staging the, the, um, the scene, George sitting in his, in his folding director's chair, the you know, the high director's chair, just uh, as usual. And um, the DP is you know, setting up the shot. And George is like telling Doyle, I, I can't see the tank. And so he thinks he's talking about the tank on the wall. So Doyle's like shifting this way. And, and George's like, no, 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 I can't see the, the tank. Like he's pointing, like the tank, one tank tank. And Doyle's like, oh, he kind of looks at me like, really? Oh my God, are you serious? Like, um, but the, the, uh, the gimmick was we had two straws, one that was inside the other one. So when Doyle, in, in the, the longer take, you see the 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 needle, the, this long needle hit my, hit me right in the larynx, and then slide in, and then it starts. And we had the, there was an assist, there was a, uh, I guess it would be a grip, um, just sitting out of frame with this thing that was like 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 pumping blood into the tank as after it goes in, and then you see it start filling up, and so I'm full on like, again getting into character, like convincing myself this is real. Not only am I am I being drained of blood, but I can't breathe, so I'm choking on this this needle. And I'm like, what? I'm, I'm gagging. I'm choking the whole bit. And it, it seeing the, the playback, I was I convinced myself that I was I was choking that I just been stabbed in the throat. But then the the blip that we get like in the actual cut, I'm like, yeah, none of that actually sold. Damn, <laughs> that, that kind of sucks. Um, and the, the original edits were full color later we did the black and white stuff where like just blood was was red which was kind of cool but i, I don't know i, I think wish it was, I still had I think it was effective stuff. yeah it was effective well, with, you know, with romero having done night of the living dead it kind of fit um so so th those were uh oh and we so we did two days of shooting the we had we had three emt outfits i was in pretty good shape uh back then so I, I put mine on. It was like really tight across the chest and shoulders, like cutting off the circulation of my upper arms. I have a long torso, so it's like digging into my crotch. Like, oh my god! Um, but but I looked good. I looked like you know I looked buff. But then the second day, I think I showed up a little bit later, and she gave, somebody else was wearing that one, and I had whatever one, and it was like baggier. And I was like, oh damn! Hopefully we're not going to do many too too many body shots in this one because it's not showing off the uh, the physique. Um, but the the person, the girl that was slated to play the nurse, who's like kind of the, the star of the video. Right. She's kind of like the Barbara character who has the thriller yeah. moment at the end with Jerry, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she, the original person, couldn't make it. I don't remember why. And we were we were this close to calling to, to I actually had her on the phone. Uh, my my girlfriend at the time, but later my wife, Sasha. She was this close to getting on a plane and flying up to do the role of, of the nurse. Wow. And, uh, 
it ended up, I think, like the DP's girlfriend or somebody, somebody related to somebody's sister, maybe from the crew were like, oh, uh, you know, she's available. She can, she, she's right here. She can just do it, which made more sense. But for me, I was like, missed it by that much. Still uh, a bit cool. She, it would have been cool, but she, she did a good job. Um, I remember Boyle's makeup, like his, his teeth were like out in front. So actually as he was chewing something like blood was coming down and dripping out from under his prosthetics, we're like, Oh, we'll fix that in post. Don't worry. Don't worry about that. Um, and the, the final line that Jerry says, welcome to the party, honey. Um, that was actually multiple takes of like all these different catchphrase lines. Just let's try this one. Let's try that one. And I, I don't remember any of them unfortunately anymore or, you know welcome to the party honey was the one that made the cut there were so many others and i i think whichever one stuck like jerry was like i'm gonna i'm gonna get that copyrighted like that's gonna be like my let's get rid of the rumble thing um it didn't uh, i guess it didn't stick so it never never went anywhere um, he must have had he must have had a ball he must have had a blast just doing that over and over again mm -hmm. doing the line mm -hmm. um the scene where the 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 girls going to the the dark hallway and we, we've actually got like a flashlight like the lights like swinging on her and and chud like comes out of the window and, and kind of like you know falls out after her. chud actually like fell out of that way it looks like he's falling out he, he actually did overshoot it and he he fell out of the window um the scenes where michael is a zombie it's not michael I was going to ask you about this. I wasn't sure if you were going to bring it up. So Michael yeah. Graves did not show up on the first the, day. The first day. Yeah. What what exactly happened? What was what was the deal? I'm trying to remember what the reasoning was why he couldn't make why he couldn't get into the RV with the rest of us, but he flew up the second day. So obviously the live stuff of him in the back. Hey hey guys, you know, five minutes guys. Ken walks in and says time for the like that's that's really him. But the zombie makeup, it's 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 a, it was a Canadian fan. I remember him coming to a lot of like the the Buffalo, like those those northern US, southern Canada shows. He was around a lot in the early days. Don't remember his name, but he looked kind of like Michael. He was kind of, you know, I guess kind of like Jason Ryoxon Jr. Looked kind of like Michael, had the same frame. It was like, yeah, put the zombie makeup on. Nobody will know. And nobody knew until I opened my big mouth, I guess. I, you know, it's in I for it's in that documentary mm. that Kenny talks about the frustration. I remember he was interviewed about this. And he talks yeah. about the frustration over that, where yeah. they've got they got George Romero lined up, and he's not there, and yeah. it's embarrassing because it's like, hey, you know, we're in front of uh, the freaking the man himself and man, our lead okay. singer isn't here. Like what the fuck that. So I have to, I actually, I should really review that. I, I, he, he explained, he breaks it down in there. I, I just don't remember yeah. what he said. It's been, um, I, was, I was sitting next to him as he told that story. And that was so long ago. I, I don't remember yeah. the, the details. Of time. There is a continuity error uh, with Fargo day one. He's got his Mohawk with like some peach fuzz on the sides. And then we, we shoot his scenes and like that evening, you know, just because it was like, when you're filming, there's a lot of, like if it's if it's not your scene, there's a lot of just standing around and waiting. And sure. so he wanted to get the sides trimmed up. So we did that. And then they were like, um, might have a continuity issue here. And sure enough, he's in the background the the second day with his clean shaven on the sides. But I don't think anybody noticed. I I had a black crew cut at the time because my hair was just growing back in from the first time I went to the skin bald on tour. And I remember the night I did it, Jerry was like, um, well, you know, it, it'll grow back in before we shoot the screen video, right? And I'm like, nobody told me I was going to be in the screen video. Like, this is the first I'm hearing of it. I didn't, nobody gave me a memo that said, don't, don't cut your hair, Tank. You're going to be in the video. So luckily, it, it didn't grow back into what it normally was, but at least it was something. Um that I could I could die black and, and so uh, when you first meet George Romero or when Jerry and George are are palling it up or whatever I mean does George what does George know of the song Night of the Living Dead is he aware that this that there's a song called Night of the Living Dead and I don't know maybe I I, I honestly have no idea I don't, I don't remember that coming up in in any any topic of conversation that I was seated at but that could have been Hedrick might have opened with that like hey you know in case you weren't aware um that would yeah. be interesting to know what he that thought. Would be, yeah, I don't know if that was the kind of music he would have listened to, but 
Sure. Um, I think he would have appreciated the social commentary of the song and just, you mm -hmm. know, the idea that there's that, that, that there was a song. I don't know. I just, I want to imagine, I want yeah. to imagine that that's what it would be. You would appreciate the shot of Doyle uh, as somebody who's worked behind a camera. Um, when Doyle is like coming at you, like the, like the, the nurse is like yeah, running he's... away from him through, through the, and he keeps like going through the, the curtains. The uh, the cameraman is actually on rollerblades and being pulled backwards through Love the that. curtains as 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 he's filming, and it, it looked great. It looked really really good. Um, and so I, I learned was, interesting things, you know, working on that on that set with what, the master. Yeah, I was going to say. So, like, what is uh, George as a director? Like, what is he really? Is he just sort of pointing his hand, going, "Okay, go over here and do this," and like, what what I, is? It, it was easy. I just, he would just, I mean, I'm one take tank. I'm, I, I wasn't new to doing anything like this. So he was just like, okay, this is the scene, this, that, that, this is going to happen and go. And we would do it. And okay, the next scene, let's go. So it, it was just, he was so easy to work with. He, like I said, he was a gentle giant. Mm. Um, uh, we, the, the Sunday, so when we were done, we kind of had a wrap party dinner, big round table dinner, like a, I want to say a steakhouse or something, really good food. We George was out. there for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the the entire the band and crew and the entire film crew like all went out to dinner together. Wow. Then we went out and saw the Sixth Sense because that was in the theater at the time. Wow. Um, I'm so I'm and, and the, the theater was sold out like it was packed. There was there was not a, a free seat left when we when we sat down. Um, I had already seen it before uh, I left for this trip uh, with 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 Sasha. Um. So I, I knew what was what you know, the whole premise of the movie. Um, I didn't get to read that. Um, that. He says that's mushroom. Says hello, tank. Yeah, Jeff, come dripping. <laughs> yeah. Oh um, my God, what a fucking name, Jeff. Instead of death, comes ripping. Jeff comes ripping. Holy copyright. shit! Copyright Holy shit! That. Copyright. Yeah. Copyright right now. Holy shit! <laughs> Jeff comes ripping. <laughs> Dude, oh that's fucking sick. Sorry, there's yeah. a there, you're going to see the sixth sense and okay. And so Michelle, uh Glenn Hedrick's girlfriend Michelle is sitting next to me. And I, I'm very close with the with the two of them. And then Hedrick is sitting on the other side. And the scene where um Haley Joel Osmond, whatever the character's name is. Spoilers, everybody. Spoilers. Oh, yeah. If you haven't seen the movie yet, first of all, go see it. Second of all, this happens. He's in the the dead girl's room by himself kind of walking around her bed and i know exactly when her hand is going to come out and grab his ankle and just as that happens my hand goes boom right on michelle like i grab her thigh like right above the knee and she like Wah! flies out of the seat like ass like three feet off her seat in the, in the air and now i like i'm 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 fucking dying it's so fucking but glenn is laughing tears People are all around us are laughing, and she's so mad. She she goes and punches him for laughing, and then turns and punches me for doing it, and goes back and punches him. Like she doesn't know who to hit next. She's like so so miffed about this, but the it, the timing was perfect. Um, all right, Michelle. Love question. It. I by the way, I have the scream video queued up here. I'm not going to play it with mm -hmm. the music, but how could we yeah. not watch the scream video after hearing all the descriptions of the scream video? We have to watch it. I used to I watch it. I had, the, I had a VHS of like all the different edits. And yeah. You had the, the extended cut or whatever, you know, yeah, I, know I, I used to watch up. that video all the time, man. I just, I was huge George Romero fan. I mean, I, the song scream itself, it's an okay song. Um, but like that, man, that video is, it's a masterpiece. It's honestly, yeah. That video might be one of the best things to come out of the new Misfits, like the Misfits 95 for me. Like that mm -hmm. video is like top tier excellent. Um, my my question to you though is I, I just want to know. So the 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 you shoot the music video, but mm -hmm. folded into the music video is footage that would also wind up being in bruiser. Right. Um, the during the misfits are in Bruiser, they play the band. And I began, I don't think we I think we bear we've just barely grazed on it. The 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 notion was that George was like, Okay, the misfits will be the I'll have a song and the misfits will be. I mean, it really is a very mutually beneficial thing. Misfits, you're gonna be in my movie mm -hmm. and you'll do you'll do the movie, 
and I'll direct a music video for you. Everybody wins. The song yeah. is featured in the movie. The song I'm mm -hmm. going to do the, the direct the video. And like, what a great sort of just everybody wins in that kind of way. What do you remember, yeah. if anything, about that set on Bruiser? Did you see Peter Stromer? Because no. I believe he was there that day when you guys were filming. I, I was I was not involved in any of the filming for Bruiser, only for the filming of, of Scream, because I was I was in it. Was that but but that that all took place at the same time, or was that no the, the live footage that you see in Bruiser and in the Scream video was filmed some completely different time. Some other oh, location. okay. I thought that it was like a, sort of a cornucopia of like, hey, I'm in the middle of filming Bruiser. Let's shoot these crowd scenes. I'll do your music video. Blah blah blah. I okay. So that happened at a later date. Yeah. Or a different. The time. only thing I was there for was the weekend of shooting in the hospital with all the zombie scenes. Got you. Okay, I'm gonna play the video right now. And if anything else comes to mind, I mean, you yeah. already gave us so many little details. But if anything comes to mind while we're watching, at when we're done, let's not. Actually, we can talk over it. I just, you know what? I don't know if Roadrunner is gonna like. This might get cut out of the live broadcast because road right. runners, all these labels that suck. But yep. let's let's hope let's hope not. You know what? Why don't you? Let, well, how come we're not going to just not going to watch it in silence? All right. If so, I remember so, correctly, that guy right there doing the crossword puzzle is the uh, the DP, the director of photography. Oh, really? I think he was running the camera. And that was the scene that he like cameoed in. If I'm okay. not mistaken, if that it was that it may. Mm, this is no. such a great opening too, man. It's just yeah. so great. It just establishes the thing. The the, with so the there's Michelle Hetrick pushing that cart. Well, not we call her Michelle Hetrick. They weren't actually married. Yeah. Uh, uh, you got the urine sample. Oh no, behind the counter, you got the doctor, and then the guy behind the doctor right now. He was yeah. the guy that was a pro wrestler on the side, and he was the guy behind the you camera. All the kids all. in the misfit shirts. They got zombie bites. Like this is just such a yeah. slam dunk. And, and Hetrick. So there's Hetrick holding his arm. Yeah, here come the EMTs coming in. That's Hetrick with his short hair back then. There's you. Look at you. Um, and you know the, the yeah, footage right. is great. That the footage, the live footage that was shot is great too, man. I mean, that's yeah. that's that's great footage of the misfits. Look at them. <laughs> Doyle looks amazing, man. Why isn't Doyle in more movies just being a monster? Right. right. I mean, that's yep. such a natural. There's, there's Michelle, that's Glenn's girlfriend, Michelle. She gets bit on the cheek or the, the, <laughs> or the cheek there. She screams. This is so that, great, man. This is so great. So that's not Michael Graves, though. No. So here comes the Dr. Chud bites him on the forehead. I catch Ooh. him. Yeah, there you are. Look at that. <laughs> yep. You're, you're horrified. Michelle's going down. So that's, that's crazy. That's just a flashlight. Oh God, it's it's so much better in black that, and that, white. That's man. the director. That's the that's the cameraman, the wrestler how, how, getting bit right now. I mean, yep. it, yes, this would be cool in color, but I don't know. I, I the black and white makes the video. It's like a there spotlight. Are, yeah, there are versions that are are fully in color, and the, the edits are different. Like some of the some of the some of the the gorier scenes yeah, that's are not longer. Michael Graves. That's not definitely Michael Graves. not Michael Graves. That's Shigeo. Shigeo is getting bitten right now. Here Doyle the looks board. amazing. Yeah, look at he's got a chatter. He's, he's kind of got like a hell Yeah, yes. this the, so that's Doyle's a rollerblade blade shot. That's Beautiful. the rollerblade shot. That's Beautiful. Coming at you. Yeah. Doyle looks so great. I, I mean, look at this with the um, uh, George Romero. I don't think he, George Romero directed any other music videos. This is a brilliant music video. Yeah. It's that's there you are. The throat. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. So you don't actually see the needle go in, which was part right. of the cell, unfortunately. This is a great so shot. Michael Graves. Yeah, they cut to Michael Graves, like actual Michael yeah. Graves, like just to sell it. Michael Graves. That's actually Jerry. There's, right. there's, there's Rocky. There, there, there he is. Rocky. Oh, man. The there's Fargo in the background with a clean shaven head. You can't see because the stupid things are in the way. How do you get oh, rid of that? That's God, annoying. I wish you could. There, I, I love oh. when Jerry, when Jerry uh, trades hands with the base. And you yeah. hear the little, you hear the noise the bass makes. It's so great. Yeah, <laughs> completely different, completely different uh, place. It's not even the same same location when they when they right. after Jerry tosses the bass to the other hand, and then it cuts back to him again. Completely different location. So all the all the resurrection tour posters that are in the background, a lot of them had like little Hitler mustaches and glasses drawn on them and stuff. Wait, let's see, Just let's see if we can see that. I don't know if you can see it in the video, but. 
they they were there and I, I took them all down and I took them home with me and they later sold in uh, Grimm's auctions because they were one of a kind. Hell yeah. Oh, Screen used in a George Romero misfits video. Yeah. So there's Kenny. Kenny. There's, there's a, there's a flyer, but there's, there's resurrection there is the in the background. We had a whole wall of them. And it's so that funny. That's so that great. Zombie scenes of Michael is not Michael. I mean, well, you know what's funny? This is the first time I've ever watched. I've watched this video hundreds of times. I've seen it many, many times. Mm -hmm. I, this is the first time that I blatantly noticed that it's really not Michael Graves. Like, and it's funny too because I always thought that, like, this shot has to be my. This shot's Michael Graves. Wait a minute. Let's go back. That <sighs> this is hard. Uh, this is Michael Graves, isn't it? He was up there, right? Like he had to have been up there. He, oh, he, came, he came up the second day, so we might have done some pickup zombie shots. So that but, is that. Yeah, that that's got to be Michael Graves because that looks like Michael Graves. Yeah, a close-up shot would have to be him, but like yeah, anything it's... else, wasn't him. It was kind of crazy. I mean, that really is. I mean, it's like crazy that that, like you know, you're you're in front of George Romero. I mean, at this point, I would have to imagine that the Misfits are probably like this is at this point in time this is like the highlight of our fucking career we're yeah. working with george romero it was big yeah we're gonna be in a we're gonna be in a movie and our our lead singer's not here like that that's oh there's the boots that you were always talking about yeah. that's that's the boots. which as right soon here. as we wrap up on screen that'll be the next thing that we uh we get into okay i, I did, did some digging in the attic you did some digging in the attic yeah that's yeah, that's Michael Graves. Yeah, yeah. So the close-up shots, they must have done him up the second day and did some pickup shots. Interesting. And then they just filled it in with the with the live. I mean, it really is this to me, like this is a perfect music video. It's perfect. Like there's there's literally not a there's I can't there's not a bad bone in this music video's body. It's just so, it's just so wonderful. I love this. I love the way he just like barely, like he doesn't really move his mouth because he probably can't. And he just kind of touches yeah. her. Look, he like touches her face. <laughs> he like kind of is giving her a kiss, but he's also biting her. It was the makeup was very limiting, all that prosthetic. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, what it was, was it like for Doyle? What about Doyle with the chatterbox mouth? Yeah, he had his, he actually had teeth with his that were outside of his lips. And like I said, when, when they did to him, like eating something like the blood would actually run down under the prosthetics down his neck. Um, so we decided to make sure we, we cut that out. Now, I maybe this is jumping a little bit ahead, but this makeup was actually replicated for a couple of live shows. Yeah. Was that was that around this time or was that after it would have been it would have been after this time. And I uh, Hedrick must have come out and did did the makeup maybe like a, a quick Halloween tour or something like that. Hedrick also went out with uh typo negative for like a week on a Halloween tour and That's did cool. uh, make up for them. So, so now we, we do put a cameo after Ken comes out and says five minutes guys. And we revert back to reality. Quote, yeah. unquote, reality. Um, in the background, we see Fargo with the sides of his head, freshly shaven. And we see him talking with somebody who's uh, a little shorter with some long, uh, some long dark hair. Oh, can we see it? Uh, oh, there. Okay. Hard. Yeah, we just missed. Okay, but that guy with the the shorter guy with the long dark hair—that's Frankie Cheese. Oh, that's Frankie Cheese. Chibo Frankie Jones. Jones. Yeah. Yep. Chibo Jones. Chibo Jones. Um, that's his one uh, appearance in here. That's great. I mean, it really is. Now, now, in terms of what we are foreshadowing, what we are building to, for the sake of that, Michael Graves, not. Michael Graves not showing up, does that has to tighten the tensions on some level within or create some sort of term further turmoil that's eventually leading us to what's gonna come in in the fall of 2000. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were there were little dribs and drabs here of like, well, that's an issue, you know. Well, that that's that's a problem. Right. Um, right. but that was we, like a pothole, I would imagine. Yeah, it was like we just it, it almost became expected, uh, sadly. Like, oh, oh, Michael's not going to make it for this one? Okay. Oh, New, New York Ranger, we're going to record that with Cafiero because Michael's not going to show up? Okay. Like, well, that's why he... So that's why Cafiero sang that. 
I think I think there's two recordings. I think there's one with Michael and one with the official one with Cat Piero. Because I, I, as far as I know, again, this is this is from what I've heard secondhand. Michael didn't make it. Uh, did not know about him. You, you would think that singing a song for the New York Rangers as a hockey fan would be like, yeah. So, I, I don't know. Might have been something rubbing in the wrong way about the project. I don't know. Just couldn't get out of bed that day. I don't know. But didn't show up. In any case, this is part of what's laying the groundwork of what's to come. I just want to give a quick shout out to Larry the Wolf of the Mammals. Oh, yeah. Larry's uh, here. Larry, I just want to quickly, quickly sidebar for a second guy. and just say that Larry the Wolf, two things about Larry the Wolf Tank. Thing number one, I just had Larry the Wolf on for a KISS show. We were talking about mm -hmm. KISS. Larry the yep. Wolf is a huge KISS fan, and it was such a pleasure to have him on the show, and he just was such a great panelist talking about KISS. And number mm -hmm. two, um, uh, with Sharpie Riot, shout out to Sharpie Riot. We did a show. I don't know if you saw the show. It might have passed your radar or not. We did a show where what if – a what if show if what if jerry only decided to not we talked about this in grim tales 3 this notion of of jerry only s becoming a singer mm -hmm. or, or theorizing that you know a huge part of him becoming a singer is really out of necessity and not so much an ego thing it's right. like yeah jerry really did give a good hard try in trying to replace michael graves he really yeah. did i you can't yeah. it can't be you know, for, for whatever faults you want to give to Jerry only, he really did like try to mm -hmm. not be the lead singer uh, to an extent. So yep. we had a sort of what if, like a what if, who would you get? The, the, the rules were it had to be someone who was active at that time and who mm -hmm. could have filled the slot super well yeah. for the Misfits 95. And we had our list and my number one pick Mm -hmm. Number one pick, hands down, would have been perfect, was Larry the Wolf. Would have yeah. been the perfect person to take yeah. over that role for Michael Graves, had that all lined up. He he had the body build. He mm -hmm. was into, he was dedicated to his craft. He was into mm -hmm. the, this is a retread of that show, but I just have to repeat it here. Yeah. He just would have been the, he was the guy for the job. He would have yeah. been the guy for the job, so. That. Yeah, <laughs> I, that that would have been something, man. Because I'm I'm a huge Manimals fan. Love Larry, st total stand up guy. The whole yeah. band, um, and uh, I I only got to see them live once, sadly, at Chiller Theater, early like 2000 something like that. They came out and, and played them with my first time uh, meeting uh, uh, the band. Uh, went to the show. Larry was like, "Yeah, come up on stage and sing with us." And I was like, "Dude, you don't want me wrecking your show like that, please." I, I, I'm, I'm honored, but come on, that, that's that would just nobody wants to see that. Um, but uh, man, that what a wow, that would have been. That is been that fit. not that is the fit? That is the fit. Like, yeah. like I, he just he would have been. I, I'm talking about if there was if there was if there was still a, a, an agenda to have a front man in the same way that yeah. graves and you know zoli and whoever and, yeah. and hideous were you know this idea of having a front man larry the wolf is would have been perfect be awesome. with with doyle and jerry flanking either side yeah. just what a spearhead that would have been yeah and yeah. you know and, and he had larry, the pipes he could have done it He's got a great voice for 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 the mm -hmm. animals, but just like for, for rock, like rock metal, uh, in general. In fact, my 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 wife Faye, who's like not a, not really a fan of of that style of music, but she certainly heard you know me play the animals in the car, and she's like, I like his voice. Like his yeah. voice really good. I'm like yeah, yeah, it, it fits. Yeah. It really fits. Um, and he, he writes like, some music like it's it's intricate without being like Christ the Conqueror intricate um it's like it's just the right amount of of punk meets metal meets you know in a dark yeah. alley where like uh it's really really good huge fan. The, the 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 last thing that they put out just man um it was so great to hear some of the the uh, the live stuff some of the deep cuts um studies in scarlet yeah i i know there's more deep cuts out there but we just we haven't heard them unfortunately but uh man i freaking love those guys he says you know, tank may know. Rumor, there used to be a rumor at 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 at, uh, at uh, Vinyl Inc. in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is where Big Dave and I used to go and buy our seven-inch, you know, the old, the, the bootlegs and the the original stuff. 
up on the wall behind the counter, George had a Manimals record, the Blood is the Harvest record, still in the shrink wrap, but he didn't have the front side of it showing. He had it flipped over, so you had the three pictures of the band members, and uh, the picture of Larry was circled with an arrow pointing to it, and it said, Doyle, question mark. So there was this rumor, like, did Doyle have a side band, and he just called himself Larry? Tank may know where the May 96 video of me with them disappeared. I I don't think I ever saw that video. I wish I knew. He brought uh, that up. He he came on the show. He also did an episode of Pizza Punk separate mm -hmm. from his panel, and yeah. he made mention of that. Yeah, that there, there was a video, because he did come up. He did come up in the 90s yeah. and sang and stuff. And, yeah. You know, exactly. I, I mean fuck that would have been that would have that would have been had had all the things lined up had 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 everybody been able to get on the same page and that like it made sense for everybody and however it needed to be that would have been mm -hmm. I, I just can't think of a better fit i really can't yeah. it just would have been cool um yeah. it's it's funny that you say that about the the people mistaking larry for doyle on the back of the thing in the record store because I mean, isn't that the, again? That's the beauty of that's the beauty of of mythology pre-internet. There's yeah. like inter the internet has brought a lot of interesting mythology with it. Like for instance, a great example, and I kind of want to devote a whole show to this. I love like going on Reddit every once in a while. You just see your people talk about Glenn Danzig stories. Like I saw Glenn shopping in a blah 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 blah. And he what you hear well, like all these sir. yeah whatever just like all these stories like you know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's kind of like Bigfoot. Like you cross Bigfoot, or whatever. <laughs> and I and you know, so the the internet's good for that. But there's also the pre-internet mythology where where I feel like. You know, anybody could say anything on the internet and like you kind of like you kind of are not cynical. What's the word? Uh not what what's the word I'm trying to say? Not cynical. Uh uh oh, fuck. No, 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 no. When you're skeptical, skeptical. Skeptical, okay. Yeah, you go just because it's written on the internet doesn't mean it's real. But I feel like pre-internet, yeah. it's like it's like there was no way to verify it, and you just either believed it or you didn't. That's and a, that's that is why Big Dave bought that album because George <laughs> heard that rumor. Is, like, is this guy Doyle? They had the similar haircut. He's built. Um, granted, he's playing bass and singing. And we only ever saw like one photo of Doyle with a mic stand in front of him at some show. Like, did he actually do backing vocals or was it just the mic stand there and somebody forgot to take it away? Like, why is there a mic stand in front of Doyle? Um, but we Dave bought the record. We went back to his, his, his parents' house and, and threw it on. And right away, we were like, whoa, these guys fucking rock. Holy shit. So especially we, Burn Witch uh, Burn. That's my that's my that song. That's yeah. always on. I have like a, a music playlist and that song mm -hmm. is on heavy rotation and that 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 belongs in there. because I just fucking. But believe it or not, song. and it, it's it's the one song that Larry doesn't sing, but outside your window. Um, and, and Larry gave me some backstory as to why it sounds the way it does. It's kind of funny. Uh, I'll let him tell that story. That's his to his to share. Um, but just the, just the the echoey kind of distant howling of, of the vocals, and I, I, I don't know that that was always uh, the one for me. But of course, I'll be, you know the, the opening track is is gonna be the one that really you know, wind winds you in there, reels you in, uh, reels you in. Yeah, but I mean, so we bought it because we thought it was Doyle. We were still like, is it Doyle? Because you have you have Dark and the Wraith, and then this guy Larry. Like, is he trying to throw us doing? You're trying to throw us off, off your scent here. You give me yourself a totally different name. Like, we, we came up with every possible reason why that could have been Doyle. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we were we were fans from the from the get go. So, and uh, obvious Kiss influence, you can really feel it in the in the music. Uh, the sure. way it was written. Um, sure. It's just so well done. In in an, in an era when punk was just like bare bones, stripped down, you know, garage, whatever. That this was this was different. This was definitely different, and very cool. So thank you, Larry. Cool. Thank you for yes. Bringing we that salute to you, world. Larry the Wolf. My first mm -hmm. screenplay I ever wrote was about a werewolf, and I named him Larry the Wolf after Larry the Wolf. I wrote that right. screenplay. I wrote that screenplay twelve years ago, called The oh. Shift. Actually, it's called The Shift, and. Figure. Uh, which I was, I, I always take inspiration from music. That's how, so the, the, the Sam Haynes song is what inspired some of it, mm -hmm. but the idea, mm -hmm. it was, I don't know, it was an interesting idea, but the, yeah, the name of the wolf, 
the guy of what the, the werewolf character was Larry, Larry the Wolf. The T Wolf, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Esquire. <laughs> um so okay, so where were we? So the so George Romero video goes off. And then, like, yep, yep. Did, so you bring that video. Does that video then goes to like Roadrunner? And it's like, hey, let's get some heavy playtime. And Jerry's not. So Jerry is not happy with Roadrunner either. It it seemed like with every label, they would promise you the moon before you signed the contract, and then once they got their meat hooks into you, if you were not their main push at the, the current agenda, you just got backburnered and they gave you minimal whatever they could get away with contractually speaking and i think roadrunner was pushing coal chamber at the time like when we hit uh geffen it was rob zombie a uh, white zombie rather um in fact there was some leakage I, I i can't say this is true but this is what i heard was being speculated that, that jerry was coming into geffen with these ideas and then they would end up being on like a white zombie album and jerry's mm. like what the fuck? that was that was my idea um supposedly and uh, this is according to jerry he told me this himself he he and doyle got backstage at a metallica show when they were working on the christ the conqueror project they gave a, a cassette of it to james or kirk or somebody back there right and he claims that wherever, wherever I, I may roam, roam yeah was a ripoff of their wherever i may roam maybe that's true i i don't i don't know i don't know um the only way to, to, to shut that down is to do what uh, Aretha Franklin always did, did, and that was anybody who handed her a, a cassette or a CD, like, hey, here's my music, check it out, right in front of them, and immediately she would turn and toss it right in the trash can. And they'd be like, whoa, what the fuck? And she'd say, if I ever write any song that even remotely sounds like anything you did, I do not want you coming after me for legal this, that, and the other. I'm like, okay. I got to I got to tell you something, uh, just a mm. quick, super quick sidebar before we dive back in, just because uh, just, just hearing this. So I, I was watching YouTube late night. I was uploading an, uh, one of the episodes to Spotify and just doing my thing. And all of a sudden a uh, pre-roll trailer on a YouTube video comes up for this really interesting sci-fi movie or TV show. I'm going, wow, this is really cool. And I'm like, I'm like, huh, but there's something super familiar about this. What is that? And I'm just like, and I catch the title, I Google it, and my jaw drops open. It is the exact synopsis for something I that you. I yep. oh, you saw that thing. I, I mean, oh, yeah, it that, that shit happens, me. man. Yeah, that shit crazy. happens. Yeah, it's yeah. fucking crazy. It's fucking yeah. crazy. Like, yeah. you really have to be. I mean, I could imagine if you're a famous person and people come to you with shit. And you just, and then like, mm. man, if anything resembles it, like you could just get your, your, just yeah. your ass suit off, you know? It's just I, I, Yeah. Once, well, because somebody like Aretha Franklin, she's got money. So there, there's reason for a lawyer to go after sure. her. Totally. If you can not totally. be that team and Jim Dorsey comes out with some song that sounds remote, like you're not coming after me. I've got, I've got nothing for you. So yeah, right. once you hit a certain level, you, you've got to start CYAing a lot more than you normally would. Totally, totally. Okay, so all right, so Roadrunner, so Jerry, and this will come up later, later on with the formation of Misfits Records, and we've looked at we've looked at some of Jerry Only's interviews where he's you know uh, talking about forming a record label and how you know lots of broken promises and this and then the other. So it makes sense. Um, yeah. So then, what else is going on? There's we're still in the year. <laughs> Still in the year 1999. Wait, two no. hours in, and we're barely two thousand. I so I, I had the list. So I had the list that you and I were that I was sending you as as I was listening to the old video. Um, but when we when we saw the screen video, we saw Jerry's original boots that that were. So the, right. the original boot that he had, the 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 engineer boot was gifted to him by Sid Vicious' his mom. Those were Sid's old boots. They happen to have the same size uh, foot, I guess. Although Jerry. We, I would have to re I would have to yank them off his feet at the end of a show because uh, he couldn't get them off himself. Um, he added stuff to it to make them his misfits own. And this was before um, uh, Ashton Sin of, of uh, uh, Nightcraft Leathers started making all, all of Jerry's uh, stage gear. Um, but as I'd said in a previous, I think with part three, um, I had been asked to make a prototype, a leather prototype right. of the the 
extra leather that Jerry put on those boots. And that was the day that I first met Paulie B and didn't realize it was him until Kenny and Rocky came in. Oh, you saw Paulie. I'm like, that was Paulie B. Oh, shit. So as I was digging around in the attic for the pieces of the, the, the Frankenstein, the on off or no faux uh, uh, handles, I found the prototype. Oh, cool, man. So wow. I'm going to have to back up a bit, I guess, here. So this back strip of leather is very thick, very, very stiff. And these X's, this would be a large spike. These would be like medium-sized spikes and then another large spike down here. And then as you get up, so this would have been like two snaps, two rivets. It was riveted to Jerry's boots, and we couldn't take it off without damaging the boots. So then this part wraps around. So it's just meant to accentuate whatever boots you have. Yeah. So that that so those, wow. those two holes came together, riveted together. So this is now the back of the boot. This is the front of the boot. This this uh, this little peak comes down the front. This comes up the side of his thigh, and then and this part hangs is, over. Um, uh, electrical taped to his thigh. This part down here, this is complicated. This part down here wraps around, like over the top of the 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 foot. Right. And these two dots come together, rivet together, and then there's two straps here that that buckle underneath, like right in front of the heel. And then there's more spikes that go in there. But then, man, the engineering that went into using poster board to pull patterns off of the existing boot, which was three-dimensional. I can't even imagine. Two dimensions. This was a freaking project. And I, I, just like his real boots, I used extra strips of le leather and hand-stitched them all the way around the, the edging here at the top. And then down here, there are separate panels. Um like this, this is, let me get it closer to the camera there. So that's, that's an extra piece stitched on that would have had a medium spike and a medium spike, extra piece stitched on, extra piece stitched on. What a and fun, then, creative challenge. Yeah. Huh? So the, yeah, this, and I love doing this kind of stuff. Um, so this, well, you know, you got your supple leather is the main part of it. And then that one, like Jerry gave me this leather. It was the really thick, stiff stuff that he just had. It, it's, it's like a quarter inch thick. It, I'm not, I'm not. Yeah, it looks it looks like it could support something like yeah, it's got some stiffness to it. But the idea was to mass produce these and sell them to fans that wanted to do like Jerry only boots. I mean, Might it's a, a weird, thing. it's a weird sort of random thing, but it's really mm -hmm. cool. Like as as somebody who's who used to dress like the Misfits back in high school. And yeah, for sure. Early years after, I would have been all over that. Yeah. Um, we Jerry had this vision of of a catalog, a, a Misfits merch catalog, to where you could buy those, uh, you could buy the the early uh, Saber models, um, which is a whole other chapter we kind of forgot about. We need to talk about that. Um, the the Jerry model, the plaques, that this, that, and the other thing. Um, and he wanted to start there and then get go. Speaking of Kiss, wanted to go to bands like Kiss. Alice Cooper, Iron Maiden, be like, hey guys, let's let's put our merch together in one catalog, and it'll all be ready in like in the, this this tome uh, before the internet was like really, uh, any, you know, anybody was on there, right? Um, so that you know, he he had a, a vision, he had a dream from the from the beginning, and it was it was a big big merch was was the idea, um, and that's that's where I get it. that's why I wear Scum and Destiny shirts that aren't actually backwards, the camera's backwards. Don't don't think I messed up on my shirt. Not, not By the time. way, let's take a quick let's take a quick moment just to again. I we, I said this at the beginning of the episode, but we have a lot more people watching now. Um, Tank has his own YouTube show. If you're into Star Wars and you know Tank is doing like <laughs> podcast stuff and Star a lot of Star Wars stuff as it relates to a Star Wars uh, card game that that he mm -hmm. does. The link is down in the description below. Please take a moment and subscribe to Tank's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, Tank is going to be doing a lot more stuff on the YouTube channel. He's already been doing stuff. He's going to continue doing stuff. And mm -hmm. it's a great way to keep up with Tank and all his uh, endeavors and, and whatnot. So please subscribe. Yeah. Link is down in the description, okay? And, and sure uh, be sure and check, sure and check it out uh, because the intro was put together by um, a, a certain guy. Over well, there. it was the least, the least I could do. But Tank has given us so much of his time and just... Mm -hmm told us, entertained us for hours and hours with his stories and just mm. we love love doing this stuff. 
Well, so, you, you knocked the intro. I mean, I know I, I had the vision of, of how the intro was supposed to be, and I gave you the, the pieces and you you put it together, but man, you you nailed it. I was very, very thank happy. you. Thank you. I'm glad you I'm glad that makes me happy to uh makes me happy to hear. Um so when you're on tour for like the famous monsters tour, which it really just extends, like I'm looking at all the dates just sort of uh, uh, to pull back in a bigger picture kind of way as we move forward in the story. I mean, the famous monsters tour, you, there was the Halloween tour with Guar, by the way, I think maybe we briefly touched on Guar, yeah. Guar and the misfits together. I mean, that's like a no brainer. What was yeah. like the relationship between Guar and the misfits, Dave Brock? Oh, it, it was, it was great. We loved each other. Like everybody got along. We had so much fun together. We stopped by Slave Pit Records one night, like on tour. Like they weren't, it wasn't a tour that we were on with them, but it, like we were in Richmond, Virginia. So like, oh yeah, stop by. And they showed us like their their green screen, speaking of, that they filmed all their videos in front of. They showed us all their their I've been shows. there. Oh, I've wow. been to the slave pit. So I've you, been know, there. you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um I was there with Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Man, God rest his soul. What a what a what a yeah. character just a sweet he he opened up for me and me alone one day and gave me a personal tour through the slave pit he got dressed up as odorous to do an interview with me wow and he he had me i had to spray him down with a water bottle so he looked shiny yeah. on camera yeah. that's how they got the the sort of the slimy look yep, yep. just i remember seeing guar in like 88 89 when they were first getting started scum dogs of the universe mm. and like at small shows, small venues in Baltimore. They played at the Cedar Crest Country Club, like on the half pipe. Um, like early, early days, they had their their tour bus. They had like a funnel that you would pee in, and like there was just a hose that kind of ran out the back, and then it it froze one day so that they, they couldn't pee in it. Like, talk about some some sketchy, sketchy beginnings. Um, but it, touring with them, that was luckily that was the time that their um, their miniatures game was out. That was that was Hunter Jackson's like big big thing. He was into that, and um, being you know co merch guys, I was like, hey, uh, so we're gonna do some swapping, right? Because I want all of those miniatures, and I still have them. They're all uh, I have pictures of them. I saw I I the, even as late as 2011, they had that stuff cool. lying around. Okay, cool. That's cool. Yeah, the, the 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 world maggot, the the cardinal sin guy, like all the slaves, I, 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 all that all that great stuff. Some great shows. They would of course make a huge mess. And I think the first tour they went on before we were the headlining act, but they went on before us and had to cover everything with plastic. And then so there was a huge like breakdown and then a, an unwrapping of all the equipment and everything. So the, the changeover from Guar to Misfits was lengthy. And the next time we toured with them, you're like, well, you know what? The Misfits are going to headline, but Guar is going to play last. <laughs> Look at you. Who's you that know, young guy there? Who's you know that? who took that picture? Uh, Dave Brocky? No, Dave Brocky took that picture. Took no. it, that's in the slave pit? Mm -hmm. I just figured since, we're, since you mentioned the slave pit, we should show some pictures of it, yeah. right? Those are That's what you're talking about, right? Those are the figures. No. Oh, those no, are not. Those are, those are super deformed figures. Oh. Um, give me one second. I think it's right behind the green screen. Is that some... What, what is this porn in the background? What are yeah, we looking at here? That's just what they had. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, God. That's, oh, the, that's go. where they... That's their... That's And Dave Brock, he took me around, and he just yep. he just showed me the... I wish I took more pictures and video. I didn't. I, oh, I just course. didn't. I feel like a fool. Isn't that all, you know, hindsight? That's always the way. Okay. So, the way. All right, here, let the, me the mini stop. The miniatures. Yeah. The miniatures are, are somewhere in here. I'm, I'm sitting in my, my rec room slash uh, one, of, one of my game rooms. But this, oh, we'll see how this plays out with green screen. Here we go. Okay. Oh, cool. Hold. Sorry that it's backwards. I cannot get my camera to flip because it's upside down. But Gwar Rumble in Antarctica. Wow. So it came with, God, look at all those, those green screens. It came with some of the main Gwar characters and a whole bunch of slaves. Um, and the, these are metal miniatures. You could get extra miniatures that were special, limited edition. You could buy extra slaves. <sighs> this one <sighs> happens to be sitting out. Oh, oh cool. Oh, oh no. 
Hang on, hang on. Come on, Frick. Who knew? I, this is the last time I do green screen ever. I swear. Last time you ever do green screen. You learned okay, your well, lesson. Okay, I look like a, a freakazoid, but hopefully he looks a little better. Yeah, that's great. Come on. By the way, um, our friend Kevin, Kevin forty five. Hmm. Um, he he's been on the show, and I've been on his show. He has something called the Guar Pod for anybody who's into Guar. He basically like what we do with misfits. He does with Guar. On, okay. on his channel, on the Vonsper channel. So if anybody likes Guar, go check that out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I got I got really into Guar because of touring with him. Because once I got all their CDs and their comic mm -hmm. books and stuff, I was like, all right, you know, I've, I've been to their shows, but I never really, like, got into them. And then uh, then I really started to, to take off. Did they ever they play any songs? Like, did they ever come out when the Misfits were playing or vice versa and, like, you know, grab a mic or something? I don't think so. I don't think so, but I remember Doyle and Jimmy Gestapo talking about doing a show together, like a like a TV show for kids with puppets. That uh, one of the slaves, it wasn't Bob Gorman, it was um, Bob Gorman, who by the way did the tank logo. Which I don't know if you may be able to see this. It's on the back of the shirt. I don't know. Can, you, can we see that? Oh it, no! The sun. Oh yeah, right there. Oh, that that's such a Guar esque yes, sort of thing. That, that is Bob Gorman artwork. That that used to be how I signed my name. It was it was big block letters like that with little rivets in the corners, like it was a tank. And he took that. He drew a tank. Tankenstein. So did James Rowe. Um, yeah, so I know that, James yeah, Rowe. Yeah, he did a really cool one. Uh, tank in a tank with like the BFG JG thirteen thing. Um, and then he did, Bob did the tank logo. And I, to this day, I still use that because it's absolute perfection. He did it in black and white. I colorize it. Um, but one of the slaves was going to make the puppets for Doyle and Jimmy Gestapo's kitty puppet show. And it, it was going to be freaking hilarious. Because they were on tour with Guar and the Misfits. Yeah. All at the same yeah, those time. Those were some great shows. Those were some absolute great shows. I bet, man. I bet. That's where you need, you know, that's the type of concert, Murphy's Law, Guar, and Misfits 95. That's where you need a videographer just walking around, just following oh, yeah. the tour, like, you know, on on, on a tour bus. Just I just wish. So old. It, I don't think War was on this tour, but it was one of the tours that we did with Murphy's Law. We were playing the Eagles Ballroom in Milwaukee, which is the the last place that Big Bopper and, and Eddie Valens, uh, Richie Valens. The day played. before the music died. The day, the day before the music died. That was the last place they played. There's a huge, a, a beautiful memorial on the wall uh, for them. Um, it's also right across the street from the hotel that Jeffrey Dahmer used to do, used to kill oh, people. lovely. Yeah, it's in a bad part of town. Um, but the place is huge. It's at, We did a warp tour there, and there was like five floors of insanity going on and it was prince uh, had his own dressing room there wow uh, it was all like colored chiffon uh drapery and stuff place was nuts downstairs there was a bowling alley and a gym that was like completely destroyed so I, my my sitting right there is is a weight rack that i took from the eagles ballroom gym and cleaned it up brought home painted it and now it's got my weights on it because it was just like no it, it was it was trashed it was destroyed like Stuff hadn't been touched in decades. Anyway, we're at that show. I'm at the merch booth with Jimmy Gestapo's brother handled handled the merch. And they, they would fight every night, like full on punching each other in the face, fight. And they're like, I'm like, who's with you guys? Um, but Ken, Rocky comes over to the over to the to the merch booth with a couple boxes of pizza. Because it was dinner time. It's like, oh, here, here you go, tank. I'm like, oh, cool, thanks. I'm I'm you know selling something. I was like, you know, I'll take a look at it in a minute. And I, I wrap up the merch. And I, I go to, I'm like, man, he brought me a couple boxes. This is this is great. I'm, I'm going to eat like a king tonight. And I go and pick them up, and they're light. I open up the, the box, and there's like just crusts. <laughs> the and there's just crusts in there. And I'm like, motherfucker. I, and, and this was back in the day when, when I, oh, I, I, I had the, the, the good eater award. Like you didn't you didn't fuck with Tank's food. You got you got the you got the horns if you did that. So I jump over the counter, and I I know Ken Ken heading back to the dressing room downstairs. So I go running down the stairs, and 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 he he's going into the like the hallway where all the dressing rooms are, and I, I come up behind him. He's still he's still a good distance from a moment from me, and I, I see him. And I go you, and he turns around. And he's like oh 
like deer in the headlights totally caught he's like oh and he just like he just starts running and i start running after him and he's like he's like not sure where to go there's like dressing room after dressing room so he just like darts into one and and uh he goes in there and there's like there's no way out he's just cornered so i come flying in there and i just like tackle him into the, <laughs> into the couch but, i mean it's just looking back like he was kind of he knew he was pulling a prank on me so he's kind of like doing the shaggy walk from scooby-doo like yeah yeah i got him i got him so like and, Scooby. It, and he oh my god so yeah if we had shit like that on on film priceless man priceless that i always thought priceless. that the, the the reality show that mtv should have done would have been the theme song would have been motorheads we are the road crew bow and it would have been the behind the scenes like a, a season would be a motorhead tour the next season would be a misfits tour or the, the ramones the ramones road well, crew right but you're not watching what's happening on the stage it's all the shit backstage and on the tour bus sure. and at the bus stop and at the hotel and at the airport all the bullshit that goes down like being being in a in a hotel elevator with marky ramon and his his drum tech king tut and and i've got my brief my tour manager briefcase in my hand and tut asked me a question and i go and i deliberately go i don't know and it, it like swings my hand up with my briefcase and i go i don't know in the freaking briefcase clocks him square in the balls <laughs> and he goes down like oh and marky is oh he's howling he's holding his he's laughing so hard tears are streaming down his face classic there were so many moments like that on tour that were just like where's the camera like that, yeah. that freaking gold right there i would watch that all day long if that was a, an actual show you know seeing seeing motor seeing lemmy's get base tech his job is, is during the show to stand there with a lit cigarette in his hand so let me can come over take a drag and hand it back to me before he goes out to play the next song that's all he we were i was on his side of the stage for some uh, i think of a european festival and like this was i think only now one, one of the couple times that we we played with her head and i'm like that's your job. I mean, you're you're there at the guitar tech station, but all you're doing is holding a fucking lit cigarette. Like, okay, what am I doing wrong with my life? Damn. Anyway, where I mean, were we? Where when were you we? become, so, yeah. when you become, but when you become Lemmy, like that's what. That's the that's what you need. That's what you need. Yeah. Like yeah. you know, I mean that that really is that's like this that is the stuff of legend right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. What yeah. what a what a magical what a magical experience you you've had. I, I must say. Um, yeah. So all right, let's let's try and let's try and get a little leeway here, so we so we we can get into the year two thousand one. Maybe if we're, we're, we're getting there. My 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 list. Oh my! Look at my screen. The green is oh, gone. But the white. Is gone. Um, I need to do a little bit of house cleaning, just like I did when I said that Michael was a rancid fan, and I had to come back the next episode and correct that said he was a bad religion fan. Before yeah. He came on board. It's last episode we were talking about wrestling. And I said that uh, a friend of ours who's an, uh, went by CES, C E S, he was a, a graffiti artist. He, with a can of spray paint, did a massive Misfits Crimson Ghost Skull on this apron that went over our, our Jerry's uh, wrestling mat. His name is Monty Esposito. I, I felt so bad that I couldn't. Oh, that's what that is. That. I, I apologize, Monty. Good, good guy. Good guy. Um, he also did. If, if people were in the Fiend Club and they remember every two months you got your newsletter and there was an, another Fiend Club uh, merch item that you could purchase from each newsletter and that's what kept the tour vehicles maintained and kept them alive and kept us roadworthy. One of the things was a tap light, like one of those dome lights that you could like Velcro up somewhere and just happen to come on with battery powered. Monty with a Sharpie sat down and did a Misfit Skull on every one of those tap lights that we sold by hand did individual artwork on each one talk about a project but he was so good I, I had a picture of him sitting on our rv at the kitchen table it was just like just like working just free-handed with a sharpie like he, he he knew that skull that well and he just he nailed every one of them so hats off to you Monty. thank you brother thank you and that's oh no the kitchen table was where i got the wrecking ball nickname because <laughs> the so we had a kitchen table that there was a, a kind of a swivel seat bolted to the floor on on each side of it in the rv one faced front the other one faced back and i don't know who i was sitting with maybe marv the roadie paul 
Um, maybe we're playing some Cridge because he taught me how to play that game there. Or we're playing some Star Wars cards or something back in the day because Morgan Fargo and I were into that. But whoever the driver was, they stopped short and suddenly, and I'm my back is to the front. So I, I like, whoa, I, I go back and I totally like crank the chair over. It rips out of the floor, the whole, and Rocky's like, what the fuck? I, Doyle, Doyle starts calling me the wrecking ball and all this. I'm like, you can't put a 265 pounder in this chair and like stop short and I'm not going to rip it out of the floor. Come on. He came um, in like a wrecking ball. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Doyle would call me Ox. Johnny, Johnny, hold on one second. Me. Hold on one second, Tank. I just want to hear. I'm getting a weird sort of feedback thing from you from, from your me. microphone. Uh -oh. Hold on. Just one second. Well, no, keep talking, actually. Hey, yo. Yeah, so Doyle called me uh, Ox, as in Babe the Big Blue Ox. Uh, Johnny, Johnny Grimstone. Uh, I was known as Bluto or Brutisk because of the beard. Uh, Johnny Bravo was another nickname I had. I um, Tank, Tank, Tank yeah. I'm going to ask you. I'm actually going to ask you to do two things. One, put I'm going to. Sorry, okay. You put your glasses back on. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to boot you for a second. I want you to come back in and see if that fix fixes. I'm hearing right. a weird little, like I can't explain it. It's like a little snap from on from your microphone. I don't know what what it could be. And three, if you have it available, if you do have it available, could you uh, could you switch to cans if you have them on hand? Yeah. If not, yeah. don't I worry about it. Okay, he's got yeah. them. All right, I'm going to kick Tank out, and he's going to come right back in, and he's going to keep he talking. Does. So it's been nice. Let's kick him out of his own show. Goodbye, Tank. Tank is gone. Now he'll be right back. I, I want to thank Tank while he's not here. I, I really, I really do appreciate it. these shows. Are so great. Uh, people are always messaging me in a variety of different mediums and formats saying, Jeff, when's the next Grim Tales? We like, uh, we like Grim Tales. We want more Grim Tales. I always hear that. And um, we've been meaning to do it. We didn't mean to let a year go on where we, we've literally been a year. The last time we did this was November, 2022. And um, we're already two and a half hours in and we haven't even gotten to fucking the year 2000. We haven't even gotten to the misfits breaking up. We're going to though. We're we're not leaving here tonight until the misfits break up. Like the ninety five misfits, like that, whatever the 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 first the resurrection lineup. Like we that has to happen. So we're gonna do that. So here's Tank again. Tank, now that you're back, that's perfect. Let me hear you talk. Hey yo. Oh my god, that's okay. amazing. Okay. Cre creamy, creamy. The, the dulcet tones of the tank. The, the dulcet tones. Yeah. So now, while you're continuing your housekeeping, I lost the, I lost the whatever we were doing the contest. I have to go pee, so I'm gonna go do that. <laughs> you keep talking, and These I'll come back. Go right through you, man. I'm telling you. I, I'm, I'm on my, I'm on my first can of seltzer. I usually don't break the seal like this until yeah. I'm at least three hours deep, but okay. for some reason. So, so go ahead, tank. Keep talking. I'm gonna be right back. Okay. So. I uh, like Jeff said, we um, it's been over a year since we did episode three, so there was a lot we had to remember what we didn't do. So I I always um, I'll be listening in my car on the way to work, and I'll put together this little text list, and I'll send it to Jeff. Be like, all right, this is stuff we got to remember to get back to. So we we gave a shout out to Monty Esposito for his work. Um, we're we got to get more uh, into famous monsters because there's a lot of detail there. Um, oh. King Kong lines. Okay, when Jeff gets back, we're gonna do the King Kong lines because that's a thing. Uh, uh, Japan, we got to go with Japan a little bit more. So we did Tankenstein, we did Scream video, we did George Romero, we did Sixth Sense. We talked about the laboratory set, which you saw some pieces of. the The slab that they used to wheel me out on used to be at the shop, and I like it was just sitting in the back. And I'm like, oh, you know, should I should I grab that? Should I preserve that? It's it's so huge. It, it was literally. It's like if you go to Home Depot and they have that ladder that's on wheels that they like chain off and like they got to go up the ladder and get overstocked down. It was one of those with a, with a slab on it that uh, a sheet of plywood painted black and the top was on hinges. So it would flip down so it could fit in the, the box truck. Um, that's what it was. Where am I going to put that? That doesn't fit like, next, you know, by my nightstand. So unfortunately, that is that is gone. We talked about we talked about the rest of the laboratory set. Uh, so now we've still got to get into RC robots, arm wrestling, uh, a whole bunch of so uh, socks. That's on the list, believe it or not, socks. Um, 
So we were talking about nicknames. We had to fix the headset. Um, we're, 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 we're in the Famous Monsters era, and we still, we still have a lot to talk about with Famous Monsters. But here's a little known fact. Um, Kong at the Gates, the, the musical intro to the album that they used to open uh, the shows with. Before uh, th the album was recorded but was still being mixed and mastered and it, nothing was released yet, we were at a show in Florida somewhere. I remember it raining like um, like, like the Dickens, uh, <laughs> to, to quote a phrase. It was raining like the Dickens uh, <laughs> to uh, that day. Um, but when we were inside, it was like a bar. Um and inside, we set up Chug Chud's rig, which he used to record every show, and it had like all the sample racks and EQs and stuff, like pretty pretty good stuff. Recording to Dat, uh, which is a digital tape for those that, that don't know, um, when we actually used to use tapes. And he recorded he recorded every Misfit show. Yeah, yeah. somewhere um, somewhere in Chud's archive, there is a Dat recording of every single mm -hmm. Misfit show that he ever played. Yep. Yep. Um, so the idea was with Kong at the Gates, the Misfits wanted to use a sample of there's there's like the tribal leader um, that says some words before they open the gates and, and show King Kong. And they, they wanted to use that sample in Kong at the Gates. But like I think Turner owns um, King mm. Kong and they, they weren't letting it go. So they're like, all right, well, there's nothing stopping us from just recording it ourselves. So they were like, well, well, Tank's got a good voice. He he should say these lines and we'll record them and we'll send them to Roadrunner and they'll put it in the mix and that'll be that. We'll, we'll sidestep Turner that way. Now, I don't remember, the, and it's, I've, I haven't seen the, the original King Kong since I was a kid. I don't remember every word, but I remember being set up in this bar um, Chud has Larry the Wolf songs. That that would be true if Chud, Chud has, had, if he had if, the equipment back then. If Chud had that equipment in '96, then yes, Larry mm. the Wolf was recorded. I don't know. If, I don't know if he did have it in '96 or not because mm. we didn't really need it until we had samples like Devil, Devil. You know, somebody be back there. There was like a keyboard, like the mm -hmm. names on the keys, and different keys were different samples. Um, and one of the samples was Oh, give me a break. Um. That was my contribution thing, <laughs> um, which which leads to another uh, song that ties into Tears for Fears. Um, anyway, God, where are we going? So we're in the in this in the middle of the bar. Sound checks going on. The place didn't open yet. We got Chud's gear. I've been get, given the lines. I'm holding a flashlight because in the movie the guy holds a torch. So I'm trying. They're trying to get me into character. Dylan's like, I have him hold a flashlight. <laughs> um, Jerry's working with me on. The the uh, the pronunciation the um what's what's the word because he was taking you know vocal lessons he was like when you say Kong it's not it's not Kong there's there's a hard G at the end it's Kong Kong, G Kong. hit the G so we took we did multiple takes until we till we got it they they you know probably EQ it so there's like more depth and timber to it and I can only remember the last two lines of that and it was recorded and it was sent off but it didn't make the final cut but i will say those lines to my my little two-year-old my daughter a little lodgepodge and she gets <laughs> such a kick out of it um let me see if i can at least I, I think there's four lines in all i don't remember what the first two are maybe i'll have to watch the movie again but i remember the last two being um wasaba sayamaka U Terave Rama Kong. And that was it. Like, okay. Klatu, so, I, Brata, Nikta. Yes, Nikta, Nikta, Nickel, <laughs> Nickel. <laughs> um, pretty much, yeah. There, I, I said your words, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna take I'm gonna I'm gonna take the book now. Um so the only the only thing of, of me that actually got on the famous monsters was uh, merch guy John Grimm. Um, but Arturo was working with the band. Arturo Vega, the right. former uh, lighting guy for the the Ramones, uh, was going was on tour with us. Now he was our LD. Uh, what a absolute sweetheart! But uh, mm. an artist in his own right. He designed the Ramones uh, presidential seal, the eagle logo yeah. down below. Yes, he um, did. He did 
Uh, but it's not obviously not the cover. Basil Gogos did the cover. Um, and there there had to be some corrections, something to do with Michael's hair and then something with Chud's face. Uh, just some, you know, we'll fix it in post kind of stuff. Wasn't uh, but Doyle the- Doyle didn't want uh and Doyle didn't want smiling. It Doyle was upset maybe, that he probably. was smiling in the photo. I don't know, something like that. Something. I know that there was a wisp of Michael's hair that was in the photo that that Basil painted because it was there. And they that way they took that out later and there was something else that would change. But yeah, definitely can't be smiling on, on the famous monsters album cover. Um, but all the rest of the artwork was done by Arturo. Um, the he just in Photoshop like took their faces and like m- mishmashed the the pieces together to make the four faces that we see. Oh, that's our Arturo the did that. That's Arturo. Yeah. Oh. And then behind the disc is the 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 crimson ghost skull, like in all these different weird kind of psychedelic layers um arturo did that with just like he was getting into digital uh artistry with the photoshop so he was just playing around with this stuff and the band was like oh my god that's great so that 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 crimson ghost face behind the disc is is lovingly known as steak face uh because it looks like a steak yeah um yes so that was all uh arturo's doing there was some james rowe artwork yeah he did for yeah I think the Japanese pressings got his artwork. Was that where that ended up? It went to some international press, but yeah, the, yeah, the guy. Japanese. Okay. He also did the Mister Monster. Already did a bunch mm-hmm. of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that was yeah, that was his. I remember. So we we talked about we touched on Japan, but I just some of my uh, somebody said when I get my hair cut earlier today, I was talking about February um, two thousand was Japan. Okay, so this would have been that that Club, Qua- Club Quattro. Quattro, yep. Um, yeah, Club Quattro. Wow, man, there were so many great venues there. Mandarake, the uh, the underground store was... Oh, God, so much cool stuff in Japan. Um, but I remember going to record stores, and I was it, I think Famous Monsters came out on purple and maybe yellow vinyl. Yeah, were those the... Purple and yellow the, vinyl. Yes, I know that. You, you could just walk into record stores and be like, oh, they got six of this and six of that, and they were like cheap and i would just load up my suitcase with roadrunner japan you know stuff and and bring it back and then like the 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 tour the 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 old crim's misfits auctions was as i said before that's how i survived only being on the road only working six months out of the year because that was when we toured the other time that i'm not making money i got i got to do something so i would stockpile this kind of stuff and and uh and then auction it off uh so i came back with just a suitcase full of these these rainy day it's like stash this for a Mm -hmm. rainy day yeah, I would. So in Japan, I, I would. I would kind of. I'm. 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 I'm in, into a lot of uh, Japanese video games, a lot of Japanese cartoon, anime, uh, sure. toys, uh, sushi. Oh my god, so much Japan is great mm. going to. Um, so I I would go to Japan on our days off. I'd go shopping in uh, Shinjuku and Shibuya and, and some of those cool shopping districts. It's my and dream, I would dude. Just, to go uh, to Japan. Dude, I, I would love. I would. I, I still have a Japanese PlayStation with a whole bunch of Japanese games that you never saw in America. But Star Blazers, Devil Man, Captain Harlock, like a lot of them are in Japanese. And when it's telling me to do something, I have no idea what it's. I'm just mashing <laughs> buttons until something happens. Um, but some great, great games. But I would load up on stuff that I wanted, and I'd also buy stuff that I knew was kind of hot on the the U.S. you know eBay market. Sure. And buy, buying it in Japan retail was cheaper than buying it in the States wholesale. So I would just load up, okay, that's that's worth money, that's worth money, let me just get this other stuff. And I would come back and sell that on eBay, anime, this, that, or the other thing. And that was how I funded all the stuff that I bought for myself. Um, and I'd always I'd always have to buy an extra suitcase in right. Japan, subsidized. load it up. Subsidized, yeah, yeah, bag. subsidized. Yeah. Uh, the, remember the, the first night we landed in Japan, I'm like so psyched to go like have some real Japanese food. Where do we end up? I might have told this story before. I don't. I don't remember. I'm imagining a fast food fast food place. Close enough. Shakey's Pizza, oh. Tokyo. Shakey's Why? Why? Pizza. Why? I used to go to Shakey's like for birthday parties when I was a kid. Why? Why are you going to Shakey's Pizza in just, because I I was one of the only adventurous eaters. The other guys are like, oh, where's Burger King? I'm like, fuck, I'll, I'll eat Burger King when I go back home. I want to eat the local food now. At least Shakey's Pizza in Tokyo had a seaweed pizza at their pizza buffet and i was like all right i'll eat that because that's different than what i can get anywhere else i'm with Um, you man i am the same way i 
I, if it's, if it's something like I want the experience, I want mm -hmm. the experience. I want to try something new. Mm -hmm. Don't give me what I, what I know, what I know. Yeah. yeah. Totally get it. Yeah. And that, that can backfire too. Cause I remember going into, to uh, of course, a Burger of course King in backfire. Germany. That's the adventure. Well, no, I mean, eating what you think, you know, in another country. Oh, you can't cross the streams. They're not always the same. <laughs> we went to a, we went to a Burger King in Germany, and I bought what I thought was like maybe like a chicken sandwich. It was like some most like soupy veggie patty with a crispy uh, outer shell. I bit into it and kind of like like bleh, like stretch it like mozzarella and like drip. I'm like, oh, what the fuck is this? I remember getting stuck with uh, buttermilk to drink instead of like actual milk at like a, a German rest stop you know a truck stop kind of thing so yeah sometimes what you think is is the usual uh let me tell you like, i've eaten at a german i've also eaten at a german burger king when i was on tour with uh horror punk band and mm -hmm. i'll tell you they <laughs> you get your little fucking burger i'm like an american i'm like what is this little yeah. morsel yeah. where's my yep. burger they're like, yeah. they're like, oh yeah, the burger. This is the burger. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> like, for that's sure. not a fucking burger. That's that's such a European thing. We were, we had a, we had a higher. And they're not gun. obese, and they're not obese. Not, they're, they're like no, healthy no, they're people not. because they're right. not like us. Because they don't eat like American. we we Americans do. Yeah, we we, <laughs> we had a, a a big platter of finger sandwiches at backstage at, at one of our European gigs, and so little tiny pieces of. of bread like cutting little squares with like one slice of cheese or one slice of meat when i say slice i mean like like cut like a two by two square on a two by two piece yeah, of like bread finger sandwich yeah it fingers it but like one slice of cheese or one slice of, not together and i'm like what is this monstro like this this is a travesty here so i'm pulling all these sandwiches together putting cheese and meat and cheese and meat and like making like nice little stack to make my American sandwich, and the <laughs> um, the 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 we had a, a one of an English guy with us who was like a, a hired gun tour manager with us that time. He was like, "Oh, have, have you ever tried a, a cucumber sandwich? And they're they're really really good." I'm like, um, "I don't think so." I'm like, what's on it? He says, "Well, well, cucumber." And I'm like, "Yeah, I I, I could have gathered that part. I could phone that in from my couch, but what else is on it?" And he's like, "Well, what do you mean? It, cucumber? It, it's cucumber on on bread." I'm like. Well, they have, they have a little bit of like cheese, like a that, cream cheese. That's it. No, it's just a slice of cucumber on a little slice of bread. Get out of here with that bullshit. You're, this is a great thing. You got to try. That's the, that's a, that's garbage. Um, but yeah, that that's typical. Uh, typical Europe. But so Japan. So we yeah, right. seaweed pizza. So there is a one. We had a day off. God, first time we get to Japan, we're standing in the hotel lobby in Tokyo. And I, I feel that the floor kind of rumbling a little bit. So I mentioned like, oh, I, I guess I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that the train goes through because we know that the Tokyo train is like the, the most traveled train system in, in the world. I'm imagining there's a train going underneath the building. And they're like, oh, no, no, there's no train under there. That's a tremor. Oh, fuck. I'm, I'm, what? Did you say tremor? Yeah. So that was that was the, the whole building shaking. I'm like, oh, great. Uh, either that or it's Godzilla um, coming in. So we had a day off in Tokyo, in, in uh, Shibuya, which is like the Times Square section of Tokyo. Bright lights everywhere, big signs, everything, a lot of hustle and bustle. And Jerry and I were determined to find some sushi. And we don't want to go to like one of the, the chain places. We want to go to like a legit sushi place. We're ready to do some damage yeah. on some sushi. And we find down a side street, there's a little hole in the wall joint with the line going out the door and down the street. And we're like, oh, you know, that's, that's gotta be, if the locals are lining up, like this has gotta be the place, right? So we get in the line and uh, we, we notice, okay, they open at 12, well, that's that's why there's a line, the doors aren't open yet. So this should go pretty quick. So sure enough, the doors open and the, and brrr, the line goes right in. We're like, cool, we're gonna be eating before we know it. We get inside, we now see that the line continues on benches that encircle three sides of the, the place. Like, all right, well, we're we're already committed at this point. We're we're not gonna cut 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 our losses and, and bail. We're just gonna ride this out. And it was one of those those sushi bars in the round with the conveyor belt. All the all the preparers oh, are inside, I've, and the the conveyor. I've had belt those in out. Tel Aviv. Those that's the yeah. best. The so best. Good. Moon. I've been to Moon. Okay. They do that. Yeah. 
Yep. So we're we're sitting on the bench, and as people come and go, you slide your butt across the bench around the three sides until you're finally there's two stools ready for these two uh, Americans. So we we go and uh, sit down, and the the little plates go by, and it's like a little, little tiny plate with like two pieces of sushi on it, and you you eat, and then you stack up the plate, and you eat, and you stack, and you and <laughs> I'm I'm looking around, you know, like okay, what are the locals doing? I'm just gonna do what they're doing. And sometimes there'll be like a juice on one, so you could grab that and have a little drink. Um, and we're stacking up plates, we're stacking up plates. And I know what most of the sushi is, because it's, you know, it's sushi. And there's one, you know, I love sushi. Me too. But there's one sushi that I didn't like. At least I didn't used to. And that was sea urchin. The, oh, why the, not? Oh, uh, Because it was, the when I had it, it was very bitter. And the consistency was interesting. It was kind of like the a, like texture a, is is it's it, it's like brain. It like kind of yeah. melts in your mouth a little bit. For those who have Wait, eaten oh, brain, by the I, way, I actually have eaten brains as well. Okay. So it's yeah. Good. So brains yeah. just listen for anybody out there. What do brains taste like? It's like putting fat in your mouth. It's yeah. literally fat. That's what yeah. it is. It's yep. they're good. It's good. I had mm. I had calf brain as an appetizer in Istanbul at like a kind of like a tapas place, really. Um, I've had, were you, I've were had you... calf sprains as well in two different yeah. places, and okay. uh, interest. I didn't know either time, but I was like, "Oh, this is fat." Oh, this is so like, no, yeah. that's brains. No, that's brains. Like, yeah. oh, okay, cool. Yep. Brains. We had that right after <laughs> having our fish eyeballs. It was great. Brains. Um, Sorry, go yeah, ahead. Brain. Yeah. So, I, I didn't like the sea urchin because it, it it didn't taste right. The, the consistency. Okay, I'll, I'll get around that, but the, the, it was just very bitter and it was just kind of gross. They had sea urchin at this place. And I'm like, well, you know, when in Rome, got to do it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I tried it, and I was like, oh, hey, can I get more of that? That was really good. So apparently, it's all like how fresh it is, how it's prepared, what, whatever, whatever they were doing at that joint, they nailed it, they got it right. Sure. So this this was like some of the best sushi I have ever had, and we're we're like stacking up our plates and stacking up our plates and stacking up our plates, and I see people like waving over when they're done, and the 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 waitress or server for lack of a better term she comes over with a chopstick and she like measures like you know you got three quarters of a chopstick and she writes a little note and then you take the note to the cashier and, and you pay on your way out but i'm looking around and like there's no price tags there's no mention of you I'm, know this many yen i'm like yeah okay i you know we're eating a lot i mean jerry and i can do some damage on sushi we we have stacks that are just like putting the locals to shame and i'm like well I, i've got I've got merch cash on me. I've got a, I've got the, what wasn't a company credit card. It was my personal credit card, but the company paid me back for, you know, banned expenses on it. That's how I got all my frequent flyer miles. So we should be good, right? I think, I hope, because this is really good sushi. It's got to be expensive. So we, I wave her over. She comes over. She, she measures Jerry's stack. It's, it's two chopsticks, two chopsticks high. <laughs> Each one of those had two pieces of really, really good sushi on it. She measures mine. It's two and a half chopsticks so we have four and a half chopsticks uh, stack of plates that were, were stucci that we just like did some serious damage on fucking america she, she writes a little thing in kanji hands it to me and i'm like okay here we go i you know we go to the front door and da -da -da -da, she she rings it up and translating yen to dollars jerry and i just feasted on some of the best sushi we've ever had and probably ever will have for thirty dollars, get the fuck! I knew, I knew, I knew it was gonna be comedically low because you were the way you buried the the way you buried yeah the buried lead. the lead. Yep. No, no, no! You told the story really well, but because you kept saying this is gonna be really expensive, I just had a, 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 an intuition that it was gonna be the opposite, <laughs> which is great. Story. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, thirty that's, that's awesome man dollars. So that became like every time we stayed. You know, in that that made the hustle and bustle part of Tokyo. Yeah, that was our destination on on the day off. Like that was where we we eventually came back, brought the whole band, uh, you know, Marky and Sushi, and and we were all there. And uh, yeah, wow, and it's just a little tiny hole in the wall, and it was oh, wow. It was I mean, you can't, yeah. you can't. Th that's the best when you when you find yeah. stuff like that. That really, truly yep. is the best. So now, when you come back from Japan, well, we didn't even talk about the re the rooster testicle stew that. Uh, that no, I ate to this day. Uh, this day, tell me. Uh, so <laughs> Rocky, Rocky swears that's why I got sick in Japan because 
I ate the rooster testicles. I'm like, you don't get the flu from eating rooster testicles. I get, think get over that yourself. I think that's supposed to make you strong like a bull. Oh, it's supposed to make you very virile, vigorous, and potent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I happened to get the flu on the same tour, and I, I, I was feeling pretty sick there. So, it I, this is kind of a thing I've seen in Europe, but a lot in Japan. In a hotel, the bathroom will be like a plastic one piece shell that they just kind of like put in the room and then like and then build the walls around it so when you walk in like if your tub overflows or there's a backup or something it's encapsulated inside this shell it doesn't leave the bathroom kind of a cool idea but the, it's made for most asian people so when i wanted to take a nice hot tub oh, no. a nice yeah. hot you know bath um i didn't really fit in the tub lengthwise but at least they made up for it on depth so it was kind of like I got the water up to my chin, but I was curled up like this in a, in a in the beetle position because it was like sitting in a barrel. Um, okay, mm. interesting. Um, the the mirror was heated, so after you take a steamy shower, you could still shave. That section of the mirror would be clear, right. at least for Asian people of slightly smaller stature. For me, if I wanted to shave my chest after my shower, I had a great view of my chest. I had to kind of look down to see my face um the toilets were all electronic so like whatever sort of you know bidet sort of water service you wanted afterwards you just beep bop boop you press the button your toilet seat was heated they have a lot i feel like they just have mm. a lot of really cool technology they in do. japan in general they, they just have like yeah. a lot of good sensibilities there so yeah but they they do still like you go on the bullet train and you've got when you go to the bathrooms it says eastern and it says Western, and you can take your pick. Like, all right, so you open up the Western, like, yeah, it's a toilet. And you open up the Eastern, and it's the Eastern European uh, Italian hole in the floor. And you just hold on to the handle and, and you know, squat. Like, oh, okay. A little more sanitary, but I'll, ha I'll have a seat. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, they still... They, they, <laughs> I mean that's the way it is in China so too. Cool. They they don't that they, they mm -hmm. have a complete and you know it's funny. Um, it's like the way you sit as well. Like you use different muscles mm -hmm. in your like legs and butt, and yep. it allows you to to sort of perch in a certain way that most yep. Western cultures don't. And yep. it's just a different way of life. It's just a different way it, they live. And in this, I'm gonna warn people right now. This might be uh, a, a little TMI, what I'm about to, to talk about, but this is just my own personal experiences having traveled literally all over the world. Again, going back to every time we got to some new country, I said, I want to try your traditional food and I want to sample your traditional liquor. And if I like it, I'll take a bottle back with me to share with my friends and family. That was my MO. So okay. I ate foods that my body wasn't necessarily used to. Yeah. So my stomach would be like, what did you just do to me? Um, yeah. So here's the thing. When you're in another country and all of a sudden your stomach's going, you're like, oh, you're like, okay, what, uh, I got to go now. And you go to the bathroom, go into the bathroom rather, and they don't have Western toilets. It's just a hole in the floor. And you're yeah. about to do some serious business. There's something about, and this is the, please forgive me. I'm just, you know, it's fact of life. When you sit on a Western toilet, <laughs> you have support. You feel well, like you, you have, have support. you have support, but your cheeks get spread open a little bit just by the way. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I, so I when, see what you're saying. Sure. When when there's a, a a little bit of a mess about to happen or happen, whatever. Yeah, it, it's the the cleanup is reduced. Yeah. yeah. Without that spreadage from sitting in a hole. It's like a shotgun blast. Dude, there ain't enough toilet paper in some countries that we went to to remedy what had to happen. Okay. Oh, and, and there's a spigot here I can use with my left hand and just just and rinse it off. I, I'm I'm not I can't back that play. I'm sorry. Um not not going there. So yeah, um Traveling. I gotta tell you, I'll be honest, like I'm I'm weird about I'm weird about public toilets to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would be probably my biggest challenge going to, yeah. um, you know, an Eastern country where, where they, where they, that's how they live. And yeah. I think that would be one of the most challenging 
aspects as someone as 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 a westerner who mm -hmm. enjoys the throne room to do yeah. his paperwork like that's the that i, I mm -hmm. that's that would be a hard that would be a hard cultural acclamation yeah. for me yeah. personally i i've been to istanbul a lot because my sister used to live there and my brother-in-law was from there um and all the toilets except for the ones in their house but any like public toilet anywhere you hole went in the was, wall, hole in the floor hole in the floor um, um yeah i can't i can't do it and and with the, with the spigot so you you brought something yeah. with you if you really wanted to wipe without your fingertips um yeah i just mm, man that was it just goes wild. to show you how people live so differently than mm -hmm. what you think something that you mm -hmm. think because to them like that if that's how you grow up you're like yeah what else would i that's, do what else would i do right exactly like, what exactly. like like you know I, I like oh what you use toilet paper that's just so wasteful why would you even so, do yeah. that it's, yep and I get that it's it's more sanitary. <laughs> it's not, but <laughs> that's right. I, I get that it's more sanitary if you're not sitting on a seat that everybody else in town sat on and did their business. Like, oh, I understand that, but that that's why you build a nest. You get out all these rolls of toilet paper and you, sure. you cover the seat and you throw a bunch of it in the in the in the, the bowl itself, so there's no splashback. Like, there's oh, there's I never thought to do that. Actually, that is oh, a really yeah. good idea. Yeah, you gotta you, create in other parts of the world. A, you a that. splash, yeah, a splash, splash barrier splash barrier yep. in order to, to do that because i the, just the worst thing yeah. with with that is when the 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 automatic like the seeing eye toilets came out and and you have that little uh the seat yeah covered dispenser yeah yeah and, and it, it automatically you, goes around you 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 put it on there and the thing registers that there's movement and flushes it down you're like son of a bitch I just, you put another one on and, whoosh, and i'm like can you stop oh, flushing my bad. toilet I, cover down Come well, on. the toilet cut there's some of them. The toilet covers are automatically dispensed out out of the seats. Oh, I it's have not something. I have not seen that. Yeah, and then if you take a dump on the <laughs> on the seat and you get up, the, the thing goes around. And it creates it creates oh a brown ring. <laughs> it goes like you know what I'm saying. Are you picking up what I'm putting oh, down right God. now? Oh God! Sadly, I am. I totally understand what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, there's, That's there's, rough. there's like, a, I feel like I saw that on. There's a somebody like recreated it on TikTok or whatnot. That has oh, not no. been my personal experience. But huh. <laughs> that's a thing. That's like a thing. That's a thing out there. Jesus. In Christ. any case, right? In so you, case, so yeah. You got sick. You got sick. Yeah, I, I got, I got the flu. Um, it was the one time in my life I ever actually like got a massage in my hotel room and yes it was an on the level massage there was no happy ending or anything but the the, the lady up up actually massage it was up and up it was a high-end hotel there was nothing seedy going on here um and in Japan you can go to places like you want to go to a, a sex a club you know what right. you pick your room pick your like yeah if you want that's to totally tug, fine you, it's totally tug, you can get a tug yeah. yeah yeah easy you know um but that happened there and not over here it was it, it was their culture is just so freaking cool um she was punching the bottom of my feet and at first i'm like what the fuck you do oh 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 my god that wow that Sad. feels good holy crap if you're ever not feeling good get your get your feet punched let me tell you um uh so, so Corey, Corey fair of souls of blaze he was with us on one of those tours and he wanted to go to one of those um specialty sort of sex buildings and usually you you have to be a citizen to be able to walk and be like okay right you know just whatever room you want pick a room if you're not like if you have a u.s passport or some like they're like oh no 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 so there's there's certain places like you have to know somebody who's like i know i know where to take you so he he was going to go to one of those one day and then uh must have eaten something that uh gave him a an, like an allergic reaction because the morning he was supposed to go to this place yeah he went to the hospital instead because one part of his body swelled up to like oh shit much bigger than it's supposed to be and it was the part of his body that might have impressed <laughs> some of the girls at the place he was going to but for medical reasons it probably wasn't good to not to let it go yeah like who who knew who we to this day we never figured out what he ate but it was definitely like uh, a swelling allergic reaction like i'm going to the hospital to get this drained or something i don't know a poor guy um but just, now did God, you just, meet Bo did you meet balzac on this tour we played with them that's uh, that's how yeah. we met them yeah they opened that's for us met him. yeah oh and you'll like this my mad max uh replica sawed off shotgun i i got there 
they were on eBay for like four hundred dollars at the time, and I got it for like that less than a hundred bucks right there. And the before store. I, before I, uh, you know, I think I, I when I tried on your Mad Max gear all those years ago mm -hmm. at your house, mm -hmm. and you took that picture of me. Yep. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I had seen photos. I had seen photos of that Mad Max gun. Mm -hmm. I had seen photos of it, the 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 shotgun from Japan, and you actually had one. And I was yep. shocked. I was shocked that you actually had the replica because mm -hmm. they had I had seen pictures of it online. Mm -hmm. By the way, if anybody likes Mad Max, I'm currently reading the novelization right now yep. on the channel. <laughs> That's so cool. I've been doing it. I've been doing it. We're on the final two chapters. Lots of really cool bits, and yeah, especially lots of backstory. Dude, the the Transcon one that absolutely mm -hmm. could have been yeah. uh, the HBO Breaker Squad show that you and I have have dreamed yep. of for forever and ever. Mm -hmm. The Armalite gangs, yeah, the Armalite that, gangs, that's so cool. But but yep. I digress. So so yeah. Japan, Japan, Japan goes south without a hitch, right? Yeah, and li literally without a hitch because they're uh, they're when when we would travel, we would travel with with one guitar one bass, one bass amp, because they were vintage acoustic acoustic brand amps that when we rented Backline anywhere else, you couldn't get that amp, you couldn't get that trademark sound that Jerry was looking for. We'd rent cymbals. We, we, there were certain things that we brought, and then the rest was just rented gear for anything overseas. Um, so when we traveled with a bass head, it would go in a footlocker that was filled with foam and then padlocked oh, wow. shut. This was pre-TSA uh, days. So we didn't have TSA locks. So we get to Narita Airport, and I see the, Narita. That's the Tokyo Airport. We we land there. The 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 base head case comes down, and the padlock is cut off. Obviously, somebody some from security wanted to check it out. I've 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 been pulled aside and had to like plug it in and show prove that it worked and you know show that it wasn't a, a bomb or anything like that. I'm like, okay, great. So before we fly back, I need to find a, a padlock. Shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, that that's <laughs> oh my god. Yep, that's the gun. This that's is when gun. this is like the first time I ever met Tank. This was yep. uh this man, this has got to be 13 years ago or something. That was a long This is me time ago, at yeah. Tank's house More, yeah. trying on his gear, his Mad Max gear. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry, keep keep talking. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Photo. Um so on my day off, I'm walking yeah. through again uh Shibuya, the the the, the shopping, the the, the 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 bustling business section of of Tokyo. Sorry, um, there was one more. One more. There's there you the, go. That's the thing. That's it's it. All about that's the gun. The, but that's the gun, right? That's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the collector's gun. Yeah, that's yeah, what you, you were yeah. talking about. All right, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Continue. No, no worries. No, I'll talk Mad Max anytime. <laughs> I know um, you will. <laughs> uh, so I'm walking around, uh, and I'm going from shop to shop to shop to buy a padlock. And right. nobody's got padlocks for sale. I'm like, what the hell? And it dawns on me as I'm walking through the streets, very busy streets. Um, side of a lot of uh, people use uh, bicycles for transportation a lot. They're just kind of like in, in parts of Europe. So there's bicycles lined up along the sidewalk, just parked as people went to their jobs or their shopping or whatever they're doing. Not a single bike is locked up. There's no wow. chains. There's no padlocks because in Japan you you don't steal. You you bring dishonor to your to your family name if you're caught stealing. Um, just a different fucking culture, man. Just different cult. Like, think about yeah. the, what you just said. How crazy that is. Mm -hmm. That's Club a crazy Quattro. Notion. Club Quattro. They had. They didn't have a coat check. They just had a room with open cubicles along the walls, not lockers. Mm. Open cubicles that you get there. You put your backpack, your purse. You take your coat off. You you just stuff it in this open box. No door to it or nothing. You just shove it in there. And Crazy. you go and you watch the show. You buy some merch. You tuck it in there. You go watch the show. At the end of the night, you come back. You go to the, to your box. You take out your stuff, and you go. Oh my god! So Club Quattro was you had to walk through a mall to get into the club, and of course the show is starting pretty late, so the mall is closed. And like all the carts and all the vendors that like aren't actually in stores, they just throw a sheet over their their stuff that they're selling. They don't they don't lock it up. They just throw a sheet on it. Nobody fucks with it. I swear I could have put all the shirts up on the wall with, with a number on them and a price on each one and had stacks of the shirts on the table with a big jar for money. And I could have counted my stuff in at the beginning of the night 
and come back at the end of the night, counted it all out and counted the money, I would have been to the yen. No problem. No problem at all. Interesting thing I had to learn in Japan, though, just like in Europe, um, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, Inglorious Bastards or one of those movies, we, we learned this. This is one, two. Oh, yeah. Three. Like that's okay. a great scene in Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. Yeah. The and American way versus the German way of counting. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah. That's, that's the thing. But in Japan, people are coming up to me and going, and I'm like, what? Is that sign language? Like, what does that mean? Because there really wasn't a language barrier. Almost everybody in Japan speaks English. But if it was loud or, or whatever reason, or they're just being polite, because we'll get into that in, in a second. I had numbers on all the different styles of shirts. And man, okay, selling merch in Japan, nothing like selling merch anywhere in America. Because they the really, world. they're patron, they're patrons of... They they are they are a consumer culture that respects mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. cherishes patronage, yeah. right? Yeah. If I if I did a three thousand dollar night of merch in America, just you know, let's just say that would have been a ten thousand dollar night in Japan. We would go not through dozens of shirts. We would go through cases of shirts. Japan is the only place that we sold the two hundred and fifty dollar leather jacket at the show. And people bought them anywhere else. Like you're not selling a two hundred fifty dollar jacket, not at a, at a misfit show back then. Maybe the way shows are today, but wow. So they were coming up. I put numbers on the different styles, so they could order by number. And they were coming up and doing, you know, they, they were doing the one, two, three, four, five thing. This is six. Oh, six. Seven. Yeah, right. Duh. Eight. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Not not this. It's in the palm of the other. That is how the Japanese do those numbers. Oh, okay. That's that's good to know. Um, uh, I, I just mentioned you were just that saying we're gonna... that the you were you, know, oh, you were just saying polite. about politeness. Yeah, so polite. So when you purchase something in Japan and you and you pull out your cash, you pull out your credit card, it would be considered completely rude for that person to reach out and take the card or the cash from you. No, 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 no. You don't do that. The, behind the register, or at the register, they they have like a little tray. And they kind of put it out to you and kind of like kind of nod their head down, like not looking. Yeah. You put your card or your cash in your tray and then they, they politely take it back and then they'll take it out of the tray. And when they're done with it, they hand, like everybody is just so polite, so kind like you. It, it's just not in their character to not be. Oh, my God, it is freaking amazing. You feel so safe and in there. America and in America, it, the, the, the flip side of that is if you throw your money or your card on a table, that would be the equivalent of mm -hmm. handing something to someone in Japan. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. we consider it rude and disrespectful. You don't throw your card at a, right. at a clerk. And then yeah. I guess that's like the next level in Japan is yeah. you don't hand it. You have to use a tray. That's yeah. crazy, That's, dude. It's wild, and it's so cool. I mean, what a trip, man. Yeah, yeah. We we saw on two different trips. We saw two Godzilla movies there in in Japanese. Of course, we saw Godzilla. Godzilla minus one was fucking amazing. By the way, I, I have I have not seen oh, it yet. I need to. Love, oh my movie god, movie of the year, along with Poor Things, movie of the year. Nice, nice. Straight up, straight uh, up. Godzilla, Sorry, yeah. Godzilla two thousand with Orga and Godzilla giant monsters all out attack. Which spawned the new Misfits intro, by the way, um, and we saw we saw Giant Monsters All Out Attack with Shigeo, who is a big Baragon fan. And in the very beginning of that movie, Baragon shows up, and Godzilla (spoiler alert) absolutely stomps him, like he's stomping on his head and just totally crushing Baragon. And Shigeo is like practically in tears. Next to the, oh my god, Baragon! Like, oh dude, you gotta you gotta relax with that stuff. So, cool. So talk about trust and honor and and honesty. When I had the flu, I didn't go to a doctor. I went to the pharmacist in the in the drugstore, and I told them what ailed me, and they just handed me a prescription drug right there over the counter. Like talk about cutting out the middleman. You don't you don't need to go see the doctor. No... Then get the prescription, and then go. No, you go straight to the pharmacist. You tell them what you got, and they give you the the medication. Right. Is there. that the ultimate form of socialized medicine? Like <laughs> working, <laughs> yes. like working, like working, mm -hmm. not like. You know, yeah. in Canada, they have problems with their socialized medicine. You can't see; it's hard to see doctors and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So here they extort you for a million billion dollars over there. It's free, but yeah. you can't see anybody. But in Japan, mm -hmm. you don't even have to go to the doctor. You just go to the pharmacist and they hook you up. Like that they, sounds they good to need. me, man. Yeah. And it sounds like I'd get along expensive. in Japan. Oh yeah. 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 Great stuff. So I'm sure there's more stories there, but we've, we've been talking about, uh, no, it's, oh, it's re actually really cool to hear all that stuff. And how did like, the rest of the band in general, they, I mean, I guess everybody kind of, it sounds like Jerry really kind of embraced, you know, Japan going, going to get sushi with you and whatnot. And oh, yeah. going to Godzilla yeah. movies. Everybody had a good time. Yep. Um, it, now when you're in Japan, if you, if you have a bowl yeah. of rice, do yeah. not stick your chopsticks in the rice crossed in an X. That means somebody died or something like that. Or, or that you didn't like, or that the food was no there's good. Something, right? Yeah. There's some, there's some reason you don't. And I, I was just like, wow, we, we just ate a huge feast, and and I, I don't know what possessed me to just stick my chopsticks in the rice like that, and somebody was like, oh, no, 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 don't do that. I'm like, oh, sorry. I don't mean to be mm. just... And, we're, of course, we're, we're we're sitting on pillows, so my I'm, I go to get up, and my, my knees are like, oh, fuck you. Like, the, okay. Again, you're, you they use different muscle groups over there than we do, yeah. and they just, yeah. they can do that. They can kneel for hours, and it's just, mm -hmm. they just, they, and, and, you know, it's good for your body to do that shit. It's like yeah. good to sit cross-legged a certain way like they just they mm -hmm. got it they got a lot of shit down that we just do not have in in uh, when i was taking uh, karate i did the shuren ru uh, okinawa and karate we had uh one class a week that was like a traditional class where you came in and it was it was more about the respect and the culture and the history than it was about sparring and stuff so we we, we did all the the proper saison sitting where you actually sit like with your feet under your your knees out in front and your feet under your butt and like your legs fall asleep sitting that way but yeah when when you sit down oh god i forget i think your left knee goes down first and then your right knee and then when you get up your right knee comes up for like the they like really like the japanese culture like really drills in little things like that like you need to do that just right and your your your, your palms go flat on the, on the the tops of your thighs just above mm. your knees and, and you sit like that at attention for however long the class is going on and like so then you go to get up and, and do some some katas or something and like i can't my, my feet are asleep i like my legs don't work um so yeah definitely if you're not used to it uh that, that ain't gonna happen man so but cool all the same so you get back from japan and a week later you're supposed to start the you're supposed to start uh, doing some more shows. That all gets canceled. That, and we talked about that. That coincided with that thing. We began the show this way with Chud's announcement and the, mm -hmm. you know, the, something happened with the band. And my only question is about that, honestly. And it's not a question for you because you've already said you, you're not sure. It's more rhetorical. But when mm -hmm. I look at the actual hard dates, uh, February 12th, was uh a date in uh worcester uh massachusetts at the palladium and that was your that was a gig that was a gig immediately back so february 5th was the club quatra in osaka japan mm -hmm. then literally on the 6th you are oh no i'm sorry i i, I misread that uh the final japan date is february 6th in uh Fuku Fuka, uh, Fukuoka, uh, fu Fukioka. We called it "fuck you, okay." Yeah, "fuck you, okay." Fu Fukioka, Japan. Fukioka, Fuki Fukioka, Japan. Japan. And then <laughs> six days later, there's a show in Boston, and uh, not Boston, in Worcester, in in, in Massachusetts. W and Wooster. then, Wooster. Yeah, yeah, at the Palladium. Right. Yeah, and then five days later, there's supposed to be a show at the Roseland Ballroom. None of that stuff happens. So from that time in japan literally less than two weeks from that final time in japan something happens within the band that causes sh not shows to not only be canceled but for announcements to be made that the band is over and then the next time any show is played it's on july 1st 2000 so at the dragon convention and that's resuming the famous monster tour so there's a five month break after those japan shows and then from that summer it's just shows 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 until mm -hmm. until the, the 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 final 
the the final straw that broke the camel's back. Mm-hmm. Are, are we ready to run this gauntlet? This is um, I'm trying to remember that hiatus and what I knew about it, if anything, at that time, and what I would have I mean, been doing to you know earn a living. Granted, right. my overhead was limited, so I, I I wasn't panicking like today. I'd, I'd be I'd, I'm out of my freaking mind. Um, well, hmm. you said off the top of your head, it 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 must have been rather unremarkable because you don't remember hearing about it, yeah. but yet. It from from the data from the data here, it just seems like there's there's a, there's a, a a huge trip to Japan, and then immediately after that, not only are are the next four shows canceled, but there's a giant five month break of touring when you're in the middle of supporting the famous Monsters album, right? So that's what I mean. That's why it seems like something like there must have been something, whatever it was, we can just chalk it up. If you want to, we could just chalk it up to clearly there's a strain and there's, there's starting, yeah. there's some sort of fraying that's happening. And that yeah. brings us into the summer of 2000. So what's happening in the summer of 2000. Okay. Uh, I, to, to think of that, I kind of have to work backwards. What is the actual date of the Orlando House of Blues show? Oh, shit. Where it all fell apart. <laughs> That's October 25th, 2000. That's 2000. Okay. So. Well, okay. How okay, about this? So, okay, go ahead. What were you going to say? So this tour would have been, by now we, ha- we have the crew bus. So we're now the Turbo Die Winnebago, the box truck, and then a white school bus with blacked out windows that Ken and I spent just months like in between tours gutting. And then we built a huge, uh, we, we built a wall dividing like the front third and the back two thirds because we, we had upped our, literally upped our stage show. So we had more props now with the, with the mad scientist laboratory. We had more back line. We had more merch. Um, so we needed an extra vehicle and we had more crew that we couldn't all fit in the RV. So now we had what I lovingly referred to as tanks chariot, because at that point I was officially the assistant tour manager. So in Ken's stead, I was the guy in charge of the crew. Um, when did that so jump I, I, happen? Cause you, cause last time you, you la- the last thing you said, you were the guitar tech. So when did you become, yeah. I, so I, I was, I had kind of always sort of been unofficially the assistant tour manager for the fact that I had, I, I was a cash cow uh, because I had merch cash on me. If a band member needed an advance or something, I just have to fill out a receipt, get them to sign it to say, Hey, Doyle got a hundred dollars to send home for diapers today. You know, here's, here's the ticket. Um, I, I could give drivers uh, money as they needed. If Ken wasn't around to, to fuel up or whatever, uh, just as long as everything was accounted for, which I was good at doing, um, everything was copacetic but i think once the i think once the the crew bus was built and the crew bus oftentimes would show up the crew bus and the box truck truck would oftentimes show up at the venue first before the rv showed up which had the band uh the, the driver obviously the rv the band rocky and dylan the sound man those that's who stayed on there so somebody had to be in charge once feet got on the ground i think that's when officially Tank is gotcha. the assistant tour manager. Kid Ken's second in command. Makes sense. Um, Makes sense. And there were times that, like the on a, like we do we do these Halloween tours and we'd be out on the road for Thanksgiving, and the band would fly home and and the rest of us were like left at a truck stop somewhere for uh, for Thanksgiving dinner. Somebody had to be in charge of these guys, and that that was that was me. Um, so Ken and I spent months. Um, uh, the the back half was just like I said, it was just open uh, for 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 uh, gear, uh, but the front half. We built uh, six bunks, three that went across the, the, the dividing wall, and then three that went down the side. Then there was a bench along the side and a shelf, and there was a little TV with a PlayStation 2. And I, I developed this table that could like fold. It, 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 could, uh, it would fold up into the wall, or you could like open it up and the leg would swing out. It was a little table I could do all my, my merch numbers on at the end of the night, count the money and everything. We, we carpeted everything, put air conditioning in it with a generator. Um, and it, was, it had no bathroom. That's when the Gatorade bottles became 
the norm. Yeah, but you don't and, want you don't want a bathroom on a on a on a on a vessel like that. You don't want a bathroom. only for number one. Can you only have, for number uh, one? But like I on, mean, a, on the on the RV, you know, you had to do number one. If you had to do number two, you had to plastic bag it unless the driver could find a spot for you to pull over in time and do it. And uh, I think Chud was the only one that ever had to plastic bag it just due to like an emergency. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was that was Tank's chariot was was the crew bus, and it, it was kind of my baby because Ken and I, I, I designed it as I had a clipboard that had all my drawings on there, and from the years I spent in high school doing uh, technical drawing drafting, it, it was second nature to me, like measuring stuff out and drawing it all up, and then like making it happen. And I remember Glenn Hetrick coming over to the shop where we were working. And he, he saw my my clipboard and he called it John Grimm's Genius Pad. <laughs> like that's that's a good name for it, because just like just like this, imagine imagine the three dimensional landscape of sure. a school a school bus dashboard, and how the curvatures and the, the angles and, the, and all that stuff coming together. I templated the entire dashboard, and in one piece of of like gray low loop uh, indoor outdoor carpeting, cut out this piece with this template, and then with contact cement glued it to the dashboard where the entire dashboard was just now carpeted so it, it cut down on heat it cut down, and it was it was just one piece and it fit like perfectly um uh so that that was that was just that was what i did so this was now the uh the chair so we we must have done the fans warped tour that summer because we had the three vehicles and ken was a tour manager and bass tech i was assistant tour manager and guitar tech and merch as well overseeing merch and because warp tour was like quick on quick off quick on quick off our back line now we built these giant skates that the the speaker cabinets were like strapped down to and off of off of the the box truck or off of the um the, the crew bus the skate with like three cabinets and amps already on top all strapped down would just come down the ramp and right up onto the stage, and we just plug in. Oh my god, that was great! Um, but that was all outdoors. That was summertime. It was freaking hot. Um, the Vandals had a bet that you could not drink a gallon of milk, finish a gallon of milk in less than an hour without vomiting. I've done it, and I mean, I know I, I haven't. Just, I haven't completed it. I've attempted that challenge, and I failed miserably. Okay, I should have attempted the challenge because but i did I, I was probably just too busy to to take anybody up on that offer because after that tour which might have been well marky was around so it was after the the breakup we were at some venue where there was a box of the 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 chew the soft entenmann's chocolate chip cookies that are kind of kind of smaller mm -hmm. and a gallon of, of whole milk right there next to it and i sat in that dressing room and i just like one cookie after another and a, a swig of milk and in less than an hour, <laughs> all of it went down and none Jesus of it came Christ. back up. I'm like, why didn't I do that bet? That was like, I don't know what they were offering. Like what kind of money? Dude, or just you drank a whole gallon. Hold on. You drank a whole gallon of whole milk and you ate a box of cookies. It's the, it's the cookies that make the whole milk plausible. Yeah. I, I guess I like, I'm like shocked that you were able to do that. Like that's shocking. You got to remember I was like 265 pounds at the time and, and eating I mean, 7,000 calories a day when my, when I was powerlifting. So, but we're not talking about 2% milk. We're talking about whole milk. Mm. Yeah. That's Which a whole even easier meal. That's a whole meal. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Why not? That curdles yeah. cheese right in your stomach, man. Yep. That's insane. That's what they, that's what they were like. It expanded or something once it once it curdled. Like that's what they were saying. Nobody could do it. But there's a tank. video of me on YouTube that's unlisted of me doing hmm. the gallon challenge. Maybe I'll post it okay. on my on my okay. community the community tab of us doing hmm. the gallon challenge, and we okay. just could, none of us could do it. None of us were able to complete the it. As a kid, I drank a whole gallon of orange juice just because I was bored. I did it with a shot class and just kept doing shot after shot until the whole gallon was gone. Uh, the most I've ever chugged, just like, gluck, 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 like nonstop, was a two-liter bottle of ginger ale, and it was warm. I'd been out skateboarding all day, <laughs> and I can't, I was so thirsty. And of course, you know, like, like oh, 
yeah, like you should be drinking water, dude. Ginger I, ale is a bad choice. <laughs> and I just, I, cr it was in the garage. It was just warm in the garage. I cracked it open and I chugged oh, the whole God. thing without stopping and talk about the the burp because ginger ale is very, very bubbly. Oh my yeah. God. Um, for sure. For I, sure. I, I ate a sandwich once. I remember my, my buddy Tim and I were going to pick up a car part for somebody from Mad Max cars. And we stopped at some little diner and they had this challenge where you could eat this mega sandwich that had like tater tots and shit on it. And if you ate it in less than 10 minutes, you got a prize or you got it for free, whatever. I was like, oh, I'll just eat the sandwich. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to take the challenge though. And by the time I was done eating, Tim was like, you should have taken the challenge. I, I think you got it. I'm like, oh, shit. The only one of those I actually did though was on tour in California. It was, it was later though. It was with Marky. It was during the Osaka pop star days because Capiero was with us. I ate a 10 pound burrito. Oh my god, the huge. Osaka pop Covered star. The place. The I can't wait to hear all of that. I literally yeah. cannot wait to hear about that time. I can't yeah. wait to hear about it. Any that. case, so mm. we're trying to count back though. Yeah. So you become the tour. Back. Okay, hold on. You become assistant tour manager just to reestablish. Yeah. You've you're yeah. in charge of this new crew bus. This is over the summer of 2000. You're now you're, you're now mm. juggling more responsibility. Our merch um, was Misfits 2000. Well, yeah, Misfits but, 2000 merch. Um, you're doing shows now. I noticed that there's some dates. You go down. You go down to South America in July. Mm -hmm. That might have been and, when Terror on Stage happened. Okay, well, Brazil. Two Brazil dates were canceled. Uh, after a show in in Santiago, Chile. And this is Michael Graves' first time in South America because he didn't go the first time. That was so. That was terror on stage, and yeah, that was we talked about that before. That's where Getting like that on and, and Doyle's like ready to crank some guy. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of the Crowd and yeah, that's. Uh, yeah. So that's so, and that results in two shows being canceled because of the fallout from that, or the only shows I remember being canceled on a South American tour was like chihuahua mexico when there was something that went down at one of our mexican shows and jerry was like fuck this shit uh just tell him uh, somebody's sick and we we gotta go and and there was like a lot of like resistance like no no you gotta do the show i'm like no we, we can, we're not doing the show we're, we're pulling the plug um south uh why could you wait because it was you said because it was sketchy there was just some sketchiness about there was it? some yeah there's some sketchiness that went down and i think one of the oh maybe it was after the mexico city riot that Jerry was like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't yeah, want to do any more shows. I, that that might have been it. I don't know. That makes sense. But Brazilian shows canceled. That's well. I'm not, listen, listen. Look, you're the fucking guy. If you say if you don't remember it, I, I'm not, I'm not going to chat. The only thing that I truly challenge what it, your memory was the scream in the in the car like that. Mm -hmm. That is truly something I, I like. That, that could have been an early life. edit. That, Maybe it, that it didn't make the final cut. I don't know. It had oh. to have been. I mean, listen, if you remember that, you remember that. But like, I just, I, that, that was shocking. But if you mm -hmm. say it wasn't, I mean, this is not, this, this right here is not the be all end all. If you say you didn't, if you say you guys played Brazil, you played Brazil. Or maybe or we did, whatever. maybe we didn't. I don't remember. I remember the first time we played Chile with Mike Hideous, the promoter being, like really like guys you know you can't you can't not have michael graves i've, I've sold this show as this lineup and now you've got somebody else. He, he was like really worried uh he wasn't gonna this, this was not gonna end well and it kind of didn't but nobody died at least this time yeah yeah, yeah. that's where the person yeah. fell off the the thing i the, yeah. the i threw them off the thing and security didn't catch him but yeah he lived yeah. he might be a little um funny in the head to this Monkey, day but, he, but, he lived. but he's alive yeah he's alive yep. that's that's the that's the most important part uh mm -hmm. okay so then you come back to america roseland mm -hmm. theater here's what i'm gonna do uh, maybe this will jog your memory yeah let's I'm just gonna name we did this the last time and this was really yep. effective i'm just gonna say the dates and the 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 thing and you just let's see what you have to say so mm -hmm. july 23rd roseland theater in portland oregon Okay, I, I know the venue, but I can't think of anything specific okay. that happened there. Except, Great. except working out, out outside, remember doing like abs. Uh, yeah, that, that's like, who cares about that? But yeah, okay. Uh, Graceland in Seattle, Washington. Okay, I remember the uh, club, but again, nothing special. 
DV8, Salt Lake City, Utah, mm -hmm. Og Ogden Theater in Denver, Colorado. Yep, that's where I broke my foot years later. Yep, okay. Okay. We played uh, there a lot. The Granada Theater in Lawrence, Kansas. Mm -hmm. uh, the Galaxy, St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, Royal Grove, Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, back oh, to boy. Yeah, that was, oh my God, the Nebraska show. I was like, what are we doing here? Yeah, well, that, <laughs> one, that time, one, one time we've been to Nebraska. That was that was it. <laughs> oh, was it really? Wow. I, I think so. Like, it was just, uh, it, was, it was flat in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, God's and then you went back to First Avenue, which is that's mm -hmm. Prince's Club. Yep. Right. Yeah. Um, so this was this was not post nine. We went back post nine eleven, and there was some a memorable moment there. Okay, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. rave at Eagles Ballroom. Eagles Ballroom. Yeah. That would that have been the time I chased Kenny through the dressing room or not? Maybe no. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, but we played there a lot. We, August? Oh, no, that, that was on the Vans Warp Tour. We, all the merch was set up outside. They had a half pipe. The, yeah, that, okay, so that was Warp Tour. So this is Warp Tour that we're talking about. Yeah. So if that's it's, why it's you're, and that's why you're playing Nebraska, because Warp Tour, of course. Okay. Is oh, so that's not the only time we've been to Nebraska. I'm the, the other time I'm thinking of, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, St. Andrews Hall, Detroit, Michigan, Bogarts, mm -hmm. Cincinnati, Ohio, mm -hmm. Club Laga in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, okay. um, Larpo's Heartbreak Hotel in Lar Providence, Harpo's. Rhode Island. Does it actually say Larpo's? It's Harpo's. No, no, it's Lupo's. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Harpo's is a different venue. Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel. That's correct. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. Um, Northern Lights, Clifton Park, New York. Uh, Show Place Theater, Buffalo, New York. Okay. Yep. Chameleon yep. Club, Lancaster, yep. Pennsylvania. Birch yep. Hill Nightclub, Old Bridge, New Jersey. Was the the one in Lancaster? I think that's the night Ken and I bought our AR-15s across the street, like super cheap. Wow. Odd thing to you know throw in there, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that so that was, I was uh, my my uh, future wife, my first wife Sasha, and her best friend Betty, who was the girlfriend of the drum tech King Tut. No, that couldn't have been it yet because Chud was still in the band. Tut was never Chud's. No, Tut Tut was at that point my merch assistant. God, I I forgot. So I had Tim Bunch, I had Chris Soto, I had King Tut. So King Tut was my merch, just all around, you know. It, the gopher uh, but he did uh he and i did merch together we had this gimmick so this was after the black angus incident and we were going to do the choke slam thing again like right when our girlfriends came like after the show and we we're counting out we had it all planned out to where we were going to get in a fake argument and i was going to choke slam him through the table and he had like fake blood ready to go like like just like in burbank when he felt the back of his head he's like "Fuck, i, I think i'm bleeding you know I was like, well, yeah, he asked to get choke slant on rocks, you're gonna bleed. Um, <laughs> so we we had somebody from one of the opening bands, I think the tour manager, or maybe it was less visible. Was that the H2O sick of it all? Somebody was supposed to show up with like a, a camcorder, this before cell phones, to record this. So we we're waiting for them to show up as we're counting out, like, all right, you know, we're not gonna do this till this guy gets here. And then the guy never came. So this Thing that we had planned all night to like freak our girlfriends out with like we really got in a fight and i really choke slammed him and he's really bleeding uh never happened sadly hmm. missed moments in history hmm. um after the chameleon club uh there's the birch hill nightclub in old bridge new jersey that might have been so that was the h2o sick of it all tour and they i we were set up out uh, by the front doors for some reason no what time of year is this this is august 2000 okay. it couldn't have been that time then i was um, guitar tech at this point i remember the show the first time we played there it was cold i did merch and they left the front doors open all night and it, there was a the, the thermostat on the wall read 45 degrees inside 
mm. and they refuse to close the front doors. And I'm like, the, the fans are just walking in, you know, and then going into the hot venue. Us merch guys, we're right by the front door, 45 degrees all night long. By the time the, uh, the at the end of the night, the promoter came by to, to settle up to get his merch cut. My fingers were so cold, I couldn't count the money. And I was like, go fuck yourself. You're not getting anything. I can't, I can't even count your stupid fucking uh, percentage because you left the, it's the so goddamn crazy. Doors open. It's so crazy that they still were getting that, that, that was the thing even back then. I feel like, I, I, I feel like merch cuts have only gotten more popular, mm. but it's hard to believe that even as early as, you know, the 2000s, early 2000s and the 90s and the merch cuts were a thing. I mean, that's yeah. so strange. The, the, back then, the average merch cut would be 10%, sometimes 15 A bigger, more established venue, like they actually had like a real merch booth, and like maybe people to man it, and you, I didn't have to be there all night, might be asking 20%. But my job, which was made clear to me by Rocky, was that I am never to pay out uh, anything more than single digits. Do mm. whatever I got to do to make sure they only get single. And I, we, I, I, I had every you cooked, with, with, you with, with books with the amount of comps that Jerry would give away just naturally. At the end of the night, we, you know, we go into the counter. I'm like, oh, and here's all my comps, and that would like knock you know thousands of dollars off the 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 uh, the, the the bottom line. Uh, but the best thing I think we ever did, going back to to cardboard boxes, it was a venue in Texas, and the guy who was in charge of like counting in and counting out, who worked at the venue, was watching us like a hawk the whole night. But I got real friendly with him. We're talking about like our our kids or something. There was something that we kind of like clicked on, so I I, play, I prayed on that, and just like keep your friends close and your enemies even closer, kind of thing. So somebody got caught. One of the other merch guys got caught trying to sneak merch in and like so i think that's why we're getting watched by like a hawk by then but ken a, ken and a couple of the crew guys like brought over some pizza boxes and brought them he brought them to martha just you've, a stack of pizza boxes you've told us the story okay and and like right, here you go tank yeah. like right in front of the guy and yeah uh, like yeah like, enjoy enjoy and and when you know as soon as the guys uh, back really turn, i open up the top and it's just uh, it's a stack of boxes and it's like one of those um one of those books you pull off the shelf and you open. Yeah, it or like, like in jail, like inside the nail file yeah. in the cake. Yeah, you know? there's like a couple dozen shirts, like in the in the stack of of fake pizza boxes, and that's how, that's one of the ways I was able to, to cook the numbers. The best was uh, Stone Pony in '96, East Coast War '96. Um, the guy who comes over to count out the merch with me at the end of the night. Uh, actually, I didn't sell merch that night. That's the night that I actually crowd surfed to like Wolf's Blood, which I think was the one time they ever played that song. Um, we're going over the numbers and as, as I'm doing the, I'm, you know, pulling out the sales tax and I'm doing the percentage, I'm, I'm doing incorrect math on paper. I literally perfectly, I, I did it deliberately on paper instead of a calculator. So I could, I could do it wrong. I'm banking on the fact that a, he's an idiot and B he's drunk and C it's the end of the night and he's tired. And I'm, I'm doing the math wrong right in front of him. And I'm like, you're following me, right? You got all this. He's like, yeah, yeah, man, that's great. And then I, here you go, brother. Here's, here's your three and a half percent. Have a nice day. Like, and he's like, "Yeah, I got their fifteen percent here, boss." I'm like, "Yeah, okay, sure you do." That's amazing. <laughs> so, That's fucking yeah. amazing. Fuck yep. that. Fuck that. <laughs> like, honestly, fuck them. Like, it's hard enough being a fucking creative band. Like, you're just gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna take your fucking merch cut. Like, fuck you. Yeah. Give us I a had cut of the teach. liquor sales. Give us a cut. You here? You want our merch? Give us a cut of the liquor Give sales. We'll call it your liquor. We brought those people in for you. I mean, um, Jesus the, Christ. The merch guy for the Addicts when we did our first Fiend Fest tour was the son of, like, the, the lead guitarist, one of the original members. Um, so he, you know, obviously, you know, this this is a family project, and so he's kind of protected about But he would, like, fight with the guy who was there to count them in and count them out. And I'm like, I had to pull him aside. I'm like, dude, you're going about this all wrong. Like I said, you got to keep your enemies close. Yeah, you got to make don't friend. If if you fight with them, they're gonna they're gonna turn every screw they can't. Nobody's cutting you a break if you're if you're an asshole. You've got to play them. You got to keep it cool. You got to be like, hey, buddy, can I you know can I hook you up with a shirt? Like, whatever you got to do to get them on your side. So any anything you can slip in, and then you you do your do your other scam on the side. Like he didn't get it. He 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 was yeah. green. You know, at the I'm like you yeah human. You know, come on, psychology. Anyway, I'm sorry. I I, I, I freaking segue to all these other. No, 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 uh, it's okay. I, I, this shit is great. This shit is amazing. I, so there's a one-off show with Sardonica. 
Mm -hmm. And I mean, so, but it sounds like, I mean, we just went through so many dates. Like it just, the summer of 2000 was, was, it sounds like was just rather uneventful. It was just business as usual. Cause here's my question. What I remember. Well, okay. So here's what's interesting to me because right after this is when you go to Canada and that's when Michael Graves is not there. And it's just Jerry Doyle and Dr. Chud from October 1st through October 9th. In, and was that when Zoli came on board? Well, the here's what I'm at. Here's what I, here's my, here's my question. If I was a person that was just studying data and like looking at like the situation and like knowing what happened, did, did, was there some sort of, did, was there any kind of strain over that summer with Graves before he's suddenly not there for these Canada shows? You know what I mean? Like, is there like is something been the, leading up that to the, the to, summer? Would it, could it have been the summer, summer 2000? He, so the band more or less broke up in October of 2000, right? Yeah. Okay, so Tankinson was already done because I have guitar teching now. So maybe the the summer tour? I'm trying to remember like what tour it was that Michael, like the first night, and he's already like looking to fly home. And I'm like, that's when I chased him through the truck stop. And Wait, that, you chased that Michael ridiculous. Graves through a, cr- a truck we, stop? Well, I mean, I didn't chase him, but I, I was coming after him, and he's like, "Oh, this is ridiculous!" And he gets off the payphone, and like you know, goes and hides in the men's room or whatever, because uh, he knew I was there to talk him out of going home. Oh, he was going to go home. We were already on the on the road. We hadn't played a show yet. We were on our way to the first show, which was like a few days away for whatever reason. The, the bad book, yeah. Um, which gave him an opportunity to be like, "Oh, no, I, I got to go back home for whatever." whatever reason i mean i i get that you might have a personal reason but as we talked about last time i I, I did i'm like like you get to a certain point and like other people's livelihoods are now involved in your personal agenda and you can't you can't cross those streams man we're all relying Mm -hmm. on this paycheck and yeah you're not fucking with my livelihood and i can't have that i cannot have that the 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 machine has to you're part of the machine you've committed to being a part of the machine Mm -hmm. and the machine has to keep turning because people have to put food in their families' mouths and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, what's the why doesn't Michael Graves go to Canada in October? That was not London. the time that that I got turned away. That was in the nineties. Uh, Michael didn't go to Canada. He had the the legal thing that the lawyer did up that said he was okay to get in. I had my uh, ah. a notarized thing. Oh, does it say? I, okay, so on this, I didn't think to look at this other thing. So here's what Mark Kennedy wrote. Mm-hmm. Mark Kennedy wrote this. This is on October 1st, 2000. This is the first date of a string of Canada dates. And it says the band began their tour of Canada, but Michael Graves was not allowed into the country due to his police record. Jerry only sang for the band for this portion of the tour. And some shows featured Zoli of Ignite on vocals. On October 25th, 2000, Michael Graves, after a brief return, and Dr. Chud left the band. By the end of the tour, on November 26, 2000, the Misfits had performed with Jerry on vocals, Zoli on vocals, former Misfit uh, Joey Image on drums for two shows, someone named uh, Renfield from Can- Can- Candria. Can- Can- Candiria, something like that. Candiria on drums, Goat. Mm-hmm from Mm -hmm. murphy's law on drums and matt cross from orange Mm -hmm. nine millimeter on drums i forgot where matt was from yep okay so this was so the canada tour i think that was when we were touring with uh speedwagon which used to be reo speedwagon but they got busted for that so they had to shorten it to speedwagon um Mm -hmm. and he would come the singer for speedwagon would come out and sing vampira with us, but for some reason, I remember them being on on that tour that Zoli came out on the Canadian tour. Um, so how did so, Zoli and my how did Zoli and Jerry okay. get to talk? So we did a tour going back years prior with Reach the Sky, Ignite, and Misfits. So you had like two hardcore bands and the Misfits coming together. 
and I, I felt I, I forget the, the name of the singer for Reach the Sky. Really nice guy, but I remember being at the merch booth at uh, was it the Galaxy in Ca well, a venue in California that we played a lot that had really, really, really good homemade salsa that was always uh, backstage. Of course, when we got there, um, the, some some fan after the two opening bands were had played and we were like waiting for Misfit to come on, um, some fan was talking to the singer of Reach the Sky after having seen them and Ignite perform. And he's telling the singer, he's like, oh, man, you know, you, you got to get some balls like that, like the, the singer for Ignite has, you know, like you just you just need some balls, man. And and, I, you know, like, what do you say to that? I, it just, I, I'm, I'm just looking at the poor guy like, I, I don't know, dude, it's I don't I got nothing, pal. Like, that's that's pretty rough to come back from. But I mean, at the end of the day, Zoli's voice is rare in what his his power is what his range is um was it the right sound for the misfits not necessarily could he sing the songs yeah sure he could um uh but it, it ignite in, in and of its own right like i don't listen to a lot of hardcore but ignite because zoli does sing and sings like with some power uh i i would listen to their their stuff back in the day when we toured with them um so that's that's when we met zoli so however like the, the connections were made he was like kind of there and he came out originally with the the bleached hair, but when he came back a little more full time later on, he actually dyed it black with his little, little crew cut. But here's the funny thing about Zoli: great guy, love them, and, and professional because I mean he used to be the head of his own band and and knew you know the ins and outs of, of touring and and showing up on time and and uh, you know being where he's supposed to be when you need to be there. Um, he didn't know. I mean, everybody knows the Misfits songs. You can sing along, but singing along like karaoke and just then singing live with the band with nothing to fall back on, they're they're different. Um, and so he he knew the words for the most part, or he could sing along with some, but to perform them on his own, he needed cheat sheets. So most bands will have like a set list, so you know the the songs that you're going to be playing. That you know the the fans will try and get sure. that after the show. Zoli had cheat sheets of the songs that he couldn't remember, like the actual lyrics written out and laminated, and then each sheet like taped together with clear plastic, uh, with clear tape. So I was merch, merch guy and guitar tech at the time, and he would come up to me before changeover, and every day, the, 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 it, was, it was the size of a freaking flag when it first started. In, in in the order that they were going to be sung in, so he could he could glance down and like not lose his place in the song, and he knew what the I mean. How do you not? Yeah, but how do you not know the words to a Misfits song? Like why he, is it that it's so? Okay. Having having played with having rehearsed with the Misfits, tried out for the Misfits, and like doing Green Hell. In that chugga 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 chugga, like it is easy to lose your place mm -hmm. if you're not listening to the actual song and you. Like it, you have you have something to fall back on. You have the actual vocal track to fall back on if you miss it. But when it's on your own, you've like really got to pay attention. So sure. I, I okay. get that. And, and and him being the 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 the, the consummate professional that he was, he didn't want to fuck up the show. He wanted it to be you know, yeah, fair enough, good. fair enough. So totally. he he would tape this together. It was the size of a freaking flag, and he'd roll it up. He'd bring it over to me at the merch table. And be like, all right, you know, Tank, listen, um, I need you to go up like during the changeover and tape this down on the floor behind my monitors, but make sure, make sure nobody sees you doing it. Um, okay, uh, Zoli. So you want me to take this, this, this flag, and go up on the stage, center stage, downstage, right in front of the crowd, a house full of people. And get out a whole bunch of tape and tape it in place so it, it can't move and make sure that nobody sees me do it right I, I got that right right all right let me get right on that um okay so that was like um interesting but i would i would break zoli's balls about it just because it was it was too fucking funny and, and too good of an opportunity to pass up to not do that so one of the venues in Canada where I before the show or after the show sometime it might have been after the show 
I was laying on one of the folding tables, one of the merch tables, just because I was fucking tired. We were still like loading out or counting out. I'm laying on it, and Jerry comes over and like butt drops on my stomach, and we both go through the table together. And I was just like, classic. Like, what else would happen? Holy shit! But he comes over, hands me the 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 flag, the uh, the, the the lyrics flag, and says, "All right, Tank, here's here's tonight's uh, you know lyrics. Make sure you know, make sure nobody sees you now." when you go up on stage in the spotlight to tape this on the floor. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, Zoli, don't, don't worry, no problem, I got this. So as he's still standing there at the merch table, I go walking away holding this thing rolled up and I, I, I deliberately, accidentally, let it like unroll out of my hand. So as I'm walking, it like rolls out behind me across, and it's big, it's long. It goes running out and he's all like, ah, 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 what are you doing? He was, was so worried that somebody was going to see what I was getting to the stage with, and I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't pass that up. Um, but it, it would get smaller and smaller and smaller, like each night as he nailed down certain songs. Um, they might have been some of the newer songs. I don't really remember uh, that he didn't grow up, you know, listening to like the classic stuff. Um, but that that was part of my part of my job for that. Uh, so we question. did. Hmm. Um, so, so you're doing shows with Ignite, Michael Graves, if I'm understanding mm -hmm. this correctly, Michael Graves doesn't come into the country. You are doing shows with Ignite and Jerry's like, Hey, Zoli, listen, what do you think about singing for us? And mm -hmm. Zoli's like, yeah, it sounds like a good idea or, huh, that's interesting. I'd be interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that? Like, how does Zoli end up singing in the first place? Uh, because Michael couldn't make it into Canada, somebody had to sing. Right. Um, so he just so Jerry was like, "Hey, Zoli, can you can you can do, you do this?" this? Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess uh, so. If that was the tour that that uh, re, uh, at least Ignite was on at that point, or whoever was, uh, if he was up for two sets a night, that's that's saying a lot for his his voice. Oh sure, um, for sure. Which is which is a truly amazing voice. Um. Yeah. Okay. So he we, we did we did one show we did a show in Hungary a few years later and Zoli's Hungarian uh, from Budapest um and he was at the show and Jerry was like hey why don't you come up and, and, and sing a few songs for you know old time's sake and that they were I think it was just four songs like Astro Zombie Skulls you know some of the yeah before, you know like Walk Among Us era stuff and he was like Tank um I I just need to know the first line of each song and then I, I got it from there so can you give me the first line of astro zombies and he, he holds his hand up and takes it and i'm like yeah, okay so he writes that down so on his hand he had the first line of four songs and so like each song kind of like you know kind of like dd at the at the key club with his guitar he would look out and be like you know okay pirate let's go um kind of funny but uh really good guy i liked working with him he was cool um so yeah, so he kind of takes over singing while Michael can't come back into the country. But then, mm -hmm. but then. according to this, he he comes back. He come back into the country at the Palladium, Worcester, Massachusetts again, back mm -hmm. at the Palladium. And now, both Michael Graves and Zoli. Zoli hasn't. Zoli doesn't. Zoli doesn't uh, uh, exit. And instead, now he's coming out to sing. He's either singing with Michael, or he's singing. He's trading off with Michael to sing. What is is there? What what's going on here? Oh boy, that's really taking me back. Why wouldn't Michael come back in in his, his in his entirety? Does it say how many shows were like that? Um. Well, it says it's just one show where on the 21st. So it's literally five days before Chud and and Michael Graves walk off. Chud Doyle and Michael Graves walk off five days after this show. Mm. I mean, I could tell you what picture it paints in my mind, but I mean, I don't know. I just imagine that Jerry is upset with graves and he's got yeah. he's he's sort of he's sort of uh uh 
you know, getting uh, conditioning Zoli or dangling Zoli as leverage to Graves, like, hey, you're replaceable or something, hmm. and keeping him around as insurance in case something doesn't work. I mean, you said it yourself that that Graves, you know, was avoiding was was looking to go home early, and the mm -hmm. machine has to roll on, right? So. Mm -hmm. I don't know what what's going on. What <laughs> what happened I, now? I, if you had asked me at the beginning of the show, like, was there ever a show that that Michael and Zoli like both sang? I'd be like, no, no, that never happened. Well, I, I mean, you might be right. Remember, but you might be right. I mean, maybe there there maybe this is wrong. I mean, what do you remember? You're the you, I, I mean, uh, this could be this could be totally one hundred percent not accurate, wrong yeah. altogether. But ultimately, this leads to the breakup of of the band. So you know, mm -hmm. right? Just sort of does it does it say in the in the, on the tour dates who what who the support acts were like on October twenty fifth, two thousand when when the shit hit the fan? Does it say who our opening bands were? No, it just that happened at a house of blues, mm -hmm. and then the or next. We... Sorry, go ahead. The funny stories about that House of Blues, it wasn't this time, but there was a time before that Adam Sandler was at the show. And so I sent some merch up to like his VIP room just to be, you know, to, you know, it's Adam Sandler. And then I ran into him out back as we were loading out. And I was like, oh, hey, Adam, did, did you get the, the shirts I sent? Like, oh, yeah, man, thank you so much. It was really cool. Thanks That's so cool. And that, that was my my rub with the, with the excellent. But the first time we ever played there, I think, yeah. I don't, it might have been the same time, but we had a day off the next day, and we went back to what used to be called, it used to be called Paradise Island, which was like the adult section of Disney World. Now it's like downtown Disney or something. It's a little bit more family-oriented, even though it's like the nightclubs and the, there's a really cool uh, improv comedy club there, uh, but the, the, cool, the Lego store is there, the dinosaur restaurant, all that kind of shit, but we went back the next day. And as we were leaving the strip, I guess to head back to the RV and hit the road, we're walking through an alley, which was the same alley we had loaded in through. And I don't know who it was that pointed out something like next to the dumpster, but somebody said, Hey, Morgan, isn't that Chud's symbol stand or a uh, gong stand? And Morgan looks over at it and he's like, uh-huh. <laughs> and immediately, like everybody in the band and crew just started freaking pummeling Morgan. And he was just like, ah, ah, ah. like he knew he had to take it. He totally fucked up. And he just had to take the, the, the beating he was going to get. Because if we hadn't walked through that aisle, we would have, the, the alley, we would have gone to the next venue and be like, all right, let's hang up the big gong with the Fiend Club, uh, you know, the Peisty gong that we got from Japan. With the Fiend Club logo, let's let's hang that up now. Hey Morgan, where's where's the rack to hang this thing from? I don't know, man. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> there it was. Right? Oh my god. Um, so yeah, so, he got the full brunt of the mummy's wrath. So the so the guys all they they split apart after the House of Blues show, and then mm -hmm. Joey Image comes into the picture for one show. Yeah. What was that like for, seeing Joey we, Joey down there? Um, it was, I mean, Joey was Joey was cool. Um, I got some pictures of him by a Lamborghini that one one of our fans from Fort Lauderdale always showed up in it, at the show with his uh, his Diablo and would like take us for rides. Um, but so so we we're we're, we're skipping over the night at the House of Blues and, or no? I I don't know you you whatever whatever. <laughs> What whatever you have to uh, say about the House okay. of Blues, please. Whatever, so, whatever you want to say. I was not fully aware until now that we're going through this stuff of all the all the rifts that were happening between Michael and the band as this stuff was was going along. I I I, I guess I was just oblivious to it, or I was just happy to be there. I I don't I don't know. Maybe I'm just stupid. But the story that I what I saw happen leading up to the night of the 25th where it just all fell apart was um there had always been a rule with the crew 
that yes, you you can you can drink, you can smoke pot. Um, we kind of rather you don't do anything above and beyond that. But you're you know what once the 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 back door of the lock the box truck shuts latches and is locked you are now off the clock if you want to have some drinks if you want to hit a little whatever it's your time nobody's going to tell you you can't do that but until that door shuts you are on our time that we're paying you for and we we won't have any of that we need professionals working here and i think for the most part everybody was like okay with that as time went on and okay morgan was gone we now had pat the drum tech who was a friend of stephanie's the gorgeous frankenstein stephanie doyle's later wife um who was like brought on board through doyle's insistence which was stephanie's insistence was pat a professional drum tech no was pat a professional anything no professional fuck up maybe um, yeah, I I had a rule on on Tank's chariot on the crew bus that I I built with my my own freaking hands that no uh, if you had a soda it was in a bottle with a screw on cap no open drinks in the tour because we didn't have like cup holders like it, it's a moving vehicle the, the, and sure enough uh, we had a spill it was one of Pat's drinks and I, I I fucking I was like dude I told you bottles only with caps it's screw on. That now the now the carpeting behind the the, the sofa oh, that I built is fucking stained. Carpet, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. So I found another drink that he left, uh, 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 like a, like a soda, like a McDonald's, you know, clear plastic, whatever, with the straw on the lid. And, and I I was so mad. I took the thing, I threw it in his bag, I zipped up the bag, and I shook it up real good oh, and shit. tossed it in his bunk. Oh God. And and when when he when he got to it, he knew he had fucked up. He knew he pissed off John Grimm. He comes off the bus and says, hey, John Graham, listen, man, I'm really sorry. I'm like, yeah, you fucking better be, dude. There's a reason. There's that. There's rules. It's not, I'm not doing it just because I, I feel like it. So things began like kind of breaking down as far as rules and people actually like respecting that where there were rules and that was a good example right there. And what what transpired. So we were at, oh no, Sorry. I don't want the cat. The, the cats like destroy my green screen. So I, I ah. so like, yeah, <laughs> keep the cat out of here. So we were at, uh, what the hell's the venue? Toad, Lucky Lucky Toad, Toad or Toad's place? Toad's place. Toad's place. Good venue. Weird because it's kind of wide and 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 not so deep. But um, we're at Toad's place. I'm guitar tech. Pat is drum tech. The um, we do our line check. There's a there's a, a a big red drape that goes over Chud's drum kit, and Pat is able to to check each mic at check each drum with the with the the, the cover still on. Um, at some point before the uh, yeah, at some point before that covers. How does it work? How did it work? I I would line check the mics, the guitar, the bass. Pat would drum, uh, line check uh, all the drums, and then he and I together would unveil the drum kit. It took it was so big and so many spikes on the kit. It right, took yeah, two people to take this big drum. veil off, and that was kind of like the the pre like okay, it's about to start. Crowd, here's the drum kit, and they, there would be like a a reaction, and then we would you know uh, click the mag light up to the front of house to let them know. The band is queued up. We're ready to go. Drop the lights. Start the intro music. Whatever, uh, or we're or turn on the PA because we're going to start playing. Um, so that night, I'm over at my guitar tech station. I'm just like last minute stuff, and all of a sudden, the lights come down, and like the intro music stuff. So whatever the intro was at that point. Oh my God. Okay. Wow. Sorry guys. This is like all coming back to me now. It's been so, so long. I, I must've put it out of my memory because it was a bad, bad night. The lights go down and the intro, the drum tech had to press a single key on a keyboard and hold it down on Chud's rig, the brain box for a creepy attic. That's what the, the intro music was before the band would start, I guess with Kong 
or how, however this was playing out. And I'm, I'm, I'm my guitar station. I'm like, the lights go down. The music starts. The crowd is like, wow, the show is going to start. They're like, they're freaking out. I'm like, yo, Pat, what the, th- the drum kit is still covered. You have, we haven't uncovered, like Chud can't come out and play a covered kit. And he's like, oh, fuck. Boop. Takes his finger off the keyboard. The intro music stops. The lights come back up because the LD's like, uh, okay, I'll bring the lights, but like, what else am I supposed to do? And we go out and we uncover the kit. And then it starts again and the lights go down and they like, oh my God, talk about a false start. You don't fuck up the intro. There might be a few mistakes during the show. When you're going live, people are probably going to notice. But the intro, come on. It's the, it's the TV all over again with the VHS tape. You know ejected. what it is? You know what that is, what you're describing? And I see like the stress, like at just reliving that moment in your mm-hmm. mind. You know what that is? That, that is um, That's tied to what happens when you're doing live theater. What you're describing mm-hmm. Is and you know, when you take your work seriously and you take mm-hmm. the show seriously, there's you know, there's definitely like a nonchalance in, in punk rock, right? But yeah. there's also something about like the theater is a sacred religious sort of space, and mm-hmm. the the show must go on and the show must go according yeah. to plan, and there are just yeah. some things. There are some things that could be grazed over, and fu- and there are some things that you just don't fuck up. That's what it yep. sounds like yeah. as you're describing this. I, yeah. p- please continue. I'm sorry. Sorry yeah. to interject. So, so the mega, mega false start to the show. And now prior to that, which was unbeknownst to me until I was told you know, later, apparently Michael and Chud were like, big you know jerry jerry you know would would hit the hit the weed when the time was right michael and chad were, were hitting it in the in the dressing room like before the show and okay i mean you, you've got band and you've, and you've got crew yeah we're working together but there, there's there there has to be a hierarchy the band can get away with some stuff that you know the crew really can't so when pat the fuck up drum tech was back there with michael and chad yeah, man, we're going to do this show. It's going to be great. And then he goes out and totally fucks up the intro. Jerry loses his fucking mind. And totally understandably. I was furious myself. And it's, I mean, it's not my show, but it, it is my show. Um, So after that show, it's like the Jerry fucking dropped the hammer and laid down the law. There will be no pot smoking of any kind until that, as the rules state, until that back door shuts and it's locked. Until then, you are on my time and you will not be smoking pot. I it's will a re- not have it's a re- I mean, it's that's a reasonable request. Totally. Don't totally. get loaded until the night's over. Wait until at, the night's at over. At any job. Yeah, and then okay. get loaded. There's, there's so many people that I, <laughs> I tell, yeah, you know, I, I worked for the Misfits for 13 years and, and like, oh man, that, that must have been great. That must have been great. I'm like, I'm like you do realize it was a job. It's not what you think. It was, it was a job. It was not always easy. It was not always fun. And I had, I got paid. Uh, there were times that, you know, it was cool, it, cool, but it's still a job. Not everybody yeah. takes it that way. It's like, Oh, Hey, I'm with the band. No, you're here to do a fucking job. Don't fuck it up. And it's theater. That, it's theater. That fucked it up. It's live theater. He fucked up live theater. And so the, Jerry dropped the hammer. I would have done the same thing if it was my band. Same exact thing. The very next night, we are at the new 930 Club in D.C., the old West Hall. Uh, Awesome, awesome venue. Oh, so you're actually, hold on a second. So I'm, Mm -hmm. wait a minute. So this is actually something that had happened way before the House of Blues on the 25th, that you're, you're, this is leading up to the House of Blues. This this is leading up to the house of blues, but not way before. So we're only like a few days out. Okay, I'm, gotcha. I'm gotcha. So this was not the night of. This is leading up to it, though. Got it. Yeah. Sorry. So the next night, we are uh, in DC, in the dressing room, about to go downstairs and start the show. Uh, always love playing this venue. Always a good turnout. Great stage. Great PA. Great everything. 
in the dressing room, just blatantly, right in front of Jerry. There's Michael. There's Chud. There's Pat. Like, fuck you, Jerry. We're going to get high. Like, this, and oh, gotta remember, this was around the time that Michael was in High Times magazine. He did a, an article, an appearance, a photo shoot, centerfold, whatever it was. So that, that was like, hey, man, this is our thing, bro. I'm like, great, great. So Jerry, of course, is fucking furious. And I cannot blame him at all. But he doesn't say anything. He just fucking tucks it away, probably uses that, probably digs down deep into it during the show and fucking just gets out there and kicks ass. The next day, we finish the show, we load out, nothing has been said yet. The next day, um, the next day was a, wow, our, our drivers drove overnight from D.C. to Orlando and we woke up the next day to the, uh, the, the, the night of horrors stuff at Universal. Um, the, yeah, we, I remember like telling uh, all of us being like, Lugaran, holy shit, dude, you kicked ass. I don't know if he was coked up or whatever to make that happen, but damn, that was that was a h- overnight haul to get us on our day off to a place that was really cool. So much, much love to Lugaran and, and whoever was driving the uh, uh, the other vehicle. Lugaran was driving the, the crew bus at the time. Um, so I, I don't think anything happened that day. We all went to like the haunted houses and stuff, and that's when I found my Midnight Syndicate CD on and one of the uh, the uh, the gift shops after one of the haunted houses, which later became our outro music uh, down the road, and a, a, a stuff I'm still a big fan of when I, with all my gaming and everything. Um, I don't remember if it was that night or if it was the next day that the, the which was the 25th of the Orlando House of Blues show, but Jerry fired pat can i can i interject real quick yeah super quick Mm. here's what i see on the on the on the docket the 23rd is the 9 30 club the 24th is the reacher theater in towson maryland Mm -hmm. and then and then the 25th is the house of blues in orlando florida okay so is it possible that did not happen that the i think i think the maryland show did not happen Okay, yeah. and that's why we, we you, definitely, yeah, we definitely overnighted down. it. Yeah, got you. Um, Sorry, that, that continue. Theater, continue. I, don't, I don't ever remember anything about that place. So I don't know if it was on the the twenty, uh, the twenty fourth, or the the twenty fifth, the day of the show. But but Jerry just straight up was like, Pat, you're fired, you're out. I, I want you out of here. Pack your bags and hit the fucking road. And and I. I I was there for part of this, but I was also having to work at the same time. So I, I and, and my memory's foggy. Sorry, guys. But if I remember correctly, both Michael and Chud were were like, "Oh well, well if he goes, uh, we're, we go." Like you can't fire. And Jerry's like, "Yeah, I can do whatever the fuck." Or no, Chud was like, "That's my drum tech. You can't fire him." And Jerry's like, "Fuck you. He's fired. You, mm. You're not get- guys. What the? It's fucking pot. Just fucking give it a break." Chud and Michael were not at. Maybe Michael was there. I don't think he was, but I can definitely tell you that Chud did not go to sound check that day because he was standing his solidarity with Pat. And I'm like, "What are you doing? This guy's a fuck up, and you're you're gonna mm. risk all this for for him?" Uh, it's not the first time that's. Ha- I mean, it's not the last time that would happen. <laughs> I know for a fact that Chud was not at sound check because Dylan asked me to sound check Chud's drum kit. Oh, and wow. after after I broke my third drumstick, Dylan was like, "Can we get somebody else on that kit, please?" I I can't have te- like I, I I didn't know my I, I was like Mongo back there just like beating shit and, and, and they're they're his, dowels like, right they're, they're those big, big fat sticks <laughs> yeah uh, so um so whoever else. Because there was no drum tech, there was no drummer. Like somebody else had to had to do it, so there wasn't even really like a f- real sound check because not all the members were there. I- I've sound checked for Doyle before, and that w- that was okay. Doyle knows what he's doing. Chud knows what he's doing too, but it's not about that. It's about getting the sound in the room and in the monitors. Like if that's not dialed in, you're you're lost, and your show sucks. So we we started out on, on a bad foot. Pat was packing up all his shit and and leaving and. 
Shud was, I don't know where he was. But so that there was, there was animosity in the air. Sure. Most definitely. Sure. The show, the show starts, the show goes down. I'm guitar teching. I'm on the stage. And at one point towards the end of the set, one of the last songs, Doyle just comes back and just hands me his guitar and walks off. And I'm like, strange. What? What? What the? What? What the fuck? And then Mike drops his mic phone, my, mic phone, microphone, and go follows Doyle off. And then Chud stops drumming and he gets down and go. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And Jerry's still going. He's just like, he's just playing. And like, he's, you know, he starts singing. And I, these, they start heading upstairs to the dressing room. And I chase after these guys. And when we get in the dressing room, Doyle is saying, you guys need to figure your shit out. Telling Michael and Chud, you need to figure, fucking figure your shit out. And and they're like and whatever their their comeback was I don't really remember because that it was unimportant, and I'm just like whoa whoa guys time out, there's a time and a place to figure this shit out and to air your grievances and fight and argue and, and whatever the fuck you got to do, but it ain't now, it do not air your dirty laundry in front of fucking God and everybody that's out in the house right now, do it after the show, and I I swear to God. Uh, you, we could hear Jerry like doing 138 or something and, and like had some girl come up on stage and sing whatever was happening. The show was t- still going on. It was d- literally the Jerry only hour. I, you know, I got to hand it to but, Jerry though, because he, he, um, you know, I've listened to that recording several times mm-hmm. and I got to tell you your whole band walks off, walks off stage and for him to mm-hmm. stay out there and just finish the show with 138. I mean that yes. does that takes fucking brass balls, man. It, does. it really does. It he, really he fucking kept does. It, he sorry, kept it going. He kept yeah. it going as long as he could. I don't know if if he had any idea what we were doing upstairs, but I was up there trying to herd these cats back onto the stage, and I literally had them agreeing to like, okay, we will finish the show and and we'll talk about this later. And we were like, okay, guys, let's do this. We were headed back downstairs when I hear Jerry say. Well, I guess that's it. You know, it's been it's been great. You know, good night. I don't know if this is our last show or whatever he says. And I'm just like, oh, my God, I was so close to getting them back out there. And that was the last time they played together. That's fucking crazy. So yeah. it's Doyle who actually it's Doyle who who exits the stage first yeah. out of frustration. And you know what's interesting too? I always thought that it was like the three of them walking off, but it sounds more like from what you're saying, it, it's like Doyle was telling those guys, like, yo, like, you know, get, you get, your, shit get your shit. Yeah, get your I shit. I don't know together. what might have been said before the show between oh. the three of them or the four of them mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Because um, yeah, yeah. I'm on stage doing line check and and yeah, they're you're, back you're to, you know, doing the, they're, they're like in the in the staging area. Um but you know, in my memory, should serve me correctly on this because it was very memorable. Doyle was the first one. I mean, he handed me his guitar and then walked off, and I'm like, "What? What?" And then I hear the mic drop, and, and Mike's going after him, and then it just it just quickly fell apart. And I I did everything in my power to save the band that I loved. And yeah, that must have been. Like, you must have been much. like, "Fuck!" I mean, what a, yeah. what a traumatic experience. Mm-hmm. Especially because a lot, I mean, you were with them from the very beginning. Yeah. You know, you watched I, it. I was, I was around before Michael, anybody knew who Michael right. was. I was around when, when Chud wasn't even like the drummer yet. Yeah. So to watch it build and, and I mean, you were a part of a team watching something build and build mm-hmm. and build. We just, mm-hmm. we started this episode talking about George Romero Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden it's like, it's all falling apart, yeah. you know, personalities and, you know, uh, politics. And uh, yeah. when I say politics, I don't mean like politic politics. I just mean no, like and, 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 and politics, politics. Yeah. Yeah. and yeah. politics and just all sorts of stuff. And I am, you know, famous monsters was a great album. It was doing well. Like we were like, we were, we were on the, on the roller coaster, like, 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 yeah. like we're going 
Bud Hill, man. We're going to bigger and better things. And not after that, we weren't. Yeah. And I'm, you know, to an extent, it makes, you know, hearing that whole story suddenly makes the whole Zoli thing makes a lot more sense and makes more sense about, you mm -hmm. know, again, it's like, it's like this, I have a guy who can't even come into Canada. I have a situation where, you know, I got a guy who is being chased around a parking lot, you know, to, to just to stay on tour. Like, mm -hmm. what am I going to do? I can't. We're trying to build this thing. What am I going to do? I got, I got to get. Maybe this guy Zoli will be a good mm -hmm. fit. Maybe this will be a good fit. Now, now having worked with Jerry, and and lots of love to Jerry for all that he's done, all the, all the you know who he is, right? Um, his vision, his drive, his tenacity. Um, I know that that because his personality is so just out there that for some people he can be hard to deal with he can be hard to work with especially if you know for somebody like michael like the, this was not his legacy he didn't you know didn't grow up doing this he was just like kind of thrown into the mix and said yeah now you're now you got to look this way and now you got to like right i'm not really into that but if you're going to pay me to do it i guess i'll do it like, like his heart maybe wasn't in it like jerry's was um so I, I can see a little bit. I can definitely see Jerry's side if if that's where Michael was coming from. Like I'm just, I've had it up to here with with you and how you are because that's not how I am. It's just not working. Like personality conflict. Like I understand. You know, not everybody's going to get along. It's a weird thing um, though because, like, I can appreciate that perspective as well. But at the same time, it's like, it's like you're coming into a band that's using a name with an established brand and legacy or whatever, whatever the case may be, you're in a machine that's not yours. Yeah. And if you got the friggin', if you got the, uh, the, what you want to call it? If you have the, uh, if you got the spot, you gotta, you know, you gotta show up for whatever the spot demands, you know, yeah. ultimately, yeah. um, I, I was never, I, I was never jealous of Michael. I mean, obviously, I tried out, and that would have been the dream gig for a, a fan like me to be the singer of the Misfits. Um, but I, I immediately, as soon as he came on board, I embraced him. I worked with him on on his look, his his stage presence. And we talked about that before, like getting him in front of a mirror, getting him off the microphone stand. Um, you know, I, I had his back uh, physically many times. You know, at shows and and whatnot. Um, I remember playing uh hammerstein ballroom and he went down when he would go down to the barricade like the kind of metal barricade that had the step like security had that step up to like pull people out of the crowd or whatever mm -hmm. he would go up on that or if he he would oh my that's what it was he would get up on the top edge of the the barricade and walk it like a tightrope um on nights that he would do that were nights that I wasn't selling merch, I would run down off the stage and I was the guy holding him like his his uh his belt loops in the back. So he could he could lean forward on the crowd and be okay. But if they pushed him back, he had nothing to keep from so I was the guy behind him keeping him from falling off the barricade. Nine so you had club, invested a lot you you had invested a lot emotionally into Michael Graves yeah. as well. Into Michael Graves, yeah. Gave him his name for for fuck's sake. Yeah. Um but quickly when we started playing shows with him and I saw that he kind of had to win over the crowd. There was some hard line, you know, it's Danzig or it's nothing uh, camp. And he had to, he had to kind of battle with them. And then with, with the pressure to write American psycho, then roll it into famous monsters. And, and he wrote some, some great songs. He was obviously a very talented singer. I saw the pressure that was put on him to fill some very big shoes. And I kind of look back and go, you know what? I'm glad I didn't get this gig. I don't. I don't think I, I couldn't have done it this kind of justice. There's no way, um, and the pressure that would have been on me might have been too much for me to handle. So, like I said, there was never a, a jealousy factor. It was always like, yeah, you're the guy. You are the guy. Your voice is is angelic, and you can do this. And so the it was very too. disappointing for me. The irony too is that you still got to take the ride. I mean, you mm -hmm. literally got to. Mm -hmm. I mean, you weren't there twenty four seven, but I mean, you you got you got to go on the journey 
too mm -hmm. and experience yeah. a lot of what he experienced without having that having different pressure you had different pressure, different, of course, yeah, different pressure yeah, yeah but you had pressure nonetheless yeah. and yeah. you know ultimately you know it, it had to come it came to a head it came, that comes to a head and then mm -hmm. that's what's crazy is that like literally the next day it's like joey image <laughs> joey mm -hmm. image drums for jerry mm -hmm. which is crazy and then zoli i mean the, you you're literally in the middle of a tour when this all goes down yeah yeah you got to finish the tour mm -hmm. get zoli back and then who so who is renfield who exactly is renfield and we know who goat is and goat came in and <sighs> we know who goat is and the orange not renfield so renfield he was from kenderia right yeah he just, right 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 he was from he a band gary knew him like somehow he he knew and, and we called him renfield because he just kind of had that that creepy sort of renfield look about him um and i think we only did one show there's only one show i remember doing with with uh what was named matt from orange nine okay um I, we were in detroit at harpo's and uh, doyle didn't come to sound check that day and that might have been him like not liking where things were going with like revolving say, that, a, a repeat, now and a repeat of and, the Mike Hideous situation, yeah. right? So I I knew a lot of the songs, being the guitar tech and actually having to back up, you know, play play songs for Doyle in the in the uh, 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 encore when he was dehydrated. Um, so we whoa 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 whoa, were, whoa 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 can't just graze over something with that. Wait, Doyle we would didn't talk about that. Wait, Doyle would get dehydrated and you would play no. the encore. There, there was the the my one shot at at history <laughs> was it, it was around the time when Stephanie was first coming around and we played in Detroit it wasn't Harpo's it was Grace Greystone Hall no no it wasn't Greystone Hall that didn't exist it was a place it was a place in in uh, uh, in Detroit. Doyle and Michael had gone to hang out with Stephanie and Stephanie's sister, who I think Michael might have been sweet on. Gotcha, gotcha. They went out and hung out with them before the show. I They might not have been at Soundcheck. I don't fully remember. But the story goes, Doyle did not drink enough water before the show because he was off butting around. So the show goes on. They finish the show, 138, and then... It's time for the encore, and Doyle's just sitting, you know, off on this on in the side wing over there, and was just, just kind of sitting with his with his hands, you know, on the on the table next to him. And he's just kind of got his head down. He's shaking his head. He's like, I, I can't do it. I can't go on. And it was because he was he was dehydrated. He was feeling sick. And I told Jerry, I was like, Doyle Doyle's out. He keep, he's not doing good. He can't. Jerry's like, grab a guitar, let's go. I'm like, what? <laughs> so we come out. And and I'm Jerry's like oh, yeah, the John Grimm, you know, he's our, uh, our guitar tech. He's gonna fill in, and he's Jerry's like, what What do you know? And I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, talk about put me on the spot. Jerry's like, oh, you know, let's do London Dungeon because I I would do that like warming up the guitar and checking stuff out. I just do the London Dungeon riff. Didn't really know the song. I just knew the riff. So we we played London Dungeon, and a lot of it is neck bending and feedback and stuff. And I just I knew to do that because I watched Doyle do it. So I'm I'm up there bending the neck like he does. And I, <laughs> I look over at him and he and he's just like he can't. I'm I'm just I'm just like total gimmick infringement. I'm just doing what he would do. Um, so we play London Dungeon. Jerry quickly shows me the four notes to the four chords to come back. So we play come back. We're just chugging along to that. And then they show me uh theme for a jackal kind of the same four chords if i remember correctly. trial by and fire we just we just played we did through i did three songs with ben and, and fucking front and center uh what once this went down uh rocky and king tut were over at merch they were front and center fr front row cheering me i go oh, tank go oh. king tut had a fez on they, they put it on my head so I, I could I could spin the, the tassel around like Doyle does with his devil lock, just goofing around. Uh, but that was my uh, almost 15 minutes of fame, playing the encore for the Misfits when Doyle was sick. Now to fast forward some some decades, they played the Talking Stick Amphitheater 
as the original Misfits when it was 115 degrees. Fuck and man. I can't, you know, after hearing no that's the that's immediately what I thought of when you said mm. that he had dehydration on stage like that. And mm. I thought about the fact that Jerry, Glenn Danzig, and Doyle, all men way past the age of 50, are in 115 degree heat. Dry heat, but uh, uh, yeah, over the still, age of 50, still. 115 degree heat, um, running around on stage for 90 minutes. 90 Who minutes. Who thought in, that was a good idea? Seriously. I, and like, and like in their gear, like not, not like, you know, like dressed up in their leathers and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it gets over 90 and I don't want to move. I just, like, I just can't, I just like, you have to imagine, like, I just can't get over the type of stamina and, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of did, I watched the video of it and I did like a, my own little video review commentary mm -hmm. thing on the channel. Mm -hmm. But my main takeaway was just, I was just in awe of the, um, of just be, just the ability to like, yeah, to give a hundred and fifty percent in that kind of situation—that's crazy. Yeah, one hundred and fifty. Literally, one hundred and fifty. I remember Jerry saying to me one time, I, I was complaining about something, and he was like, "Tank, if you had to do what I do every night, you'd fall down." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, you're actually right. I should probably shut the fuck up. Stop being a little bitch." And that was before um, he started doing the power slides. When you were working yeah. for him, he wasn't even yeah, doing those power doing slides. Those. Now he does this. Jo he jogs around the fucking. He jogs around the stage. Mm -hmm. He he runs up. He does power slides. The guy's fucking sixty years old. I mean, it's fucking insane. Yeah. That's yeah. Uncle Jerry. Insane. That's it's Uncle, Uncle Jerry. Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's like that's what blows me away. So, like, you know, for all the you know whatever you know, mm -hmm. all all the bullshit that I mean, you, uh, it's stuff like that where I like look at Jerry only or whoever. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, fuck, dude, yep. that's fucking yep. incredible. It really is incredible. You know. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I went from guitar tech to filling on for the the encore to, to working with Jerry and Matt, like to teach Matt songs before the show, during the sound check. I'm like, all right, uh, let's uh, he, static age to chug 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 to start playing along. All right, TV cats are done. And I'm I'm like, I, I guess I'm the new you know uh, instructor. Freaking uh, uh, yeah, the new. Uh, uh, Sound check guy. I'd, I'd sound check for Jerry before when he was like on an interview or sick or something like that. And and Dylan was uh, he was like I'm I'm impressed that you were actually hitting like all the all the eighth notes. Did, 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 did. Like you weren't skipping notes. I'm like it's not my first time playing a bass. It's 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 a thing. Um, but uh, vocals I only did them for like Ramon's stuff. If I did uh, sound check vocals and obviously the drum kit i tried line checking once and, and got kicked off <laughs> um and i'm sure during... sorry go sorry, ahead, go ahead. No, 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 well, go during ahead. the during the um the last thing i had in my list during the famous monsters era uh just to just to get it off the list was somebody gifted doyle i believe um a lost in space robot like a oh, good well, sized yeah. one that Robbie the robot. Control. No, Robbie the robot. Oh is no, no, from that's Forbidden, Forbidden Planet. Planet. My bad. Yeah. My bad. Which uh, Leslie Nielsen was in, oddly enough, before. Right? Yes, he was. That's true. Um, uh, no, just the what do they call him? Just robot. I think he's just robot. He's, he's just robot. robot. Yeah. Being lost in space. But somebody gifted us one of the vintage, you know, well, vintage looking. The toy wasn't vintage, but it was remote control. It was pretty cool. That's the head would go up song. and down. It could turn and go back and forth. So. That's a good song. During the, the famous monsters tours, when they would play Lost in Space, I would be behind Doyle's rig with you know two two uh two layers uh, high of speaker cabinets and like four wide. And when the song would start, I would I would raise the robot up from behind the speaker cabinets like he's on an elevator and then like slide him forward. And then with the remote control, make him like zigzag <laughs> back and forth on top of the amp like the and then stop and turn like the head going up and down like you would light up and stuff and it would it, that was like a little gimmick that would happen during lost in space and it usually went off without a hitch i just had to be careful to make sure he rotated a hundred you know 180 degrees before i'd make him go forward again so he wouldn't go off the front or you know fall off the off the side because i only had like you know so much space to keep him on the track but there was what speaking of the show place in buffalo we were playing there one night and 
Tim Bunch's cousin Randy was at the show, but I don't I don't think he was working with him. I think he he'd worked with us earlier, but I think he was just at that show. But he was, you know, up in guitar world with me behind Doyle's rig and, and the robot's going back and forth. And sure enough, I, I fuck up my cue and he goes zoop bang, like straight off the front. And he like head head first goes down. So he lands on his head. And I'm like, I'm too fucking embarrassed to go out, run out and grab him and bring him and put him back. I'm, I'm the one that just fucked him. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, Randy, Randy, go, go out there, get, get, get the robot for him. So Randy like runs up and gets it and brings it back. And I put him back up and I was, I was pretty sad because his head didn't go up and down anymore. I, I broke him. He, he was, he was a broken he was, robot. He was a broken robot. He still worked. Everything else about him worked, but his head never was the same. But that was one of our fun little um, gimmicks. Um, interesting, and, interesting observation. Sorry, what were you going to say? Go ahead. Uh, g- gimmicks. The 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 the, uh, the sampler, the keyboard that you would have to like hold down to like play creepy attic intro, right? Or go devil, devil, devil. You know, um, and speak of the devil, and then the other sound effects that we had. We would for fun record sound effects, um, like during sound checks. Uh, we had the. Guitarist, I believe he was from Maximum Penalty, while we were in Europe, record Danka, and so that was like after after the sh- when the show was over, you'd hear Danka, and um, the thing that I recorded because I I, I, th- I told you about Bernie Wrightson and how we were watching heavy metal on on the Winnebago. Yes, I, I remember that and, from from the last episode we did. I was yeah, like, and Captain Stern not. came on. I was like, lucky, I was lucky like, motherfucker. I was like. A, a, Oh, give me a break. And everybody turned around like, you've seen this before. I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. I love this. Captain Stern's the nicest, kindest, gentlest. Um, so that became like a tank thing. There was actually, I think um, I had like shirts that said like, oh, give me a break on them or something like that. And so they recorded me saying, oh, give me a break. And that became a song during sound check that Michael was singing like the Johnny Grimm song. <laughs> and Morgan went back there. Oh, give me a break! Oh, oh, oh give me a break! It was like it, it was just, just goofing around, and Rocky was like, "Not for nothing, this is a really fucking good song. Like we should record this song." And that that's when we were told the story. Like you know, Tears for Fears used to play this song during sound check just to like check the the levels and the sounds and the you know EQ and the monitors and everything. And they would just be like, shout, shout, you know, let it all out. Get shout, it out. Shout. Get it out. And some, somebody was like, that's a good song, guys. Maybe you should record that. Like, no, nah, we're just goofing around. Like, no, seriously, you should record that. It became a fucking huge hit. Oh, I'll give and you we were break. like, maybe, maybe the Johnny Grimm song could be like the Misfits breakout song. I don't know. But. Yeah, and there was some other stuff they would sing that was inappropriate for me to to, to repeat, but it was just goof, just goofing around and in, in behind closed doors. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, another thing. So I, I know I know we're like at f- over four and a half hours. No, no, point. I just wanted to say that in less than a minute we will have crossed over as our longest episode yet. <sighs> well, let's get there. We did it? Style, we did it, we? baby. We fucking did Here it. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> they just keep only- getting longer and longer. Oh shit! It That's only gets from better the, from here. Is that from the American Psycho uh, music video? No, this predates that. Okay. This is from 1995. Uh, it made its appearance around uh, conventions. This was part of, of the Cemetery Gates three-dimensional backdrop that we used to use for photo ops at conventions. This was my tombstone. Uh, it's just thin styrofoam, uh, spray painted gray, and then speckled with with black, uh, uh, a, a paint, uh, a, a fence paint sprayer from a great distance, just going click, 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 and just like spattering it with gray. Uh, but Ken went in on each one of them. There was one for uh, Ed Repka. There was tombstones for all the Paulie B. Um, uh, just the, 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 everybody we knew had a tombstone, and, and then Jerry and Doyle had their their ones up front that were like really cool looking. Ours were just like regular, but he put J Grim on it, and I said, um, "There's actually two M's in uh, in the in my name, John Grim." And he's like, "No, there can't be, because that would be Grimm. I'm like, "You're, you're Grim, um, Grimm." 
1895, just some random date. But my, you'll see there's some paint missing up here. My tombstone, um, out, out of the ones that were just like kind of in the background, next to George Germain or whoever, mine's the only one that still exists. I, I saved it when the, the thing was getting trashed. I sculpted this goofy looking skull with bat wings thing. Oh, let's see. If we oh, can, shit. Uh, oh, boy. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. I didn't, I didn't, okay. Truth be told, I did not sculpt the skull. The skull was, uh, uh, somebody had a bucket full of them, and, and I, I I carved the uh, the the jaw off, and then I made these like octopus looking bat wings that went on it. Kind of looks but like Jack be... Ellington's bow tie. Yeah, well, that, see, thank you. You're welcome, Tim Burton. I probably inspired that. Um, actually, this would this would be after, uh, after, but that that used to be up here. So that that was my tombstone back in the day. It's awesome. The, those are the the steps that that guy at the Kiss Convention like walked up and then crashed crashed through. It's... So we so, somehow made it to the end of the year 2000. I don't know how we did it, but we it took us fucking almost five hours just to do that. And we've been God. through the we've gone over the hump. We we were we've been over the hill. Mm -hmm. we're, mm -hmm. we're we're on the other side now. <laughs> you did it. Um yep. One question. I'm one stuff off my list here. Yeah. Yeah. No. You could finish. Finish your list. But uh, no. I'm, yeah. I'm, we're we're close, but some of it might not apply yet. Okay. What one question that um that does come to mind? Where on that night on on the the big night that that fateful mm -hmm. night, where mm -hmm. is Kenny and what is his sort of do? You, what do you remember of Kenny? Is he just like in shock that this is going down? Is it like? Is he not surprised because he's been seeing inklings of shit go down? Like, what do you remember from Kenny out of curiosity? Well, physically on the stage, I was on Doyle's side uh, and Kenny was always on Jerry's side. Uh -huh. um, so when Doyle walked off the stage, stage left, which would be Doyle's side of the stage, was where the stairs went to the, the dressing room. So he just handed me the guitar and was like immediately off the stage. The other guys went from center stage to stage left. So Kenny and, and Jerry were on the far side of the stage from all that going down. So I don't, uh, neither of them had any idea what was going on upstairs. Oh, so um, Kenny, yeah, Kenny was not aware of, of. Not, not that specific yeah. incident. You know, the show was still going on. He was still down there with Jerry. As far as, I mean, everybody was present when Pat was fired. And of course, Ken had to do, you know, the termination stuff and all that kind of jazz. Um, and I, I know knowing Kenny, I mean, Kenny was fully on board with like, yeah, Pat needs to be fucking fired. He's, he's blatantly breaking the rules and rubbing it in, in your, you're rubbing your nose in it. Um, so there was no argument there. Literally doing literally in front of the boss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, talk about this, like, yeah, no, you don't do that. You don't basically do that. asked. And here's the other thing too, that we did not mention, I guess at the end of the day, it's like, if you put the person who's in charge and who's leading the leadership if you mm -hmm. put them in this position, then mm -hmm. they have to do something. You're you're forcing them. You force their hand. You're forcing their hand to do something mm -hmm. about it because it disrupts the the chain of command. Mm -hmm. and, and I that that may sound you know some people might be like oh well that's just that's just fascist you know, iron fit. It, there has to be a high. There has to be a chain of command. There has to be a chief with Indians under him. It can't just, not everybody. You is, have to, I mean, if you're run, if you're running a, if you're running a show like that and you have, you have to have a routine and this, that, and the, so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, when you look at it, it's literally like you put me in this position where I've, I've decreed something, wh whether you agree with it or not, I decreed this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to follow the rule and I'm going to challenge you and now suddenly you you're you're now in a position where you have to protect your 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 place as the chief yeah yeah so yeah that's okay yeah it is what it is i uh Gary's hand was forced uh, in that situation yeah bottom line i, I would have bottom done line. the same thing yep me too me too um so I mean, look, I, there's no, I, we're, we're, it's past midnight. We're approaching five hours. <laughs> Let's do, finish what's on your list and we will continue on from the year 2000. Okay. What was it? We, oh, wait, we're still in the year two. This would be, 
Well, we're wrapping up part one. Yeah, but this yeah, is part one. Of we are. We will be picking up like in Fort Lauderdale, which was like I think the show right after New. Uh, yeah, Orlando, so where, we're really uh, going into. So we haven't even gotten to the year. It. I got the year two thousand one will be an interesting year two yeah. to discuss. But what um, in, in any which case, let's do some housekeeping, and mm -hmm. we will bid you all adieu. And I yeah. want to again take this moment. We we have not lost viewers. We've only gained them, which is somehow amazing. We've not. It's it's kind of incredible wow. that we've pretty much Sorry, had guys. for almost five hours. We had anywhere between twenty to thirty people watching this thing. I mean, it's kind of impressive for yeah. not. I mean, I just posted it this morning, like or posted mm -hmm. this afternoon. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's um, pretty cool. again, I just want to. If if you're watching this and you've really enjoyed this content, please make sure to subscribe to uh, Tank's channel down below, where he covers a lot of, you know, he does he's doing his own thing. He's got his Star Wars card game stuff that Scum Scum and and uh, uh, Scum and Destiny. Sorry, mm -hmm. it's late. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm a little crispy. Good recall. Um, there, yeah. yeah, no. Make sure you make sure you you subscribe and make sure you check out uh, Riot stickers, uh, the, our special Riot stickers deal. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna roll out with uh, some of these items on the punch list, and we will we will bid you adieu and yep. see you next time. Yeah, and if so, anybody actually wants to play Star Wars Destiny, it's, it's it is a free game that can be played online, and that's how we that's how we roll. Um, so if, if you like what you see, by all means, reach out to me. I'll, I'll get you hooked up. There you go. Um, there you go. So just a, a couple of uh, things to note. Uh, new socks. Uh, Jerry, prior to a tour, would show up with like a foot locker of packs of socks and packs of tidy whities And I'm like, what? What's, what? What are you doing here? And he's like, oh, yeah. After every show, I take off my socks. I take off the, you know, the underwear. And they go right in the trash. And tomorrow night, I have a brand new pair. And I'm like... Wow, that, that's insane! That's insane. Actually, that's baller. That's that fucking is, baller. It is, it is totally fucking baller, and I'll tell you why. Because later in my life, I became a cosplayer, and when cosplaying is not known for comfortable footwear, I've had to wear some pretty stupid shit. I was on an eighteen-hour uh, shoot for a short movie where I was Jason Voorhees, and I had elevators in my boots that were so high they made me six six. Added five inches, wow. five inches to my height. I was six six. There were metal braces going up the sides of my ankles, like polio braces, uh, uh, buckling around the top of my calves to keep me from rolling my ankles because they would break if I did accidentally roll my ankle. Jeez. But for eighteen hours, I had those those boots on, which caused semi permanent nerve damage in the bottom of my feet. The balls of my feet. There was so much pressure on them right behind my toes that for years afterwards, it was a, it was a numb area. That's what happens when you wear five inch elevators for 18 hours. Great short video, by the way. Uh, Jason Voorhees on a blind date, freaking hilarious. Where is it? It's um, on YouTube, it's on Vimeo. Actually. Okay, uh, it so, uh, for... email it to me, please. Okay. It, it was done for an advertising agency just to show like what they could do. And it was, it yeah. was the guys who directed the uh. Uh, Onward Chariots video, Mel Gibson, that they had me come out and wear the costume that you showed the pictures of the, the Mad Max costume that you were wearing, um, and had, like your Lord Humongous shows up in the video. It's it's a fucking hilarious. I'll send you the link for that. Too. That's that's funny. Do that's it, on please, please. But the Vimeo, the blind date with Jason Voorhees is fucking awesome. And by the way, um, what Tank is saying about the damage and stuff. Now imagine being Paul Stanley and doing that for fifty years. At least with that's Paul Stanley, crazy. he's he's in. Like elevator boots, so his so the front part and the back part of his feet are both they're in platforms. The back's a little bit higher, but I I went from like that, you know, a little bit elevated to like the, right like so five inches on just an under my heel for eighteen hours. I had those boots yeah. on, and I you know with a little bit of shoulder padding under my th I I was like I was scary. I we we went into a gas station like in the middle of the night, and um. The, just as the goof, the, the the guys went like ahead of me. I was I was still in, in my costume. The guys went ahead of me like, holy shit, holy shit, he's coming. Oh my god, what are we gonna fucking do? What are we gonna do? And the guy behind the counter from like oh, <laughs> done. and then I bam, I come walking in and, and uh we just it was he, he the, the guy didn't really find it was think it was funny, but we did. So and that's what's important. Um right. and that nobody got hurt, at least badly.
uh, or permanently. But cosplay, not known for sensible shoes, very uncomfortable footwear. I've after a convention of, of dragging kind of like four days straight of, of costume changes, I've just wanted to hack my feet off. I tried Jerry's idea of putting on a brand new pair of socks every time I had to change my footwear at a convention like that, or at least on weekend where I saw humongous every day. Your socks will never be fluffier, cushier, or softer than the day you pulled them out of the pack and first put them on your feet. It's a morale booster. It, it, it it's a game changer. It's a total. And this is anytime so any uh like a new cosplayer asks me uh, a seasoned cosplayer like, hey, you got any tips? I'm like, yes. Report your firearms to the TSA before you fly with them, or you will get arrested. Learned that the hard way. Oh, and shit. put on <laughs> put on a new pair of socks every time you change your footwear at a at a convention. I learned that from Jerry only. I didn't need to change my underwear because I wasn't dripping with sweat after every, not after every uh, cosplay, but only a couple of them. But the new socks thing, it's it's true. Once you wear them once and you wash them and you put them back on, they will never be as fluffy as they were that first time you put them on. Well, I mean, everybody knows that feeling. The feeling mm-hmm. of a new pair of socks is a great feeling, but it's a, it's a fleeting it one is. because, you know. It is very fleeting. Unless you show up with a case of packs of socks for a whole store. Um, so yeah, the, the, the case the would always be socks, the, the, uh, socks, uh, <laughs> tidy whities and hairspray. That was, that it. was stock, but he would go to Walmart and just like clear the shelves. So that's the new socks. Uh, there was a thing back in the day because I was, I was into powerlifting. I was into being big and, and strong and stuff that, um, uh, you, if you could beat the tank arm wrestling, you could get a free t-shirt and that's a good uh, deal a lot of people a lot of people tried uh sometimes i'd let them use two hands and i'd, I'd just kind of oh we had a shtick so when chris soto was with me i'd be up there doing the thing and uh you know we're, and I'd, I'd be like pretending um um you know i'm like uh, uh and chris would be like hey tank what time is it oh it's uh it's about time for you to start <laughs> you know we had a we had a gimmick going on um i only lost twice once was to a guy his 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 literal name was fingers he had like a growth hormone issue his hands were like shovels his fingers were so thick and i he we because of that we were like my god this guy's so cool so hand so i kind of di- i didn't put my all into it because i was like yeah we're gonna get this guy a fucking shirt so i i uh i i maybe i could have beat him i don't know going back whatever but there were the only other guy that I lost to was a linebacker for Arizona State. Big hmm. boy, big boy, three fifty plus probably. We uh, we we went right handed and it was a battle. It was it was quite a battle. Um, I lost that, but then I was like, "You want to go left handed?" He's like, ah, "Sure." I, you know, he's feeling pretty confident after going right handed. Yeah, we went left handed. I'm I'm right handed by the way. I'm not left handed. Um, I beat him. So it was kind of a, a an evenly matched up match. So th- that that was a thing, you know. Um, if if the misfits like you, the tank would throw the the match. Usually, it's like a girl or something like that. And here, here's your T-shirt. But that was uh, I had to stop doing it for a while because the uh, the tendonitis in my elbow was was killing me. Um, and I kind of wish I actually there's there's techniques to arm wrestling. It's not all about strength. There are, are definite forms that. I, I watch a lot of arm wrestling videos now, and I'm like, hey, man, I, I know him then. I know him now. Um, I might have a different story, but anyway, that was just one of the things from being the being the merch guy. Being a have you heard of the guy. slapping game? The slapping oh, sport dude, that, that is do? insane. That's insane. Like, and it who gets thought of like that? Brained, I don't know, but it's got a uh, Dana White from from what you call it. That's got to give you some serious brain damage. I mean, I see their whole faces swell up yeah. from getting slapped. Yeah, getting slapped. That's no joke. I mean, that is yeah. That's yeah, and, and some of these guys like they really get their bell rung. It, yeah. It's not just a slap; it's a, it's an open-handed strike. There, there's, so there's, a, there's a thing in martial arts where you you call it what you like. I mean, some might say it's your chi, your energy that you're putting out there. But if if you punch somebody with a closed fist, you are constricting your own flow of energy. Let's, for lack of a better, you know psychology behind it but if if you imagine 
so imagine if, if this was a, if this was a cup of water and i wanted to throw this water at you i would go like that i would push it at you as i'm splattering my my bang all over the <laughs> my rain on this. same principle with your with an open hand strike is you're taking that water and and you're you're slamming it into your opponent if you do this in in a martial in a dojo and in, in a, you know a controlled setting, it's amazing the difference. Like if you just hit somebody in your in the chest with your fist as opposed to an open palm strike, you will send them reeling back with that open palm strike. Um, so there, there's definitely something to it. And just for anybody who needs to know, hardest bone in your body right here, strike with it. Ah, uh, the weenus. Sorry. That's known as the yeah. weenus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Weenus will do it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll definitely do it. it. There was one of one of the drills we used to have to do, and and one of the other black belts with uh, this big Tim, like three hundred and change, easy. Um, th one of the drills was you'd hold a pad, and your part your partner had to punch and kick it to drive you across the dojo floor. Well, Tim wasn't fucking moving for anybody. The only way to move him was elbow strikes, right up right up into the solar plexus, and and he would take Ooh. a take take the step back because it, it strikes so hard. He had he moved it moved him. Um, so yeah, just, just so you people know, you know, strike with the open hand. Don't punch somebody in the head with this. You'll be sorry. You'll break your fingers. Hit them with that. Um, what else do you have on your list? Anything else? Uh, that, uh, some stuff that we can, we can put a pin in because the, the whole section on saber models. Yeah. Is that, that's a lot of history there. Um, okay. I just, I don't know if we ever talked about fucking Pauly B or signing Ooh. the teenagers from Mars acetate. Or no. Uh we I think we might have told the story of the acetate. I don't remember. I maybe I've told it after I lit I mean it's such a fuck that is such a fucking good story. We you should tell it either way. You got to tell it. Okay. All right. Just so cut. Jerry gifted me. Jerry gifted me the 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 teenager's acetate. Oh, you're going to do it now. All right, do it now. Oh, do well, it now. No, okay. Well, the, the, no, 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 no. End with okay. this. End with end this. With this. Okay, we'll go with the bank. End with this story cuz it's such a good fucking story. Okay. Just so end we'll, with we'll, the story and we'll call it a day. But wait, you we'll, can't we'll, just say Jerry gave it to me. You have to explain mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. bit of how you got uh, of how he gave it to you, and then mm -hmm. tell tell the thing. Okay, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Okay, uh, great um, story, people. Go. So yeah, we'll put a we'll put a pin in saber models and fucking Pauly B. Yeah. Um, so, I ninety five. I'm working with the Misfits. Um, I'm coming up on my own time, on my own dime donating my time, my resources, just helping out any way I can, not getting paid for it. Uh, I mean, they're putting me up, they're taking care of me, whatever, that's great and all that, but it, I'm, I'm there for the love of it. Um, and Jerry recognized that. So some of the projects we were working on, I'm, he sent me some uh, leather lifting belts to stain black, and that's a whole other story with the fire department showing up at the end of the day. Um, but in the box that I open up, besides the letter and him kind of thanking me and, and coming up with some really like kind of spiritual sounding quotes and stuff about the integrity of a man. Um, thank you. Somebody just turned the light off on me. Oh, so that's why I went, <laughs> I went dark there literally um, in the box with the letter and the belt and whatever else was in there. This is like I said, 95 mm -hmm. is not a, but the teenagers from Mars seven inch acetate and when i say the i mean the one that was unlike the other four it now what did you know about it prior what did you know about it prior i saw it in george germain's bottom drawer of his filing cabinet when we were at george's house to move a refrigerator down to the basement and take out a fake fireplace and smash it up with some sledgehammer so that the trash department could take it away but uh, how did you trash. what did you know about it then like did you ask questions to George, you say, George, what is this? I, I uh, Jerry, I think before. Jerry told me about it. He, when we, George had two teenagers acetates in there, one that had the large center hole and teenagers on one side and uh, static age on the flip side. And then he had this one that was a small center hole with an offset center hole that was teenagers on both sides. Okay. And Jerry said, yeah, this is unlike the other four. It's, it's a one of a kind. Um, and the, so the day Jerry stopped by George's house to pick that up, he stopped by the house of somebody from the band The Fiends. If you remember them from back in the day, yes, I don't, yes, I don't know New York music, band. But yes, they had a 
In fact, they had one song on the New York hardcore thrash compilation. Okay. He stopped by their house just to, just to show the guy the record, and they threw it on the turntable and played it, and it was just kind of like, yeah, I'm about to send this down to you know a guy I know. Um, and I, you know, I would imagine it was a pretty big deal. So I opened the box, and there is a Teenagers from Mars acetate on the in just a white sleeve, on the back side in the corner. I, th I think I think he wrote like you know, hey, thanks, thanks, John. Uh, so just something like quick little note. Oh my God, Jerry just gave me a Teenagers from Mars acetate, one of the five. That's unlike the other four. Unflipping believable. Um, and that, of course, became instantly the crown jewel but uh, of, of the collection. But it's just a white paper sleeve just sitting there by itself. I think it said teenagers uh, handwritten uh, maybe at the top on each side to know which, which acid date was which. Okay, I've got to get this uh, signed um, at some point. Uh, talking to Elizabeth Boris about it. Uh, again, may, may, all these people, may she rest in peace. Manny, may she, may she rest in peace. Jesus, she was a, she um, was a sweet uh, sweetheart of a woman. Sure, um, she was in pretty tight with Glenn, and Glenn was coming yeah. to uh, I don't know if it was Painters Mill in Baltimore. He's coming to a, a venue, and she, I told Liz I was gonna I was gonna bring the acetate to the show to get Glenn to sign it at the tour bus afterwards, and then I would get Jerry and Jim and and uh, Fran, uh, Franche to sign it. I knew Glenn had to be first. And she told Glenn tomorrow night, uh, I don't know if she said John Grimm or you know, if he even knew who I was, but somebody's going to come to the show with a teenager's acetate for you to sign. And Glenn told her, I won't sign that. I will take it and I will smash it or snap it, whatever the, whatever the word was. And I got to the show the next night and, and Liz told me, she's like, um, I think you should know. I told Glenn and this is what he said. And I was like, really? Okay. All right. This this ought to be interesting. So I'm, I'm like throughout the show, I'm kind of on the fence. Like, what do I do? You know, because this is before the days where I could have had somebody behind me. Like, okay, what the? Hey, Glenn, you're gonna sign that? We got you on video here. Like, it would have just been if it happened. It would have just happened. Um, and he would have had you know Jesse James or somebody you know sitting behind him backing him up. So I think I think Jesse was still his bodyguard at the time um but i was also the, you got to figure this is 95 this is around the time of my wcw tryouts so i'm i'm all power lifted you know like you saw how thick my neck was on that that life cat i was i was big i had a lot of lot, a lot of beef backing me up um uh, plus i wore a leather jacket that had a leather jacket vest over it so i was just like padding on top of us i i was an imposing figure you could say um so i go for it I get in line by the tour bus. I've got the teenagers in hand. Um, I get up there. I hand it to Glenn. Like, he doesn't even look up. He's just like, you know, okay, sign it, hand it up. Okay, sign it, hand. Like, he's not even, he's, you know, he, you don't see me. I get up there, and I, I hand it to him. <laughs> and it, it, like, takes him a second to realize what I just handed him. And immediately he looks up like with his his usual like tough guy like fuck you motherfucker he looks up and i'm i'm like i'm not the guy i guess he was expecting to see and he just goes oh man where'd you get this like totally changed like that he, he went from from badass i'm gonna snap this to holy shit you could snap me i better not uh wow um where did you get this let me save some face here real quick um and i in the back of my head as a kid i thought so you motherfucker um <laughs> so so he signed it i i said it came from george germain i said he's doing well you know he, he i i i said you know he was still around but i i, I might have le uh, alluded to some of the george's ailments that he was dealing with with getting around i was like hey you know you might want to reach out to him sometime which i'm sure never happened um, and then it wasn't too many years after that that George uh, passed, unfortunately. What when um, you brought but, when you name dropped George Germain? What kind of reaction do you remember him? Have do you remember him reacting to that? It was all? it was just kind of like an oh, huh, like yeah. like he I I could sense like he was a little uncomfortable. Like damn it, I I really wanted to fucking be a a, a tough guy right now, and I I can't. I'm 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 out of my element here. Wow. Um, I mean, you you know, 
Yeah, but you know he signed it upper left corner, and then at the uh, the Misfits box set release uh, in New York City that um, uh, we did we, did, we had the pizza party across the street, and then at midnight came over for the for the box set signing. That's when I went to okay, Jerry, you sign it here, Franche, you sign it there, Mr. Jim, you sign it there. So all all four of them signed it, and it was man, that was awesome. That was really awesome. That is really awesome. What? So when you brought it back to Jerry, you're like it was Jerry, like, "Hey, you got Glenn to sign it," like, or he was just, yeah, yeah, just probably typical, you know, typical Jerry yeah. fashion. Um, what? Well, it, it wasn't a big deal to him, like it was to me. It was, it was, oh my god, that was unbelievable. That I mean, that really is. It's such an, it's such yeah. an unbelievably legendary story. It's such a great. Yeah. If, if there was, if there was one record I could have kept for my collection, obviously that would have been it. But out of all the records, that was by far the most valuable, and I just I needed, I needed to pull together every penny I could to to put my family in a house. Did you did you ever hear? Did you hear the bootleg, the Static Age outtakes bootleg, with the legit alternate tracks from the Static Age sessions and horror business? You sent me that. I think the the links to that. No, yeah, I've, not I've, me. Yeah, somebody did. I didn't. I didn't have it. Okay, I, so I heard it. I there was I something heard. that got released like a maybe a year ago. Yeah, it was something that, that got released. I was able to listen to it, but I never had. You and I talked about it. Okay, yeah, somebody sent me a link to it. I was able to play it like on Spotify or something. And um, yeah, Crazy, I remember the first right? time. Uh, yeah, like holy shit! I that stuff really needs to see the light of day. I mean, I know it's not spit polished and you know finished and everything, but who cares? It's history. It was just cool to hear outtakes of something, yeah. you know. Yeah. What mean, what was the deal with the with the new Who Killed Marilyn release? I, I never really I, I've listened to it, but I don't know what the back it's story just is. A, he just re, he just remixed it, and mm -hmm. the remix is way fucking better that I think personally than the original. I've never been a big fan of the of of his recording of the instruments on the who killed Marilyn. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it sounds like he, it's, it's like, it, it really is. It feels like an experiment in, in frustration. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm so fucking annoyed with my band. They can't, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Jerry and Doyle don't want to fucking do nothing. I'm just going to do this myself. And, you know, if you guys don't get your act together, then I'm just going to go off and, you know, be a solo band or whatever. Cause at the end of the day, he he had versions of those songs recorded mm -hmm. with the with the horror business lineup. They recorded that right. both of those tracks. He re-recorded those songs on his own, doing all the instruments. So, to if me, I'm not mistaken, like he and George Germain did that because George yeah. had a lot of Who Killed Marilyn stuff in that. Yeah, that pop and his, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that is exactly what happened, and or what I imagine happened, mm -hmm. and I imagine that it was. You know, it was also it was at a period of of inactivity for the original group, and you know he's talked about that in interviews. He's like, you know, him and Googie wanted to do keep doing stuff, and Jerry and Doyle were off doing their thing or something, or working for their dad or something. Mm -hmm. So, to me, though, that version, like when you listen to the horror business version, I mean, when you listen to the horror business era version. Mm -hmm. With Bobby and Joey, it sounds like a band, like a real band, because it is a real mm -hmm. band, and they're mm -hmm. tracking it live, right? Like, and mm -hmm. they're and it sounds fucking amazing because Bo Bobby has that incredible guitar tone that he has for those. Songs. I mean, it just sounds great. Mm -hmm. But when you hear Glenn do it, I mean, it's like he can. He's so rudimentary at that. I mean, he'd be he would improve greatly as a drummer later on, especially in the Sam Haynes stuff. That he would that he would uh, he drummed on about half of November Coming Fire right because mm -hmm. London didn't know all the songs so it's mm -hmm. like I mean he he would improve as a drummer but back then man he, it's just so rudimentary and wooden mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know there's no flair there's no it, if anything it's kind of shows you why he's like I just want to be the front man with my incredible voice. Mm -hmm. I need someone else to just focus on the guitar. I don't want to be the guitar player. I don't want to be a keyboard player. Yeah, and, I mean, with that with that voice and with his showmanship, that's exactly where he belonged. He shouldn't have been stuck. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. But yeah. when you know 
when you when you consider the fact that like you know he would have guys he would have guys that were either fresh fresh with their instruments like Franche, I don't know how long Franche had been playing guitar, but yeah. I don't believe he had been playing guitar for very long. I don't think so. And he, listen, yeah. he had some, he had, he definitely had some chops, but he was, he was, a, he was new to his, he was relatively speaking newer to his instrument than, say, I don't know, like other, you know, other Lodi musicians. Hmm. Same thing with Doyle. I mean, they showed Doyle how to fucking play. Doyle, and Doyle learned how to play from Glenn and Jerry. So it's mm -hmm. like if you'd rather have Doyle play over you playing, you know, it kind of makes me think like it kind of makes me think that like sure, like Glenn can play and he could play relatively competently in the recording studio and and because mm -hmm. he does track, he did tracks and stuff, but in like a live band setting, it's like, hey, I just want to be free. It's like, hey, let me just be free to do my front man thing and have somebody else mm -hmm. playing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. And in the case of, you know, I mean, with, with Franche, I mean, he had a fucking great, I mean, that was a fucking tight ass band. And then by the time, you know, Doyle and Jerry are there, it's like, they're, it's just all about fucking, you know, hardcore punk rock. We're hardcore punk rockers yeah. doing our thing. Just barely. I, I, sorry, go ahead. I, I was, when I get my haircut uh, today, I was talking to the guy, you know, the barber and, and talking about the misfits and stuff he's like ah oh, you know i don't really know their stuff um but he, he had been a big guns and roses fan i was like well i'm sure you heard spaghetti incident and you probably heard attitude and that was a cover song he's like really i didn't even know that was a cover song that's a misfit song I'm like yeah check out the static age album that's what it was originally on and uh i said i, I highly recommend the static age album because it's not a punk or a hardcore album it's it's almost like a like a jazz album in some ways but mm. glenn's voice is phenomenal the sound is is that of the guitar is very um nondescript where the bass is very descriptive it's almost like the bass is the lead instrument and the guitar is in the background it, it, it's a very different the way that it's mixed it. yeah, yeah jerry's bass is higher up and jerry it's also a symptom of what jerry when jerry when it was the cough cool band when there was no guitar and jerry mm -hmm. had to do more of the footwork because there was no guitar it was just there was a piano to fill out the sound but glenn's doing like he's kind of playing like he's playing the piano kind of like a rhythm guitar dun 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 and and so jerry has to do a lot more work with his plucking mm -hmm. and then when franche comes in he's kind yeah he's it's weird he's kind of like a at least the way it's mixed he's kind of like yeah. a low end guitar in there and then the bass sits up high yeah you know yeah. but it's a great it's such a great sound like i oh my god you know it, what 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 Franche was able to get with his guitar, and I mean, there's a reason why they made that pedal box because it's a fucking great sound. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, it's very fuzzy. But oh, it's, it's a, a wonderful. Freaking, um, uh, Return of the Fly, the just, like the bass, the, the bass playing lead when he does it. Wow, wow, and like you know, yeah, the bass is the lead instrument in that in that song. I mean, it's just really even this like cool. last caress, man. Like the, I'm thinking about the guitar now for last caress mm -hmm. attitude. I mean, the guitar is the, the guitar really has a signature sound to it as well. Mm -hmm. And yes, sometimes it's like a bass. It's more, not bass guitar. I don't want to say bass guitar, like bass guitar, but it's just lower. It's like a lower end mm -hmm. in the mix kind of. Yep. But not. And, and that continued like even in, in the, the 90, the 95 onward misfits, with Jerry and Doyle was that was the idea that there would be the sound, the misfit sound with a lot of bass in the guitar and a lot of treble in the bass. Mm. Um, in fact, Doyle played through uh, bass, PV, bass, amp, right? bass amps with Demeter preamps for the sound and Jerry's EQ on his acoustic brand um, amps. It was all high end. So it oh. had, it had that distorted trebly sound to it. And that was, that was the sound. Yeah. I have to check something before we go. I believe this is officially the longest live stream I've ever done. Dear I think God. we've broken the Sorry. record in yeah. four years. Hold on. We're going to check right now. We're going to, I have to know now. I have to know. I, I'll be able to tell. I'll be able to tell. Didn't, didn't Erie do one that was like five and a half hours or something? Um. Yeah. Oh, shit. Erie might have beaten us, beaten the South. Curse you, Erie Vaughn. Erie Vaughn beat it out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Dr. Loki was five hours and eight minutes. This is five hours and 13 minutes. But here's mm -hmm. the thing. I broke up the Erivan into parts, but technically, mm -hmm. technically, I think Erivan just, it's either, I think Erivan beats us out. I think Erivan is like five hours and 20 minutes or thir five hours and 30 minutes, Wait something like up. that. But okay. this was, the, this is the longest yeah. uh, single. Yeah, give me Eric Delman, please, on the phone. Thank you. No. <laughs> this is the longest continuous live stream <laughs> live that oh, man. I think I've done officially. We did it. We we broke a record. That why was not, we did it, I don't know. The fans are like, yeah, why did you guys do it? Do it. You just got to do it. Again, subscribe to to Tank's channel. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna I'm gonna say peace and hair grease is a fucking magnum episode. Tank, hang on for one second.